Good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of my esteemed friends, colleagues, and co-directors, uh, Drs. Conrad Smith and Hemel Gada, we welcome you to Pittsburgh. You're joining an audience of nearly 800 physicians, nurses, advanced practice providers, uh, trainees, and other healthcare providers who take care of patients with heart valve disease. Uh, we're absolutely excited about today's program, and we are confident you will feel the same by the end of today. In addition to the usual talks and didactics and interactive case discussions, uh, today we are pleased to present to you two live recorded cases, uh, one from Pittsburgh and one from Harrisburg that'll be moderated later this morning by our panel. Uh, a special thanks to the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and the Congenital Heart Academy uh, for supporting and endorsing our program. We are truly grateful for their partnership. Uh, I would also like to thank our industry partners for their assistance. Uh, today would not be possible without their generous support. I'm truly grateful to our physicians expert from the UPMC Heart and Vascular Institute who are here today to share their knowledge, experience, and wisdom. Uh, the UPMC Heart and Vascular Institute is one of the largest integrated cardiovascular service lines in North America. And I'm absolutely blessed to work shoulder to shoulder with these national and international experts. Uh, most importantly, I would like to thank our patients who allow us the privilege of being part of their journey with heart valve disease. With that, uh, I will introduce my partner and esteemed colleague, Dr. Conrad Smith, who will be moderating our first session. Dr. Smith is the director of our cardiac cath labs, associate chief of cardiology and the medical director of the heart valve program. Uh, he's a nationally renowned uh, interventional cardiologist and a very thoughtful and highly skilled interventionalist that I know and is passionate about heart valve disease. We are fortunate to have with him with us today. Uh, thank you once again, and welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Eves. And uh, welcome. Uh, I'd like to share my welcome as well. Uh, I think we have an excellent uh, group of physicians and, and uh, researchers to speak with us today on a whole host of valvular heart disease. Uh, I have the pleasure of sharing the first session uh, on aortic valve disease. And 
we will, the order of events is we'll have the series of talks and at the end we'll have 15 minutes or so to uh, have a moderated session and some questions. Um, and with no further ado, I think we'll get started. The first of our presenters, I'm, I'm happy to introduce uh, Dr. Dustin Kleiner, who is an outstanding uh, interventional cardiologist. Uh, he is uh, has really built a, a great presence in the structural heart disease uh, arena, and he's here to talk to us about TAVR and low-risk patients, and he's going to tell us, are we there yet? Dr. Kleiner. Thank you, Conrad. Thank you, Ebes. Thank you, Hemel. Uh, we'll get started. It's a little of a, a little bit of a misleading topic. I, I think we are we are there. We're not maybe there for everybody, which is what I want to convey to you. Uh, I do some speaking for Abbott objectives today. Uh, we'll talk about the available data in TAVR low risk patients. I'll tell you about the limitations of of TAVR in younger patients, uh, and I'll highlight the role for shared decision making between surgeons and interventional cardiologists, which is the crux of most of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we'll start with a case scenario, as we always should. Bring it back to the bedside and talk about the patient, sixty four year old uh, non medical family friend um, who has severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. He read the New York Times article and saw Mick Jagger on stage a few days later and said, hey, he looks great. If I need to have my aortic valve done, maybe I can do it that way. He's otherwise healthy. What would you recommend to him? So low risk, what do we mean by low risk? This is the Society of Thoracic Surgeons predicted risk of mortality of less than 3% uh, with no other life limiting condition not factored into the STS calculator. And there's no evidence of objective frailty that would add incremental risk to these patients. We have two randomized controlled trials that I'll touch on, and we have some incremental follow-up of those that have occurred over the last couple of years. The first is the Medtronic low-risk trial, so 1,400 patients, mean age of 74, so a little bit older than the patient that I describe in the scenario, looking at a composite endpoint of death or disabling stroke at 24 months, so two years of follow-up in the initial trial and the initial publication. The primary endpoint occurred in 5.3% of TAVR patients and 6.7% of surgical patients. Um, at, at 30 days, stroke rates were lower, bleeding rates were lower, AKI and AFib rates were lower with AFib, which occurs with almost all TAVR versus SAVR trials. Moderate to severe AI rates and pacemaker rates were higher uh, with TAVR patients than they were with surgical patients. And at 12 months, TAVR patients had a lower mean gradient and larger effective orifice area. And these are, again, consistent amongst all TAVR trials from multiple different risk strata of patients over time. We have updated three-year follow-up information in this, and you can see now out to 36 months, we still do have a nice separation between the curves, looking at all-cause mortality uh, or disabling stroke amongst the TAVR and surgical groups. So self-expanding TAVR with the Evolute platform still performing fairly well relative to surgery um, three, three years out. Partner three trial, this is 1,000 patients looking at the Edward Sapien platform and low-risk patients, mean age 73. So again, older than the patient that we've described in our case scenario, average STS of 1.9. This looked at death, stroke, and rehospitalization at one year. So they've added a third uh, factor into their composite endpoint. This occurred in 8.5% of TAVR patients and 15% of SAVR patients the 30-day stroke rates were lower with TAVR, as were death or new stroke, again, atrial fibrillation, shorter hospital stay. And in this trial, there were no differences with moderate to severe PVL or pacemaker inserted. Uh, the self-expanding valves, uh, I'm sorry, the balloon expandable valves have historically have had slightly smaller rates of pacemaker insertion and PVL uh, amongst trials, again, across risk stratification uh, schema. If we look at the box and whisker here, you can see the separation of all of these at the top. There's an age less than 74, which I want to point out, and that is not uh, something that stays completely on the TAVR better side of the curve. Uh, and you can see at the very bottom, we have, uh, uh, you know, overall KCCQ, KCCQ scores, atrial fibrillation numbers, uh, multiple different strata that are there. And most of these, again, favoring TAVR fairly strongly. 
This is the two-year follow-up for this particular trial. So I want to point your attention to the top right-hand image, uh, looking at the 12-month separation of curves as compared to the 24-month separation of curves. Uh, you can see that things are starting to catch up a bit when it comes to the difference between surgery and TAVR. And this is what has been seen in some of the other risk strata, as I'll outline later. What about bicuspid valve? So if we talk about patients less than the age of 65, rather than degenerative, bicuspid is one of the main causes of severe aortic stenosis in this group. So John Forrest and colleagues looked at 150 patients using self-expanding TAVR, 136 with a Seavers type 1 bicuspid morphology, and showed successful implantation with all-cause mortality and disabling stroke low, device success rate of 95%, and they're planning 10-year follow-up. So we will have some data with bicuspid valve. Valves. The problem with bicuspid valves is uh, it, it's not a binary variable. There are you know, multiple different morphologies and calcification uh, distribution in bicuspid valves that make some of these more challenging. So what is a lifetime plan, a concept that our congenital surgeons have been talking about for a long time, and we're finally catching up. If we have a 70-year-old who's still working, should we let them have a, a transcatheter valve now and do an open when they're 80 if they require a redo and we cannot do another transcatheter valve inside? If they have a large annulus, should we just layer TAVRs inside? Uh, if they're young, should we do a tissue valve now and a TAVR later? And the question I often pose to patients is, if we think we've got one shot at this and you're going to have an open surgery, would you want to do that at age 70 or age 80? So how long is this thing going to last? So the, the valves that were FDA approved have been subtly adjusted uh, since 2019. We do not have long-term data on the particular strata or, or the particular variation of the valve that we're using today, just based on the FDA approval. And when these were done in 2009 and 2010, we were doing them in 90-year-old patients. So we don't have 10-year follow-up. Those patients simply aren't here to tell us how their valves are doing at this point. There's been a lot of discussion about the Notion and UK TABI registries, which are two of the largest follow-ups that we have, uh, talking about good long-term function. If we look a little deeper into those, we see that the UK TABI registry first, 241 patients that had a baseline in a greater than five-year transthoracic echo, uh, mix of self-expanding and balloon expandable. And if you look at the bottom, 21 cases that are still alive of moderate structural valve deterioration at 8.7%. However, However, if you look at the curves all the way to the right at eight years, there are only 44 patients that are still around to tell us whether they have moderate or worse structural valve deterioration. So we're dealing with small numbers. And now that we have 21 or 22 with structural valve deterioration out of 44, it doesn't sound as good as 21 out or 22 out of 240. The notion registry is very similar with TAVR and SAVR equal parts. Um, the structural valve deterioration was higher for SAVR than TAVR, which is 24% as opposed to 5%. Uh, by prosthetic valve failure that required reintervention was similar amongst groups. And this is the graph there. Again, if you look at the number at risk, we have quite low numbers at risk when we get out to that six-year endpoint. These are the rest of the long-term data. I wanted cricket noises, but I ended up with cricket pictures. There's really not a lot here. We're in a, a data-free zone as far as the long-term outcome. So why don't we do a TAVR and then just do a second TAVR inside? Uh, Gilbert Tang and colleagues looked at 551 Sapien patients. The Sapien valve is the annular valve. Uh, theoretically, one would think this would be easier to do a TAVR inside a TAVR and came up with a classification schema relative to the sinotubular junction, the height of the sinotubular junction, and the coronary access that would be possible if we put two layers of Sapien inside each other. The most important part, if you look at the right side of the screen, is if your initial transcatheter heart valve comes above the sinotubular junction and makes contact with the sinotubular junction, your ability to put a second valve inside and still have access to the left main coronary is going to be significantly limited, and that occurs up to 30% of the time. So this is not a, a one-off finding. This is quite a frequent finding. Let's talk about the newer data. So the partner data that has had multiple risk strata done, this is the intermediate risk data, looking at patients that received the S3 and are planning on 10-year follow-up. This is their five-year data that was published. If you look at zero to 24 months, which was the initial publication, we have a significant, uh, you know, really 
superimposition of the curves between transcatheter valve and surgery. And in the iliofemoral group, this was statistically significantly in the favor of TAVR. But look what happens between years two and five. We have a complete flip-flop in the curves that we see with TAVR not performing as well as surgery from years two to five. So this is a very important indicator that in patients who are even lower risk for the initial intervention, what are we going to see with our low-risk trial as we have 10-year follow-up? Back to your family friend. So I, when, you, when you're counseling these folks, you say we've got two-year follow-up for the Edwards valve and we have three-year follow-up for the Medtronic valve. Unfortunately for most 65-year-olds, they're not worried about two and three-year fo two and three year follow-up. They're worried about 10 and 12-year follow-up, which we just simply don't have at this point. Limitations of TAVR, valve durability, longevity is unknown. As I said, optimal strategy for treating a failed TAVR is unknown. A permanent pacemaker is probably not a big deal if you're 85, but if you're 60 and have to deal with multiple lead recalls and, and potential bacteremia issues in your life, that's a major issue. And we're also not able to treat concomitant conditions that would come up, left main, ascending aortic disease, other valve disease. So who do I think should still have a SAVR in 2023? Low-risk patients with coronary disease, especially left main or LAD. I think we, we would all agree as interventionalists that a LEMA will outperform a drug-eluting stent for, for severe proximal left anterior descending disease or left main disease. May, patients less than 65 and maybe 70 should probably get a mechanical valve, and that's only surgically available at this point, bicuspid aortic valve disease and concomitant aortopathy, and then patients with a greater than 20-year life expectancy. TAVR for all, what we need, we need long-term durability data. We need 10-year follow-up data from our low-risk trials. We need a better strategy and, and, and placement of our first valve to optimize the potential to have a second valve. Uh, and we're still waiting for the randomized data for TAV and TAV, which we don't have yet. Where are we now? This is my last slide that I wanted to point out. This is a paper that came out this week looking at indication creep in TAVR versus SAVR from Mike Reardon and Sachin Goal. So there was a this Vizient database from 2015 to 21, 2021, 17,000 patients that were less than 65 treated with an aortic valve replacement. And look at the number that's treated with a transcatheter valve. So our guidelines say greater than 65 should be considered for TAVR, less than 65, 47% are currently being treated treated with TAVR. So we've taken some liberties here. I'll take any questions you have. That's my contact information. And this is a famous Simpsons episode where, you know, the kids say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And Homer just continues to say no the whole time. So uh, I agree with him on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Excellent. Um, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Amber McConney who is going to share with us her thoughts about uh, the multitude of valves that we have currently available. How are we going to make sense of who to use these in and, and what, what are the pros and cons of each? Thank you, Dr. McConney. Good morning. Thank you guys so much for having me. So today I'm gonna to discuss valve selection in TAVR. How do we decide? Uh, I have no relevant financial disclosures. So the population of patients who are receiving TAVR in the United States continues to grow. As you can see in 2015, TAVR surpassed um, isolated SAVRs and the rate continued to dramatically increase. And in 2018, we saw that the rate of TAVR implantation in the United States uh, surpassed all SAVRs. Looking at the mean age of patients receiving TAVR in the United States, uh, comparing those patients in 2013 versus uh, currently, you can see that there's a general decrease in the average age of patients who are receiving TAVR, and we expect that this is a large contributor to the increased volume of TAVR implantation in the U.S. And so our traditional focus has been around immediate cure. So we've been treating typically patients who are 80 years old. These are patients who have limited functional capacity and typically a trileaflet anatomy. And our focus has been mortality rate, decreasing our stroke risk, evaluating pacemaker needs and the quality of life. But as we continue to treat younger patients, there's a little bit of shift of our evolution of focus to lifetime management, as Dustin mentioned. We're treating younger patients who are 60 plus. These patients are more active and they have variable anatomy. So our focus is now about durability for increased longevity, optimal hemodynamics, consideration of valve and valve TAVR, and coronary access. Going through the typical valves that we use, so there are multiple iterations of the balloon expandable uh, Edwards valve and the Sapien 3 Ultra you see on the right side. 
um, as our current iteration. In terms of self-expanding TAVR valves, um, there are multiple iterations of the Medtronic valve as well in the current uh, Evolute FX. And the um, Abbott valve has kind of evolved into the current generation of Navator. So uh, different ways to look at these valves. So we often talk about intraannular valves versus superannular valves. Um, you can see that the Edward Sapien and the Abbott Navator valves are both intraannular valves versus the Medtronic valve being a superannular valve, um, high versus low radial strength. And lastly, uh, uh, not that it's at the forefront of our minds, but something to keep in mind is the cost. So there's two sides of a coin here. We often have to balance complications with management considerations. And the complications include things like permanent pacemaker, paravalvular leak, stroke, coronary obstruction, uh, annular rupture, as well as vascular complications. And the management considerations, we often are looking at optimizing the hemodynamics, long-term durability, um, uh, looking at bicuspid valve disease as well as coronary reaccess. And the things that, uh, you know, unfortunately 10 minutes is not enough time to, to talk about all of this, but I was just going to kind of highlight a few, uh, few aspects here. So we'll talk about a little bit of uh, um, both sides here. So unfortunately, as, as Dustin kind of alluded to, we have no large randomized head-to-head -head trials for current generation of TAVR valves. And we're awaiting data regarding the SMART trial um, in those patients who are randomized with small, small annuli to the Evolute versus the Sapien valve. So looking at conduction abnormalities, um, this is the PARTNER-3 trial that evaluated transcatheter aortic valve replacement in balloon expandable valves in low-risk patients. You can see that on average, the uh, new pacemaker rate here is fairly small at 7.3%, but still greater than those patients who receive surgery. Notably though, there's a new left bundle branch block that has been shown to have other implications in about 23% of patients. Looking at the, uh, at the Medtronic valve, so in 2014, the advanced study showed that the average uh, pacemaker implantation rate in patients who are receiving the core valve was approximately 26%. Hemel and his team have been incredibly successful in dramatically decreasing the pacemaker, implant, pacemaker implantation rate um, for self-expanding valves. You can see that prior to the implementation of cusp overlap, the average pacemaker implantation rate was about 20 to 26%. And looking at the interim analysis of the optimized pro data that was presented at TBT in 2021, the pacemaker implantation rate is now somewhere right around 8.8%. Um, around, uh, and Hemel's team has actually shown even lower rates in their, in their personal data. Um, so evaluating paravalvular leak, this is in the Observant 2 study, which evaluated patients who received um, the, the uh, iterations of the, uh, uh, sorry, self-expanding as well as balloon expandable valves as listed. You can see on the left side of the figure, there's mean gradients that are listed, and on the right side, paravalvular leak. So typically what we found is that self-expanding valves have lower mean gradients versus the sapient typically has a higher mean gradient, but there's a little bit of a trade-off when we're looking at paravalvular regurgitation as those patients who receive receive a sapient valve were noted to have lower rates of paravalvular regurgitation um, than those patients who received a self-expanding valve. Looking at patient prosthesis mismatch, so this is the uh, from the SES ACC TV, uh, uh, the TVT registry, and so this is looking at all comer, uh, comer patients treated with TAVR between 2014 and 2017, and what you can see is that there's multiple risk factors for patient prosthesis mismatch, including a valve size less than 23 millimeters, a valve and valve TAVR, and things like body surface area, age, female sex, as well as multiple other factors that are listed. And on the right, you see the breakdown of patients who typically have patient prosthesis mismatch. Um, and, and thankfully, this is not a frequent occurrence, but uh, on the figure that's on the far right, you can see that in those patients who have severe patient prosthesis mismatch, even at one year, there's increased mortality in comparison to those who do not. Looking at hemodynamics, so this is hot off the press from our institution. Um, this is an analysis completed by Jake Brown, one of our cardiac surgery residents, as well as Dr. Sultan. And what you can see is that across the board, the dimensionless index is higher immediately post-TAVR, and there's a mild reduction that is fairly insignificant in the self-expanding valves uh, that is more pronounced in those patients who receive a sapien valve. 
this figure depicts the mean gradients, um, to, uh, kind of similar to what's well published is that on the day of the TAVI, we see decreased gradients overall in all valves that are implanted. Uh, for the self-expanding valves, the portico, as well as the evolute, you see that there's a transient increase on day one, but the, ultimately this gradient decreases at 30 day follow-up. Um, in those patients who received the balloon expandable sapien valve, they had uh, gradients that were elevated at day one that were fairly persistently elevated even at day 30. On the right, you can see the comparison of mean gradient between the valves, and the red line on top is the sapien valve, as we mentioned, increased gradients that are fairly persistent. And on the bottom, you see the superimposed lines demonstrate the Abbott uh, uh, portico as well as the Medtronic Evolute valve. And uh, this really proves that the Abbott portico valve, despite being an intraannular valve, really does have similar gradients um, to the superannular Medtronic Evolute valve. So lastly, looking at structural valve deterioration, um, I know that Dustin showed some of this data, so just to kind of skim through it briefly, um, this is the eight-year follow-up for the Notion trial on the left that shows overall that the TAVI valve has less structural valve deterioration in comparison to SAVR valves. And you can see the definition of, of structural valve uh, deterioration listed. Uh, when we look at the follow-up of the PARTNER2 trial, we see that the current, uh, or the Sapien3 has significantly lower rates of structural valve deterioration in comparison to Sapien XT, but notably the Sapien3 valve still has higher rates of valve uh, deterioration in comparison to surgical valves. So generalized considerations here. So the current literature has shown that there's uh, lower mean gradients and larger effective orifice area traditionally in superannular valves. However, our data and our experience seems to suggest that both self-expanding valve platforms have similar mean gradients. The long-term durability beyond six to eight years has not been well established for any valve platform. The incidence and degree of PVL varies between the devices and based on the calcification uh, and as well as the implant, implementation te implantation technique. But in general, moderate and severe PVL incidence has decreased with the current generation of TAVR valves that we use currently. For valve and valve TAVR, optimal device selection uh, requires us to really identify what is the mechanism that the initial valve failed, whether this is patient prosthesis mismatch, structural valve uh, degeneration, or both. If it's patient prosthesis mismatch, a self-expanding valve may be more favorable in small bioprosthetic prostheses. And balloon fracture of certain prosthetic valves may also facilitate TAVR with larger uh, device um, for better orifice area. So our take home points here, there's really no clear algorithm for valve selection. Each patient must be considered on a case by case basis. Um, considerations include the patient age, their calcium burden, coronary artery disease, valve morphology, as well as durability. But what I can say is what we found is in patients with angulated roots, bicuspid aortic valve disease, extremely large annuli, and beyond ma manufacturer recommendations, uh, typically a sapien valve is a good choice. In younger patients, consider a use of an intraannular valve. Patients with coronary artery disease, um, consider an intraannular valve as well. And for valve and valve tab, or consider a self-expanding valve. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mahani. We're going to uh, change gears a little bit and talk now about the uh, how we manage some of the uh, potential complications or how we deal with patients that have TAVRs in place and, and significant coronary artery disease. Dr. Catalin Toma, our expert coronary uh, interventionalist, is going to talk to us about percutaneous coronary interventions with TAVR. He's going to tell us uh, tips and tricks. Thank you, Catalin. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. So no complications here, it's all good. So um, so when, when we think about coronary artery disease and TAVR, we think about sort of two aspects, the coronary artery disease pre-TAVR and post-TAVR. So pre-TAVR, the important thing that we need to address is whether we should treat coronary artery disease with revascularization. And when do we do that? And this has been an evolving field. When we started doing TAVR, we used to stent everybody pre-TAVR. Now we moved to a completely different approach. This is a case that we did a while back. You see a patient with a very tight osteal RCA lesion. There's a moderate uh, mid LAD disease as well. So is this a patient that would need um, treated with revascularization pre-TAVR? If you're looking at the um, incidence of coronary artery disease, as you can expect, it's very high in this patient population. These are all patients. They all have um, coronary artery disease. We detect a lot of this with coronary CTA. And it's a predictor of uh, short and long-term mortality, but the question is, is treating the disease without uh, impact anything? 
And we actually do have some randomized clinical data in this space, the activation trial, which addressed specifically this question. This is an European trial looking at PCI before TAVR in patients with mostly single vessel disease, stable disease. And as you can see in panel A, there is complete overlap of the curves. In fact, this trial was terminated earlier. Uh, no difference in events, but there is a difference in the bleeding rate, which is high in the patients who underwent PCI, as you'd expect, because of the dual antiplatelet therapy. If you're looking at all the data combined, and by all the data, I mean mostly observational studies and the randomized control trial that we talked about, you'll see that the um, um, uh, curves overlap perfectly. There is no evidence currently that a routine PCI pre-TAVR um, is uh, of any clinical benefit. Now, having said that, uh, this is a paper that just came out in neurointervention that looks in detail at this aspect of coronary artery disease and TAVR before and after. It's a very, uh, very good read and that summarizes the current evidence. It's a little more nuanced than that, right? So we'd individualize treatment in, uh, in patients pre-TAVR. So if you have somebody who has proximal disease, like our patients, critical stenosis, more than 90%, not the 70%, that's maybe IFR positive, if they have unstable um, a presentation, a younger age, LV dysfunction due to CAD, although this is probably taboo now, uh, or plan for what is called now high frame TAVR, as opposed to patients in which medical management is favored, patients with high risk of bleeding, uh, mid vessel, branch disease, old age, and plan for low frame TAVR. And I'll show you what that is. So this is back to our patient. Um, we did, um, I, I think we might have shockwave this patient and we got a good result. So how about um, coronary artery disease post tower So this becomes more of an issue of how do you do this and what are the technical challenges here, right? If you're looking at, uh, there are a number of studies looking at coronary access post tower as you can imagine, is a little challenging. This is a, a study looking, a Canadian study looking at the STEMI patients who had the tower before, and as you can see, the, third, the, long, the door to balloon time is longer. There's a four, fourfold higher uh, PCI failure in these cases, and the mortality is high. But the important thing is the incidence of STEMI in patients post tower is very low. And this is substantiated by more recent data showing that the need for PCI post tower in the patient population that we currently treat is relatively low. If you're looking at why does this happen, this is the reaccess trial looking at patients who underwent PCI or coronary angiography post-tower. You can see the predictors for failure to access the corners, as you'd expect, uh, are the high frame valves, such as the evolute valve, high implant of the valve, and misalignment of the coronary uh, of the commissures with the, uh, with the uh, coronary arteries. There are multiple mechanisms that can make coronary access challenging, especially in this high frame valves. You have a face sinuses, you have bulky leaflets that can get in front of the ostea of the corners, especially if the corners are low. And some of the mechanical issues related to the valve, you can have cell and ostium misalignment. So it's not necessarily a commissural alignment, but there is the, the metal part of the valves that's right in front of the coronary where you can have commissural misalignment where the commissure of the valve of the new valve sits right in front of the coronary. And of course, there are different, different types of valves. Um, some of them have easier coronary access, and these are the low frame players, the Sapien and Acrid Neo. The higher frame players, such as Portico and particularly Evolute with a low frame, with a low cell, small cell, cell size are uh, somewhat more challenging. So how do you do this? In a, um, every interventional cardiologist will come across this um, in the middle of the night sometimes, uh, and you have to know how to deal with this. Uh, this is something important for our fellows as well. Um, with this um, high frame valves, such as the Evolute valve, uh, what you want to do is prefer femoral access for these cases. You want to make sure that you position yourself in an angle that shows you the ostium of the, of the coronary of interest very well. And this is usually an LAO cranial angle. And you want to start with the pigtail. So the whole concept here is to try to stay inside the frame and get coaxial with the coronary artery and not get outside or not get tangled with the outside of the frame. Catheter selection, the simple rule of thumb is go 0.5 smaller than what you would use for your regular um, approach. You want to get as perpendicular um, on the frame as possible. Um, and in order to achieve that, you want to exchange the pigtail that allow you to get inside the frame for your guide catheter and advance the catheter to the frame waist and use the J wire. This is a trick that we've been using a lot more, the back end of the J wire to change the curvature of the catheter so that it allows you to get to where you need to go. 
Now, sometimes this doesn't happen. It's very hard to get right at the ostium or um, even in the zip code of the ostium. So sometimes you have to wire this um, vessels from, from outside to do an airmail approach, basically. Um, you have to have liberal use of guide extensions to get you to the coronary. Um, and after the PCI, it's important to be very careful when you remove the gear not to, um, to damage the frame or and even dislodge the valve, which is, doesn't happen that often. But So um, this is a, a case, a patient that we treated with um, a TAVR several years prior. As you can see, this is an evolute prosthesis, um, comes back with angina, has some osteal RCA disease significant LAD disease and a, and a CTO of the circumflex. Um, couldn't resist to throw that in there. So the LAD was positive and we ended up fixing this through the, um, um, through the um, Evolute frame. As you can see, the guide is sitting way outside. Uh, you appreciate in the middle panel how angulated you are relative to the um, ostium of the left main. So we, we're not close to the, uh, we, we're working rem remotely here. Um, and we're getting, we can still get with a, with the aid of guide extensions, we can still get a, a very nice result. The buzz world in the in the tower world now, as far as coronary um, um, the coronary aspect of things goes, is this commissural alignment concept. We talked a little bit. I mentioned this a little bit. Um, the idea here is to try to avoid having the commissures of the new valve sitting right in front of the coronaries. Um, there is several benefits to this, not only re related to coronary access, but there's all these theories about improved sealing and decreased leafless stress and suitability for a basilica for, uh, for subsequent, with subsequent tower. The current platforms, um, you can achieve this in some cases. It's not a, an easy thing to do, and it's not very reliable at this point. So the manufacturers now are, are focusing on ways of improving their platforms to achieve this. The current platforms are not geared for, uh, they're not constructed to have um, um, torque. They're, they're constructed to have uh, longitudinal strength for delivery. So this is uh, this is a work in progress, but it's going to be very, um, very interesting how this will evolve, especially when we're looking at younger patients that, that may need coronary work in the future. So I'm going to end up with this. I mean, if you think um, cathing a, through a single prosthesis is fun, wait until you have to do uh, for two of them in the middle of the night. So... Uh, that's a different, a whole other uh, topic. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Excellent, Katon. Uh, next, we're going to switch over to the surgical side, uh, Sauer. And Dr. Uh, Ibrahim Sultan, my co-director, is going to talk to us about surgical aortic valve replacement. What does the future look like? Ibs. Thank you, Conrad. We're waiting for my slides since I just submitted them about three minutes ago. So, uh, all right, wonderful. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining this morning. I know many of you are tubed into YouTube and live via Zoom. Uh, feel free to put your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, we have multiple physicians uh, moderating and can help answer those questions. And Dr. Smith will bring them to the panel. So this is a little bit of a loaded question. Uh, <clears throat> does surgical aortic valve replacement have a future, right? So here are my disclosures. And, and the short answer is yes, but it comes with caveats. So if you look at the aortic valve intervention universe, and we, we call this AVR, we don't say TAVI or TAVR or SAVR anymore, because really the goal again is to alleviate the patients with aortic stenosis in, in those particular patients. And so we've seen that there's clearly been a revolution in the management of, of aortic stenosis, right? Uh, and this is a nice cartoon that depicts this uh, from back in the day from New Yorker. What have we learned really over the past decade, right? We have learned that TAVI is a revolutionary technology to treat patients with aortic stenosis it'll likely continue to be the dominant mode of treatment for degenerative trileaflet aortic stenosis. And a multidisciplinary evaluation in a valve clinic is likely to provide the most thoughtful and comprehensive treatment plan for patients with heart valve disease. And the third part is very important, and you've heard this with, uh, with, with Dustin earlier as well. So what is the heart team, right? So the patient's primary care physician or, or provider, uh, the patient's primary cardiologist, uh, our imaging expert, uh, interventional cardiologists, cardiac surgeon, advanced practice providers, and nurses who are with us in the clinic. But the reality is that the patient is driving most of these decisions, right? And so the patient is truly the captain of this heart team. And depending on which expert on this list they talk to, 
it is not uncommon that a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. And so when we combine our expertise and really look at what we think is relevant comparing patient to patient, moving away from this low risk, intermediate, high risk, but really talking about life expectancy and, and amount of future interventions, that gives us a better framework. So what does the patient want, which is very different than what does the physicians want, right? So patients want the least invasive option and complete relief of their symptoms. They want 0% mortality. They want 0% stroke. They don't want a pacemaker. They want to go home the same day or the next day. They want to be back to work and golfing the same week. And they want to know what is a long-term or durability plan. Some of them may not talk about it if they're not educated on it, but they want some sort of plan if their prosthesis fails. And they, they again, do not want any INR checks from quote-unquote rat poison. And so this lifetime management is not really a buzzword. It's thrown around, obviously, quite a bit. Uh, and we've learned this, as I'm sure Dustin pointed out, from, from congenital cardiologists and surgeons. So if you look at the life expectancy uh, quite a bit ago, this is what that looked like, right? So patients who we know got to about age 65, lived for about 18 to years or so. What we know is once you get five years past AVR, you're likely to get a survival benefit that's equivalent to the healthy population, assuming you don't have any concomitant disease. Now, this has changed over time, and this continues to increase particularly in women. So what is the patient with aortic stenosis here, whether they get direct mailing from one of the companies in their mail or what their PCP tells them or, or what they read in the news about Mick Jagger, which is, <clears throat> well, first valve, get a bioprosthetic cow or pig valve. <clears throat> There's all these new technologies, right? It's going to last about 20 years. And then you go in and you go get a valve through the groin, right? What that patient should really know is that the time to failure is really about seven years median. It's not 13 years. It was 13 years when we didn't monitor these patients as aggressively with echocardiograms. It was 13 years when a 90-year-old, after getting a surgical AVR, was not referred for any intervention because valve and valve therapies didn't exist. That's when it was 13 years. We know, based on valve and valve registry data, it, it's about seven years when these start failing. The second valve and valve TAVI, uh, which, which is usually a TAVI, is usually in, in the, let's say, late 60s or 70s. And so what do you do when, you're, when it's time for your third valve, right? And again, there's a variety of leaflet modification techniques that may help. But again, it's a little bit pie in the sky and very much restricted to certain centers. Or worse, and this is what you see perhaps on, on either coast or big cities. Well, get your tower when you're about six years old. Uh, you know, it'll give you about 15, 20 years and then get another valve and valve and then get another valve and valve and then get another valve and valve. We also know that if we explant these valves, the mortality, morbidity, stroke risk is significantly higher than just a simple redo surgical AVR. This may change with experience, but we, but we do know that anatomically, it's, it's a much more challenging process. And again, with each valve and valve, this is a nesting doll concept. So again, not just a buzzword, right? So it's an outstanding strategy, valve and valve tabby, starting with a bioprosthetic valve for patients with structural valve degeneration. But it all depends on the anatomy and the first valve the patient has. The most common bioprosthetic surgical valve implanted in this country is a 21 millimeter tissue valve. We know this. If you ask a surgeon, they will tell you their average is about 25 or 27. We also know that that is false. Based on registry data, it's a 21 millimeter valve. In fact, majority of the valve, nearly 70% of the valves are, that are placed are about 21 or 23 millimeter valves. This is an example of a patient who was presented with, with uh, patient prosthesis mismatch after a 19 millimeter valve, uh, had a mitral valve repair, uh, uh, LVOT expansion. Uh, and in Manugian uh, enlargement to place uh, an appropriate size valve in. So again, index valve size is key, right? The other concept that comes to this is it, it depends on what the pathology is. Uh, bicuspid patients are very different uh, than patients who have trileaflet disease. The anatomy is different, the pathology is different, and most of these patients in trials were all self-selected based on CT anatomy. A type zero, very different than a type one, calcified raphid, different than a non-calcified raphid. So uh, again, I, I think the hammer nail concept doesn't apply to all bicuspids, which are typically young patient or low risk patients. The way we implant these valves matter. If you use foreign body and materials and pledges in the LVOT, that is going to give you a higher gradient when you get a valve and valve tabby. And so it's important to think about all these things. The approach and strategy matters. Patient care about the size of the incision, how soon they can get back to work and what that involves. And again, when it's isolated, a sternal serring approach is very much appropriate through a small incision, uh, allows patients to, to drive, you know, drive sooner, get home quicker, et cetera, et cetera. 
And importantly, valve choice matters. A, a, in a patient with a BSA of approximately 1.9, even a 19 millimeter mechanical valve, not something we recommend, is a, it may be appropriate, or a 21 millimeter valve. For that exact patient, you need a 25 millimeter surgical bioprosthetic valve. So again, it's important to understand how hemodynamics and EOAs matter between mechanical and tissue. And so this is kind of an algorithm that we think about, well, you know, and, and go down the pathway depending on age and, and risk where they are. We also know that there is no perfect option. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. And the thing that I would be aware of is really the part of the bottom, which is the trendy options, uh, where all sorts of variety of different valves come in. These patients are coming to us when they're low risk and they're young, and they want durability. They're not coming to us for a fancy option. And I think it's important to consider this and use long-term data that we have before we go into it. And it's important to be, here, be aware of the hype, right? Every new valve talks about, you know, it looks great for about five to seven years. And it's, it's you see this in all the ads, 100% freedom from SVD, from symptom relief and reoperation. But we, again, we know that these valves start to fail at about seven or nine to 10 years. And these are some examples of valves that have looked perfect in the midterm and started failing uh, relatively quickly. And again, understanding these data is important to make these decisions. So again, going back to what the patient wants, right? And these decisions, depending on their risk category, and again, this is not no longer for us defined by STS risk standards, but more based on life expectancy and how these patients are going to live. And so high risk and intermediate risk, even though we don't discuss this, we know that mortality and morbidity is likely the same at five years. This is what we know from historic data. But despite that, we would favor TAVI for these patients, particularly virtually everyone over the age of 80. In low risk, or what I would call younger patients, we know that TAVR equivalent to SAVR at three years, and I put giant asterisk marks there because we only know this for self-expanding valves. This is not the case for balloon-expanding valve. There's no data to prove that. So when we have these discussions, patients important to note. Combinant left main or proximal LAD disease, very simple aortopathy, prior bi bioprosthesis, bicuspid aortic valve, which deserves an hour-long talk by itself. And so when we look at future of SAVR, it is very likely that, that it may be apart from what we would do treating lower risk or younger patients, perhaps fighting structural valve degeneration down the line. Great. Thank you again and uh, excited about the rest of the day. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's excellent. We are going to change gears again and uh, move from the aortic valve to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Dr. Timothy Wong is our expert, our local expert in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. He's going to give us a, a talk about the state of the art. Tim. Thanks for inviting me. And I, I'd like to just uh, start off by saying, does an HCM talk even belong at a valve conference? And hopefully over the next nine minutes, uh, we can uh, have some nice discussions. So I'd like to posit that identifying a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy phenotype, the physiology of LEOT obstruction, may be relevant in certain instances in aortic and even mitral valve disease. Uh, should obstruction occur either before or after uh, such procedures, uh, there's a variety of treatment options. And then finally, I'd like to touch briefly upon the state of the art in uh, HOCOM, which is a novel uh, myosin inhibitor therapy for the treatment of LVOT obstruction. So without further ado, this is a 70-year-old female with just very progressive dyspnea exertion and now resting dyspnea and CHF symptoms. And she's now so debilitated, she's wheelchair bound. She happens to be on barapamol for hypertension and an echo was performed in the long axis view. So what we can see here is that uh, there's asymmetric septal hypertrophy. And if you look very closely in the outflow tract, you can even see a bright spot right uh, on top of the mitral valve, which is suggestive of a callus from mitral uh, septal SAM uh, contact. So in this patient, you can also see uh, that the aortic valve is somewhat calcified. There's some mobility to the leaflets. And then so, you know, I think Doppler is really helpful here to try to tease out what's going on. And our colleagues at Hammett did this really uh, fantastic echo where they show that at rest, there's not much obstruction going on. But with Valsalva, you can get both an LVOT and an aortic valve uh, gradient. And then so the top right panel just shows the uh, raw data. And I've taken the liberty of, uh, highlighting a um, late peaking LVOT gradient that's hidden within the aortic stenosis signal. And interestingly, this is uh, only on provocation. 
So what would you do next? Would you just observe and then repeat the echo and hope things get better? Uh, you could add disapyramide as an anti-inotropic to relieve the outflow gradient. You could add mavicamptin, or you could go interventional, alcohol septal ablation and reassess for TAVR indications, septal myectomy plus SAVR. So we uh, had a very uh, nuanced discussion with this patient. And given her comorbidities, which I didn't list all of them, uh, there's multiple other uh, confounding factors, we decided to add disapyramide. She actually did fantastic. She felt great. Uh, she, um, you know, could do do more at home. But then, unfortunately, her symptoms and the gradient returned. And we see that sometimes that disapyramide can wear off. She really wanted to avoid uh, any sort of invasive intervention. We started Mavicamptin on her. I'll talk more about that later. That worked for a little bit, but again, uh, her symptoms progressed. So then we did another echo to try to tease out: Is this worsening LVOT obstruction, or has the aortic stenosis gotten worse? And here in the bottom panel, you can see clear-cut, severe resting early peaking um, uh, aortic uh, stenosis sig signal with a mean gradient uh, in, the, in the 50 range. So definitely the aortic stenosis has come to the fore. And, but our knowledge that she had a pre-existing LVOT gradient caused by hypertrophied muscle kind of helped us influence our decision-making. We knew we would probably have to address that um, you know, uh, as part of her overall management strategy. So she opted for alcohol septal ablation to treat the LVOT obstruction because she didn't want to take Mavicamptin uh, lifelong. And then um, to sum up the case, uh, Dr. Toma did a fantastic uh, alcohol septal ablation. Just uh, briefly, there's an overbar uh, balloon in the first septal perforator there. We use echo guidance in the middle panel. You can actually see the echo probe on the fluoroscopy. And then on the right-hand panel, you can see a mixture of iodinated and microbubble contrast that was injected into the septal perforator as a test to mark out the site of ablation before the actual alcohol was uh, proceeded. And then she'll now uh, move on to uh, AV uh, tap evaluation. So why all this uh, you know, discussion about the LVOT? And it's basically focused on the potential for a rare but uh, catastrophic complication of uh, severe obstructive shock following the procedure. And there have been multiple case reports of um, morbidity and mortality in this situation. There are no guidelines regarding criteria for preemptive intervention, but there are definitely expert opinion articles, uh, some of which has come out from um, UPMC, that at least discuss some of the variables involved. And I think it really uh, boils down to the, the heart team concept that uh, Ebes and Dustin have uh, you know, mentioned earlier. Um, in the event of uh, post-procedural obstructive physiology, IV fluids, phenylephrine as a presser of choice, and then also very cautious use of anti-anotropic therapy can be considered. And also extremely cautious use of impella has been described uh, in cases like this. Uh, I, so I think bottom line, working uh, as part of a uh, robust heart team really can make a lot of difference. I'd like to change gears here and kind of go a little bit deeper into a novel drug that uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, which is uh, Mavicamptin. So currently for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, first line medical therapy consists of beta blockers and non-dihydropyridine calcium ch channel blockers like diltiazem and verapamil. Second line therapy would be an antiarrhythmic, which has a potent anti inotropic effect, disapyramide. And the guidelines mention this as part of an algorithm on the, on the right here. But what if the patient uh, fails these, but is not really interested in uh, mechanical intervention? Then a novel uh, myosin inhibitor is now clinically approved on the market since uh, April of last year. And the mechanism is unique um, in that it binds to myosin and changes its conformation so that there are fewer myosin heads available for the myosin actin crosslinks that is uh, necessary for a typical sarcomere uh, contractility. And in doing so, it uh, performs as a negative inotrope. And a phase three explorer trial uh, demonstrated in about 250 patients that uh, LVEF is relatively preserved, uh, but the LVOT gradient can be markedly improved and symptoms improve uh, with exposure to Mavicamptin. So based on that, it's clinically available. Uh, how we use it here is typically symptomatic patients, despite first or second line medical therapy, who either have a contraindication to uh, mechanical septal reduction therapy or through uh, you know, just uh, very in-depth uh, patient-centered uh, uh, counseling uh, elects to try this. And of note, um, because there's a small risk of systolic heart failure, 
uh, pres prescribing this uh, drug is uh, through a mandatory risk mitigation program. So uh, patients are counseled about the small risk of reversible systolic dysfunction. There's a mandatory echo imaging performed every four weeks for the first quarter and then every 12 weeks thereafter, and you have to follow a strict titration protocol. This is just um, uh, one classic case of a young, young patient who failed first in uh, um, uh, second line therapy was able to start Mavicamp. And then I'll just uh, point out uh, the middle uh, row in, in, in the uh, table here, where he started off with a gradient of uh, 116 and now has a gradient in the 32 and 49 range and it's NYIG class one and completely asymptomatic. And uh, he is now back to, um, you know, he does line dancing and can actually go back to line dancing now. So I'd like to just recap what we've covered over the past few minutes and that uh, in rare cases, LVOT hokum physiology may occur either before or after um, aortic valve replacement. There's uh, an evidence-free zone, but there's definitely a lot of anecdotal uh, data and ev uh, expert opinion regarding how to manage this. And I think working as part of our heart team is important for that. And then finally, um, you know, uh, um, there are now novel medications to treat muscular uh, derived LVOT obstruction uh, in the Hocum setting. And we're still uh, getting more and more experience with this. And I think the future is bright for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I'd like to thank you for your attention and just thank uh, all our clinical collaborators here, uh, interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery. Um, and like I said, it really takes a team approach to uh, tackle this issue. Thanks a lot. Great. We're going to move forward now. We've heard a lot about surgical and transcatheter aortic valve replacement. Um, and next, we're going to hear about aortic valve repair. Dr. Serna Gallegos is going to talk to us about when we should do that or think about doing that. Derek. Thank you. Uh, I want to just first uh, thank all the directors of the conference and the symposium, uh, Dr. Gata, Dr. Smith, and Dr. Salton for having me. Uh, today's talk, we're going to talk about uh, aortic valve repair and when to do it. Uh, we're going to briefly talk about some aortic valve anatomy, advantages and challenges to aortic valve repair, uh, some strategies for aortic valve repair, and then uh, some, some results. The advantages of aortic valve repair can be, uh, uh, there can be many. Uh, hemodynamics are obviously the best of the valve that we're all born with. Uh, durability, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about things that can make uh, some valve repairs more durable than others, but generally, you know, absence of calcification and uh, absence of things like fenestrations can make for a very durable uh, valve repair. Um, there's really no chance of a patient prosthesis mismatch for our own aortic valves. It's the low, lowest uh, endocarditis risk. And one of the main things that patients love is just the avoidance of anticoagulation, especially as you'll see in, in, uh, in the population of uh, the aortic valve repair patients, it's generally younger patients and being able to avoid anticoagulation for a, a longer part of their life is obviously quite the advantage. Uh, isolated uh, aortic regurgitation with essentially normal cusps is, is relatively rare. Um, Trileaflet valve has three co-optation zones that all need to be optimized to maintain a, a, a good uh, functioning valve that's durable over time. Um, and often we see at least some leaflet calcifications or some fenestrations. And the more we have to do to any leaflet, whether it's decalcifying it or uh, repairing uh, things like fenestrations, uh, the, the more complex it becomes and, and the, the, the uh, worse the durability is over time. One of the things that's very important about aortic valve repair is, is, is thinking about it much in the same way that we think of mitral valve repair. We, we often uh, think about you know, the mitral valve and the, the subvalvular apparatus and all the different parts, the corda tendinae and the, the papillary muscles and, and all the different functioning parts of the mitral valve. And we really need to think about the aortic valve in the same way. Uh, manipulation of the annulus, manipulation of the cusps, uh, the commissures, the intercommissural triangles that really give a lot of the support from the annulus and the and the ventricular aortic junction all the way up through the commissures and the connection of those leaflet or, or cusps, uh, the anchoring of them into the aortic wall, all those parts of the aortic valve are, are incredibly important. And manipulation of those is important for a good, durable aortic valve repair. Um, 
the sinuses of Valsalva, we know are so important in, in the durability of our own leaflets and being able to, to minimize the stress uh, as the valve opens and closes during the cardiac cycle, the sinotubular junction, the alignment of the, of the commissures, um, which, which allows for great co-optation of the, of the leaflets and, and the, the cusps. All that is, is incredibly important, and we need to think about uh, the aortic valve as a unit and the aortic root as a unit, and all those parts being incredibly important in the repair of the valve. So, um, you know, noting those important anatomical structures, all of those can be intervened upon. Uh, annuloplasties of the aortic valve uh, uh, have also been described in addition to, to uh, as part of the repair. Same with cusp remodeling, although cusp remodeling, I think the more that you have to do in terms of uh, central plication, triangular resections, and free margin resuspension of, of the cusps, the more complex that that becomes, you know, the, uh, the, 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 there is some decrease in durability. Raffae remodeling for uh, bicuspid aortic valves, commissural resuspension, uh, both in, in uh, valve spur and root repairs. And, and also very importantly, and one of the most kind of common uh, aortic valve repairs that we do is, is a aortic valve repair for um, aortic regurgitation and aortic dissection. And commissural resuspension is incredibly important in, in giving those patients a, a, uh, um, a long living uh, durable repair of that aortic valve. Um, sinus replacement, as in uh, the remodeling technique and uh, resizing of the sinotubular junction, again, uh, kind of um, realigning those commissures and making everything very competent. The two most common uh, types of valve repair, uh, I mentioned aortic valve resuspension for aortic dissection, but also valve sparing root replacement. We're going to focus more on valve sparing root replacement today, um, just out of, out of time issues. Um, so the requirements for, for the two techniques, reimplantation, remodeling. Reimplantation, you need absence of cusp degeneration. Remodeling, you in, in addition to the absence of cusp degeneration, you need an absence of annular enlargement. Now there's there's kind of a theory on on the two different types of uh, aneurysms that and, and the repairs that that, uh, that you can do for both of them. So in a a young patient. Uh, with a genetic syndrome or genetic disease, Marfan's Lois Dietz, where a lot of the, the pathology is down in the root, um, often you'll have uh, annular ectasia, annular dilation. And that lends itself more to a, a reimplantation technique where the annulus is stabilized. Patients in their later decades of life, often patients that have degenerative, uh, you know, ascending aortic aneurysms that, that start in the ascending aorta and move proximally into the, the sinotubular junction, with that being a lot of, and into the sinuses also, but with the much of the pathology being in the ascending aorta and, and moving proximally, those patients uh, can, can do as well with, with a remodeling technique because the, the annulus is not uh, as often enlarged in those patients. This is a, a picture of a, a reimplantation. Um, the, uh, for the reimplantation, the apparatus affected, the, the annulus is stabilized, sinotubular junction is resized, and the commissures are resuspended. This was uh, Tyrone, Tyrone David's 20-year uh, data looking at uh, reimplantations, 333 patients, follow-up of 10 years, mean age, again, 46 years, mostly uh, young patients. Um, the survival, um, uh, 20 years, uh, through the survival all the way out to 20 years, just under 80%. Um, if you look at, um, uh, mortality or a uh, combination of mortality or reoperation at 20 years, 22.8%, uh, but very good, uh, uh, results. If you look at the degree of aortic regurgitation, severe and moderate, 1.3 and 2.6% at 20 years. And then the, the graph at the bottom is mostly just to look at everything, um, except for the very deep red is, uh, is no aortic regurgitation trace or mild. So over a time period of 20 years, uh, very, very uh, few instances of severe or even moderate re aortic regurgitation. Uh, this was 25 year experience of the of Tyrone David's group looking at both reimplantations and uh, remodeling, uh, mostly reimplantations and some remodeling, uh, mortality, uh, freedom from mortality, at 18 years, 76.8%, freedom from reoperation at 18 years, 95%, and then freedom from significant aortic uh, insufficiency, 78% at 18 years. This is comparing their remodeling and reimplantation, not, not any uh, statistical significance, but some trending towards uh, freedom from reoperation being better for the reimplantation technique uh, all the way out to 20 years. 
So if we're looking at remodeling, uh, the apparatus that are affected, the sinotubular junctions resize, the commissures are resuspended, and the sinuses are, are, are basically replaced. Annulus is not stabilized. Some people do perform an annuloplasty in addition to the uh, remodeling technique, uh, which can add, uh, have some added benefit of stabilizing the annulus. This is a pic, uh, picture of, of the way it's uh, performed, and you can see that the valve is not reimplanted within a graft. It's, um, it's the sinuses are replaced, and the valve uh, commissures are resuspended. You need an absence of cuts degeneration and absence of annular enlargement. This is a, a large uh, group's data from uh, Germany, seven, almost 750 patients, mean age of 54 years. Um, freedom from reoperation uh, was, was uh, significantly different between tricuspid, bicuspid, and unicuspid valves, with, with uh, tricuspid valves having the, uh, the uh, best uh, freedom from reoperation. Uh, there was not a ton of unicuspid valves. Uh, included and the data did not go out as far as, as the others. Uh, freedom from significant aortic regurgitation. Um, they did have some changes to their technique. In 2009, they added that annuloplasty, which seemed to improve their freedom from aortic regurgitation. Um, uh, one, one last quick uh, study from the same group, a 20 year period, uh, looking at just uh, root remodeling and bicuspid valves to see can this work well for bicuspid valves? Uh, they had 97.8% follow-up, a mean follow-up of 57 months, uh, ranged in age from 10 to 80 years. Reoperation uh, re was 12.3 at 10 years, 21 or 22% at 15 years, and um, significant uh, aortic regurgitation was almost 20% at 15 years. Development of aortic stenosis um, with any cusp calcification was was very low at, at 10 and 15 years. So. Um, which is better? They're both different, and I think that they should not be seen as competing procedures. Reimplantation, again, going back to the kind of uh, thought that you know, if it's a young patient, the pathology starts in the root and moves prox or moves distally, then you need to make sure that you um, stabilize the annulus, and that would be an argument for reimplantation. For remodeling, uh, if the if the aneurysm is more in the ace setting and 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 going proximally uh, into the root. Um, those patients can do well with without annular stabilization, just with a remodeling procedure. So when do I do each, or when do we do each repair? Well, you have to have non-calcified cusp with minimal need for cusp repair, have to be an experienced center, metabolically appropriate, meaning uh, it can be done in aortic dissection, very select patients that are gonna tolerate a little longer operation. Thank you very much. All right, excellent. And closing out our session, we're going to get to a, a little bit more um, basic with a, a research talk um, by Dr. Cynthia St. Hilaire. She's going to talk to us about from the bench to the bedside novel druggable target driving in aortic stenosis. Dr. St. Hilaire. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I guess I'm I'm definitely switching gears. Um, so I, I do have a disclosure. We are we're patenting some of this technology. Um, but my lab, I have a lab at um, uh, University of Pittsburgh in the Department of Medicine and Cardiology, and we do basic and translational research. We are very much interested in the biological mechanisms driving um, calcification diseases. Um, and specific to this um, meeting today, calcific aortic valve disease. And so, you know, it really wasn't until 1993 when Linda Diemer and Christina Bostrom at UCLA really defined that calcification in the vasculature, whether it's in the valve or in the vessels, is an active biological process. It is not just the breakdown of the tissue. And we in my lab are very interested in understanding that process that causes a healthy vascular cell to transition into a calcifying cell. And our main questions are stemming around or swimming around this idea that is it um, maybe a one or two step process where just a couple genes or a couple proteins are dysregulated, or do the cells actually undergo a very complex um, trans differentiation, where they maybe assume, you know, stem cell-like properties or, and, and then um, undergo a transition that makes them very much osteoblast-like cells. 
And so as we were thinking about um, calcifigurative valve disease, um, because the other diseases I'm working on are, are genetic based, you know, we really went back to the tissue, the, the cell source of a lot of the cells in our tissue and, and, and in a lot of the soft tissue, including the vasculature, it's the mesenchymal stem cell. And as we're digging around, um, we found these really interesting studies. These are rather old, they're from 2002. And when they overexpressed this gene called, or this just gene called TERT or telomerase, which hopefully everyone in the audience knows is what helps um, keep a cell healthy. It extends the telomeres of a cell. And that um, overexpression didn't immortalize the cells. It actually drove them to calcify. And so I'm not gonna give you a big, biochemical talk. Um, I know you're all physicians, um, but um, suffice it to say that under normal conditions, this, this gene TERT helps to elongate the telomeres at the end of our chromosome. But a lot of recent and really interesting molecular work has identified that it's actually also a chaperone that can help harness the chromatin remodeling components that help a cell transition between its fate. And so we started to ask this question, um, I think it was in about 2017, does TERT, does overexpression of TERT help drive the osteogenic transition of cells? And we're very interested in this, obviously, because if we know what's driving it, we can perhaps prevent it from happening. And so that's um, when I started collaborating with um, cardiothoracic surgeons here at UPMC and the HVI, and um, this lower valve actually we got from EBS. And um, we started with a tissue-based approach. And so looking at these human tissues, we started to measure this protein in the, cell, in the, in the tissue and found that it was very up, um, as you can see in the pink here, I don't think I have a pointer, but um, it was very high in, in the calcified tissue. And we were able to develop um, a very unique protocol, well, not very unique, but, but hadn't existed before, where we can actually uh, collect cells directly from these patient valves, but also from a uh, donor cadaveric tissue that is up to two days old. And we can process these cells um, in special solutions that allows them to survive for in vitro disease modeling. And so we can actually get cells to calcify in a dish. That's what you see with this red stain. And we started to do kind of basic molecular biology approaches to understand the um, contribution and the requirement of this gene TERT in our cells. And if we were overexpressing it in the valve interstitial cells that we would collect it, um, from patients, we could prevent calcification in a dish. And this is a standard, you know, in vitro disease model um, used in the field. And when we wanted to think about what could be driving this, what could be driving um, this, this protein TERT to be upregulated, it really shouldn't be there if a cell is not dividing. We went back and started to look at some of the cases where you get early um, calcification of the valve, you know, things like inflammation and interferonopathies um, drive um, some of that pathology. And there's even some uh, studies um, in vitro uh, using porcine cells, I believe, that showed that interferon signaling can help drive the transdifferentiation of a valve interstitial cell. And so we started to ask that question and looked at this protein RUNX2, which is required for a cell to calcify. And so this RUNX2 is highly up in our cells. It is present in the nucleus when these valve interstitial cells are undergoing osteogenic transition. And we can do um, these molecular assays called proximity ligation assays, where we can actually see TERT and STAT co-localization in these valve interstitial cells in our in vitro disease model. We can also show binding through immunoprecipitation assays and also um, some more um, uh, direct and also unbiased approaches that are showing this complex of TERT and STAT5 are honing in to um, the RUNX2 sites in the DNA, helping to drive the expression of this osteogenic gene RUNX2. What we've then wanted to do is try to leverage this to prevent calcification. So if we use an inhibitor of telomerase, our cells will essentially age, right? We can't shorten our telomeres. Also a telomere um, inhibiting drug doesn't prevent calcification. We're talking about the non-canonical effects of TERT. So we went down the other pathway, which is STAT5. And if we use known available inhibitors of STAT5, we can prevent calcification in addition. So this is showing you data from both um, human valve interstitial cells, but also coronary artery smooth muscle cells. We also then go back to the patient tissue and we have found that TERT and STAT are co-localizing 
um, in the nucleus of cells of, of calcified valve tissue. Really importantly, um, where, where, where could we actually try to target these, these pathways um, for therapies is perhaps in a bioprosthetic valve, right? If we could perhaps coat a bioprosthetic valve with a novel molecule to prevent the osteogenic transition of cells, um, that, that might expand uh, the lifespan beyond the seven years. And so we're actually seeing that the cells on top of and kind of embedded in bioprosthetic valves um, are also showing these signatures of TERT and STAT5 in their osteogenic, it, it, as these cells are calcifying. You can see them um, in, in the green and the red um, on, this, um, on this image. And so to kind of summarize our findings, you know, we think that this initial inflammatory insult is driving the activation of these genes in the valve interstitial cells. And they're coming together and activating this osteogenic transcriptional program that is driving the transdifferentiation of a valve interstitial cell from a healthy to a calcified state. We're now really working on trying to leverage and understand what's happening, how this is working. And so we've taken um, kind of a cool AI approach where we can start to model these um, um, using AlphaFold and identify how exactly these proteins are interacting. We're also developing tools to watch this in our cells uh, in live time uh, using molecules that um, can be uh, attached to our proteins of interest, our TERT and STAT5. And so we can see in a dish um, in a large format system when and where these are interacting and also then screen um, novel and, 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 and established um, biological compounds to prevent their interaction. And so that was, I've never given a short eight minute talk before, but that was a successful one. So this obviously takes a massive team to do, not only um, with the clinical side of things, but my lab. Um, this project was started by a former postdoc, Luis um, Hortels, who's, who's now a PI in Germany and really spearheaded now by Rolando Cuervas. But of course um, it takes a village and, and um, wonderful collaborations with um, HVI and, and, and my, my, my favorite surgeon, Eves. So thank you. So, so we'd love to open up things to, to questions, and and I think that thank you. That was a fantastic talk, and I think it, it certainly sort of over uh, uh, over our, is overarching with respect to all that we've been talking about here. Eves, I know you're you're very active in the field. I guess so. How does this change, or how would this potentially change the the way that you think about? surgical aortic valve replacement, TAVR replacement, if, if the longevity issues were less of a concern? I'd probably try to focus on investing in whatever company Cindy's going to be. <laughs> so we, because we'll all be out of a job. Uh, no, I, I mean, you know, the, I think this is, you know, this is exciting. I mean, this is more than exciting. Uh, the results that Cindy and her lab have demonstrated are very promising. Uh, we have seen, you know, industry work on different variety and versions of anti-calcific therapies, and, and every valve has some version of that. What we haven't seen is the kind of results that Cindy has demonstrated. Uh, you know, the next step, once this is proven, would be to then take the next step, coat valves, uh, you know, and potentially get to a druggable target. Boy, oh boy. I mean, you know, uh, as I said, you know, there'll be some empty valve clinics once that happens. And Cindy, so how, how far off, how, how long do we have to wait for that? Well, um, you know, it takes um, a village. It also takes a lot of money. So yeah. we're trying to do both right now and, and get funding to, to really push forward with this um, system to screen drugs. So, I mean, it really depends. I mean, I, I, yeah, we're working hard towards it though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So, so uh, Amber, you talked to us about a variety, the variety of valves that we have. You know, what is, you know, we, the process is clearly nuanced. We've heard that from a number of different talks. Uh, and uh, so, how do you choose? Uh, what's driving your 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 choice of valve? And especially in some areas, some of the valves we have, it's a little bit of a a data free zone. Um, and, and is there more data coming out uh, in some of the newer valves that, that might help us in the decision-making? Yeah, absolutely. 
I, I think it takes, you know, certainly an extensive conversation with the patient, understanding their age, their risk factors, the presence of coronary artery disease, what is their predicted longevity, just to better understand the, uh, the necessary longevity of a valve, um, and their uh, risk factors, as, as well as how high risk they are, um, are kind of the factors that I think we take into account. I think looking at their anatomy and their CT scan, evaluating everybody's CT scan on your own is incredibly important. I think it really brings to light a lot of things that we don't necessarily otherwise realize, like uh, heavy calcification, areas of calcification, the aortic root angulation. And I think those are all factors that we take into account. I think that as we continue to get more data on the Abbott Navator valve, as well as long-term data on the other valves, I think uh, we'll have a little bit more light shed on the long-term variability, which I think is really going to be one of the biggest factors for us moving forward. Great. Excellent. That brings me to you, Dustin. So, so the long, you said, you said we're not there yet. Um, so how do you, how do you manage your patients? You know, they're see, they're on the internet. They're seeing all these tweets. They're, they're, they come to you and they really don't want to end up with a surgical valve. They want something that's going to be, as you, as you've nicely highlighted, you know, go in, go out, you're, you're golfing the next day. Um, how do you manage those patients? How do you work with them and talk them through that whole process? Yeah, so th this is a huge challenge. Everybody comes in with a preconceived notion and the preconceived notion and preference is not for sternotomy. So it's obviously a, a big challenge for us. Um, I, w when I'm speaking with them, I try to talk about not just what we're doing now, but what are we going to have the option to do in the future? And I speak with them a bit about their CT scan result. Am I putting in a large valve? Am I not able to put in a large valve? Is it going to be a small transcatheter prosthesis? What is the likelihood based on anatomy, sinuses, valsalva, diameters, coronary heights that we'll be able to do this a second time. Um, and then I, I do clearly bring up the explant tab or registry. I think we have to at this point that we go from a low risk patient who has a mortality of less than 1% with their sternotomy. And we convert that into a patient who has a 10% risk of mortality. If something goes wrong with their transcatheter valve, uh, that, that's a scary statistic for anybody who's going to tab or somebody with a greater than 20 year life expectancy. And uh, I, I feel like an in interest of full disclosure, they need to know that as well. Uh, and then w the, the, the best tool that we have for that is a, a true collaborative or, uh, relationship with our surgeons and our cardiologists. You come to the valve clinic for discussion about what your options are. You're not just meeting a cardiologist. You're not just meeting a surgeon. You're going to meet both. And, and uh, you know, we, we truly both give our spiel and we find that it is often the case that I'm pushing for surgery and the surgeons are pushing for TAVR. So it is uh, often quite a role reversal that we see, uh, but all those factor in. And I think the, the more information we can give the patient, the better. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question from online. Considerations for patients status post average who now require a valve replacement. Um, I guess maybe I'll add consideration of patients um, who need both cabbage and APR. Yeah. That's good to read it through. Yeah. You just... okay. Can the panel comment on the considerations for patients' status post cabbage who now require aortic valve replacement? That one may be the wrong person to answer. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this is working, but. Um... You know, obviously, post cabbage, another surgery would be uh, sort of higher risk. So you're elevating the risk of another procedure. Um, I think we're kind of leaning more and more towards, you know, TAVR in this uh, in this uh, patient population. Uh, if the valves, if the uh, initial cabbage operation was of good quality, and you have, you know, multiple arterial conduits, you don't even need to worry so much about the uh, the coronaries um, uh, that much. So in fact, it makes it somewhat somewhat easier um, as far as that goes. And, uh, you know, the, conversely, if you need cabbage, obviously the surgical approach is better, right? Especially if you need a, uh, an IMA, if you need a proximal LED disease or left main disease, that's a no-brainer. Okay. Another question from the, from the chat, um, asking about studies looking at incidence or progression of calcific aortic valve stenosis and dietary intake, uh, comparing potentially different diets with vegan or ketogenic dietary uh, intake populations. Um, and whether TERT or STAT-5 is changed on those dietary intakes. Yeah, so we're the first to actually report TERT and STAT-5 interaction period. So I have not gone back and looked at anything related to dietary consumption and, and um, 
that interaction, um, I don't believe there is um, any robust studies on nutritional intake and um, calcific gertic bowel disease progression, um, but you know it does have somewhat similar risk factors to um, coronary artery disease, but um, I'm just the basic scientist, so it's, it's not involved in turtle fat five that we know of yet. I think that would involve feeding some knockout mice pizza or steak. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Catalan, and I mean the 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 work that you show with respect to treating patients with coronary disease after they've had terror is really a challenging situation. So, how as we move forward, do we train our uh, interventional cardiologists so that in the middle of the night, when they're dealing with a post tabor patient, they can they have increased the likelihood of a successful re uh, recanalization of a STEMI patient? It's it's a it's an issue of being familiar with the prostheses and 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 becoming familiar with the environment and I think you know certainly our fellows get exposed to that uh, and people become more familiar with what these prostheses look like and what what the challenges are I mean conferences like this uh, that certainly help and it's it's a relatively simple uh, set of rules that um, that you need to go by in order to achieve successful uh, successful procedure. The problem is that a lot of this, uh, the, the physicians that do the tower, like ourselves, are not necessarily the physicians that do the stems in the middle of the night in the community. So that's sort of the uh, the little gap that we need uh, we need to we need to bridge. But again, talking more about it and making uh, making people understand that this is again is not uh, really rocket science. It's relatively simple if you follow some some simple rules like we were uh, we were showing. I think it's uh, it's very achievable. Great. And of course, referral to, I mean, if it's an elective procedure that's complicated and somebody had three towers, then, then that perhaps may be worth uh, referring somewhere else. Yeah. And Derek, you talked to us about uh, aortic valve repair. And you showed some fantastic Tyrone David um, data with respect to 20 years out. And, and I, so I guess one question is, is, is that happening? Uh, can other people achieve those results? One. And then secondly, is there any way that we should think about these valves if they do fail um, with respect to repeat surgery or transcatheter um, treatments? Uh, so I guess the first thing is, is uh, you know, I, I do think that those results are achievable by others. I think that the technique is very well defined. I think, you know, um, in centers that do a lot of, a lot of, see a lot of those patients, I think the results are obviously going to be better. We know with lots of other operations, there's a very uh, clear volume and quality kind of uh, connection. Um, in regards to repeat surgery, it's going to depend a lot on the, on the, the way that they fail. If they fail with, with calcium or becoming stenotic, then, then TAVR may be, a, may be an option in there. Um, but if they fail with, uh, without, you know, with aortic regurgitation, and there's not a, a high calcium burden to hold the valve in there, then those are patients I think are going to go on to either getting a you know, bioprosthetic uh, reoperative root replacement or, or you know, in, if it's a patient that failed at a young age, then a, a mechanical root replacement. Yeah. Great. Great. And, and, and Tim, you know, you've done a fantastic job at, at setting up a, a really a multidisciplinary hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, uh, program at our institution. Um, can, can you tell us, you know, what are, what are the, the key components to that and, and um, you know, how you've been able to do that? So I think it's, you know, I think multiple folks have said it's a team effort and it really starts in the community where we're good communication with uh, PCPs and uh, local cardiologists, educating folks about the concept of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, how to recognize it, and uh, first on second line therapy, and also really you know, trying to partner with them in terms of you know, discussing when is it appropriate to trigger a uh, third line therapy or uh, septal reduction therapy. And I think uh, keeping that conversation going over years, because what we now know is that even if you have a diagnosis of HCM, your life expectancy should be normal and with a modern therapy. And I think, you know, uh, preparing for a five, 10, 20 year discussion is uh, really, you know, key to uh, good patient outcomes. Yep. Fantastic. Anything else from online, Jeff? Uh, this is from uh, uh, Dr. Andy Kaiser asks, is there a long-term advantage to adding annular stabilization to valve repair? Yeah, I think 
uh, if you look at the data that I presented, uh, you know, from the German group in 2009, they had started adding annular stabilization to um, to their uh, remodeling procedures, and they did see a, a decrease in in um, aortic regurgitation over time. Again, I think it goes back to kind of the uh, pathology. If it's a, a the initial pathology starts in the root in lots of patients who have genetic syndrome, Marfan's, things like that, then you're going to have a higher chance of that annulus dilating over time, leading to, to that mechanism of, of aortic regurgitation. I think uh, those are the patients that, that um, annular stabilization definitely benefit. Great. Yeah, I think the, the LANSAC, both the LANSAC ring and, and Hokum Schaefer's data that you show, the manual LANSAC and, and, and Hokum Schaefer's probably have the largest experience with the remodeling and stabilization. I mean, just for, for, for the whole panel, any, any, any takers, um, th th there's the, the talk of valve and valve. We, we've heard a lot of different con uh, um, comments on it, the pros and the cons, um, and, and there's, uh, it's a very nuanced approach as well with, with details with respect to the valves that are, that are possible. Can, can we talk about that in a little greater detail so our audience has a better feel for you know, what the limitations might be for that? I can take that one. Uh, I think the, the the challenge that we have when we talk about a transcatheter valve and surgical valve uh, is the same challenge we're going to have with transcatheter valve and transcatheter valve. And the first thing we, we need to establish is that the surgical bioprosthesis that goes in has to be of adequate size, and that may require a root enlargement in some of these cases if somebody has a very small root putting a 19 millimeter surgical bioprosthesis in and telling the patient that day they'll never have to have a sternotomy again because we'll simply put a transcatheter valve inside is, is just quite frankly incorrect. So I think the first thing to do is know that this is a problem of orifice. And if we put something in that leaves a small orifice behind, layering metal inside of that in the future is not going to be helpful. Um, the second consideration is, you know, we, we really do need to pay, pay attention to coronary perfusion and coronary heights. And if we're placing a bioprosthesis with the post of that valve that's going to come above the sinotubular junction. Uh, if we're using a valve that has externally mounted leaflets, we may need to do a leaflet modification strategy in the future, like a basilica, in order to have that procedure done. And we're running into that a lot with our trifecta volume. Uh, and the third component of a prosthesis is if a small prosthesis is going to go in, the ability to modify the sewing ring of that valve and fracture that sewing ring at the time of transcatheter valve replacement inside that to put in a bigger transcatheter prosthesis becomes important. So really the three things we talk about are what is the size of the valve that's going in? Is it modifiable by a bioprosthetic valve modification or a, a, a ring fracture? Uh, and what is going to be the strategy for the leaflet modification if it comes above the sinotubular junction? Function. Um, so we're, we're, we're externally mounted leaflets seen in the trifecta and in the mitra flow are much higher risk for uh, coronary obstruction for any valve and valve procedure, especially when we're dealing with uh, a narrow sinus of Valsalva or a short sinotubular junction. So there, there's clearly a lot of nuance to it. And that's where I think a, a center with very involved cardiologists and very involved surgeons, not only at the time of the initial implant, but at the time of the need for reintervention is very helpful. Great. And maybe if uh, just a quick last comment on vascular access approach to TAVR. How do you make those decisions? We're talking about an older population with accommodative vascular disease, and sometimes the standard approach is not available to you. How do you manage that? Yeah, you know, I think we've gotten, you know, and this is kudos to technology and the engineers who designed these uh, delivery systems. I think the majority of the patients are going are treated by transfemoral approach. Again, you know, I think we take a lot of pride in not having a hammer nail approach, which is, you know, you have a patient that clearly needs a transcatheter valve and transfemoral access is not appropriate or adequate. We have a very low threshold to using carotid or subclavian access. Historically, we've used subclavian access and we've presented on this multiple times and published this that despite the patients who need alternative access have worse lung disease, worse uh, kidney disease, higher STS prom they still tend to do just as well as TF patients. Take that one step further and, and move that towards a carotid axis. 
you know, we've noticed that those patients tend to go home the next day, just like transfemoral patients, because less risk of nerve injury, uh, you know, less mobility issues. So we really, you know, and, and really no increase in stroke. And mm. we don't have a large enough sample size to publish that. But again, obviously data from the TVT registry shows that carotid axis would be the preferred, uh, again, you know, secondary access to non-transfemoral. And again, I think, you know, putting five different iliac stents in and fracturing and shock waving and trying to go TF and then stenting on the way out or the way in is likely not the approach that we would recommend. I think if you've got a good partnership and understanding and skill set between the but between the interventional cardiologist and the surgeon or the heart team, you can tackle really any of these patients successfully. Great. Outstanding. You know, I'd like to thank all those viewers um, and for the, the questions that were provided, as well as the panel uh, for your excellent uh, presentations and commentary. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll break. And uh, the, I believe we have a, a live case that we'll uh, go to. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So this is incredible. A bunch of cardiologists and surgeons on time. This never happens. So uh, thank you again uh, for all your uh, thoughts and comments. So we will move on to the panel now. Um, so this is going to be interesting. Um, uh, this is a case that we had recorded probably about a couple of weeks ago. Um, just gonna hand you this. Uh, so what we'll do is, uh, you know, we have kind of the meat of the case here uh, that talks about, uh, you know, what we did. This is a transcatheter aortic valve case. Uh, Dustin has some case data to present on. And we'd love to have uh, another uh, panelist here. Who am I missing? Uh, Rick, Conrad, do you have a few minutes to join? Sure. Right, perfect. Thank you. All right, let's get started. So this is a, a live recorded case that you'll see the, the faces and voices that you'll see here. Myself, Ebes, and Stephen Broughton, our structural fellow. Uh, this is an 89-year-old male who presented to our multidisciplinary valve clinic with a history of HEFPEF proxismal atrial fibrillation, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, objective frailty, uh, clearly a high-risk patient overall, known severe aortic stenosis, followed by one of our HVI cardiologists, as well as a primary care doc within the system. Very active guy now with dyspnea on exertion, walking the stairs, uh, not able to play golf as he would like to, referred for TAVR evaluation. STS, 3.23%. His baseline creatinine is 2 He's frailty with the use of, uh, has, has objective frailty with the use of an assistive device for ambulation and has a pulmonary artery systolic pressure of 73 uh, on his echocardiogram. His echocardiogram, uh, it's real deal severe aortic stenosis, stage D disease 4.143, uh, and he's in atrial fibrillation at that time. His LVOT velocity was slightly low. If we look at his annular dimensions and measurements, uh, on the left, you see the annular perimeter, uh, and on the right, you see the annular max and min, the min being about 24, uh, and the perimeter here being about 79, 80 millimeters. His sinuses of Valsalva are quite large uh, to accommodate uh, a self-expanding valve. And you can see on the right side is access. There's a little calcification at the entry point at the right common femoral artery, uh, but the access is overall doable from an iliofemoral standpoint. Baseline EKG, uh, right bundle branch block, left anterior fascicular block, highest risk for development of a transcatheter valve-related pacemaker. So, so let's stop right there. Let's go back a slide. So, sure. so what would you quote this risk uh, of pacemaker in this particular patient? Dustin? So this let's start with a standard 89 year old. What are you going to tell that patient? So the standard 89 year old institutionally, uh, the, the, the pacemaker rate in all comers would be 8%. If somebody has a right bundle branch block, that number goes up substantially. Right bundle branch block, left anterior fascicular block. We're looking at a 50-50 coin flip for needing a pacemaker. H Hemel, uh, you're, you're on the line. What do you think? Yeah, no, I mean this is great, um, and and, and, uh, and kudos don't make to it you. Look too bad, okay. No, I never. Uh, kudos to you for presenting this case. This is like slam dunk commercial case. This is what we deal with on a daily basis. These are some of the challenges that we work through. This antecedent conduction pattern, I mean, so common in our uh, octo and nonagenarians, and so planning with our electrophysiology colleagues exactly who gets a pacemaker versus not, I think is the first question, right? Now you're coming into this case, this patient has high-risk features. How do you manage this appropriately so that your rate of conduction disturbance is less? And we'll talk about the implantation technique and whatnot that you go about uh, with this case. 
But I think like, you know, all comers coming in, the pacemaker rates have definitely fallen, obviously, as Amber referred to during her excellent talk. So like Dustin said, less than 10% risk in someone who has a normal EKG with a self-expanding valve, but we're going, we're going much higher, right? And so I would say something around the ballpark of 35% in this particular conduction pattern. And so something to be very cognizant about with our periprocedural and post-procedural management. Now, would you change strategy and say, well, maybe if I put a balloon expanding valve in, there'll be a lower pacemaker rate. Do you think that's worth it? I mean, I, I don't know if you can, I don't know if you could say that, right? So like, I mean, if we look at the TVT registry data, what it's shaping out to be is that self-expanding valves when deployed with the cusp overlap technique with the newer technology has pacemaker rates that are probably below that of balloon expandable valves in the immediate term follow-up. Now that may not be that hospitalization, but within the first 30 days, and I can tell you anecdotally at our center, We've seen a lot more late onset conduction disturbances with balloon expandable valves than we have self-expanding, particularly in this patient population. So these are the patients to handle with kid gloves. And if you're putting in a balloon expandable and you don't get any conduction disturbance off the bat, don't think you're off the hook. And so we can talk about long-term monitoring strategies. Uh, uh, great point. All I right. would totally agree with that, Hemo. And unfortunately, the, the ones that we've seen are the ones that we've discharged and have come back with syncope. This is not exactly the, you know, they're in the hospital two days later and they have this problem with balloon expandables. So, uh, so our case, uh, we, we've chosen a 29 Navitor valve based on our annular anatomy here and our case plan 29 Navitor MAC anesthesia. We've got a left radio A line and peripheral IV, right common femoral artery uh, TAVR access. We are, uh, are still. Uh, uh, using our life preservers with our two pro glide closure uh, technique, the left common femoral pigtail and temporary pacemaker catheter. We're going to predilate with a 24 millimeter Z med, and we're looking at two to four millimeters here uh, with this Navator based on right bundle left anterior fascicular block. So, Catlin, as as you look through this, you know a couple of things. Obviously, I think t tell us a little bit about your MAC versus general anesthesia experience over time. Uh, well, the, the general anesthesia, now we reserve it only for cases for alternate access where uh, we convert to general anesthesia when something happens in the case, but most commonly is, is MAC. It's essentially 90% MAC nowadays. Um, these patients, you know, they're elderly. They, they don't do well with general anesthesia. Or they do, you know, better with, with MAC than with general anesthesia. I mean, we've seen this. We've heard this from uh, from Europe about doing this with conscious sedation, which um, sometimes is a little rough for this patient. So I think Mac is is providing the uh, the sweet spot for uh, for this procedure. Yeah. Now, obviously, you know this patient had a left femoral diagnostic uh, pigtail catheter, right? So Amber and Conrad, I mean, do you think worthwhile just going radial for your for for diagnostic purposes? Obviously, as folks have moved away from cerebral protection. Uh, it's not unreasonable, but I think, um, you know, isolating the non-coronary cusp with a pigtail can sometimes be challenging going from radial. Uh, so typically we still kind of default to going through the femoral and we haven't really seen significant adverse uh, vascular complications from doing that. Hema, what have you been doing? Uh, I assume your cerebral protection rate has gone down or you? Yeah, tremendously. I mean, we only use it really for basilica cases now. Uh, so I will say that, you know, in general, like Amber said, it's, it's a left femoral access for a pig. We've developed a lot of efficiency surrounding that. Obviously, the patient can then recover down in the post cath lab recovery area, get their sheath pulled there, uh, that sort of thing. So I, I think the efficiency works out just fine. Great. The, yeah. Slides here at this point and just put the main screen case there, if you would. Yeah, James, if you can do that, please. All right. Dustin, you want to walk through the rest of the case and I'll pause. For some comments. Yeah, sure. So we we've put a we put a 12 French sheath in uh, on the right side after putting our per closes in and setting those aside. So that's prepped and ready for us to go. Uh, we've we're putting our temporary pacemaker up now. Uh, we're, we're still using uh, balloon tip temporary pacemaker catheters from the groin. We've not had uh, the elevated perforation rate that has been described in the literature for some of these uh, happen locally. So we've gotten away from that. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you see fluoroscopically, we've got uh, a pigtail catheter that comes from that left femoral sheath up into the non-coronary cusp. So I'll, I'll, let me stop you right there. So some operators may argue, particularly from Europe, well, you know, this patient's high risk, we'll need a pacemaker. You might as well put a right IG or not do anything at all. And then some folks talk about deploying these without pacing. What do you guys think? worth it not worth it i think from a you know self-expanding valve 
uh, perspective in particular, the, the pacing off the wire doesn't help us much here because we're not really using the wire. And often, as you'll see when we deploy this valve, the wire's not even in the ventricle during deployment. Uh, we do think there's very little downside to rapid pacing these patients from a hemodynamic perspective and the valve stability that's added is certainly helpful um, so that we, we, we still do this. Uh, Hemel, what do you think? Anything's changed in that category for you? We, we LV wire pace, obviously the vast majority of our patients, in this case, we probably LV wire pace. I think it's personal preference, but to Dustin's point, I don't think there's a downside in rapid pacing most of these individuals and to the point of valve stability while you're deploying, I think it's absolutely beneficial. So I'd recommend rapid pacing the majority of these patients. Justin, walk us through what we're doing here. The first point that I would make here uh, with this platform in particular, we, we, we really, with earlier generation self-expanding devices, which are gonna give us better hemodynamic performance, had a lot of trouble with horizontal root anatomy. It was quite a challenging implant. So when we see these patients with horizontal root anatomy, as exemplified by where that pigtail is, we, we worry a little. Uh, this is just a five French AL1 catheter and an 035 straight wire, and we're uh, trial and error uh, crossing the wire across the ventricle. Trial and error, I thought it was very precise. Uh, it's not, not quite precise. Uh, the, the other interesting thing that you notice here, and I wanna point this out because I'm, I'm seeing it now, and I remember this case specifically. Uh, one of the things that you see here here. So this is a patient with pulmonary hypertension who's got a bit of a dilated right ventricle. And if you watch his hemodynamics in the bottom left of the screen, you start to see that his STs are, are not normal here. Um, even in the presence of a bundle, there may be some, some uptrending STs and ST elevations that we're looking at. And I'm not sure that I noticed this at the time of. Uh, the other thing you're seeing is we've got a wire in the ventricle and we've got a lot of, uh, of non-sustained ventricular ectopy here, obviously, in our, our a aortic pressure line has taken a hit because of that. And the, the reason we really wanted to show this in, in, in full disclosure is we, we want to show what happens in the operating room with these cases. We also want to show what we get away with in the operating room with these cases. So, you know, somebody that we would be really worried about rapid pacing at the same time, we've got, you know, significant non-sustained ventricular tachyarrhythmia here and we've had no problem. So we've now exchanged for a stiff wire in the ventricle. And as that's done with all self-expanding valves, we perform a pre-deployment balloon valvuloplasty. This is to allow our self-expanding valve to go in and have a, an easier ability of expanding and contacting the annulus. So under rapid pacing, as you can see on the hemodynamic tracing, we're trying to eliminate the pulsatility, and then we perform pre-deployment valvuloplasty here. Amber, Catlin, uh, Hamill, Conrad, what do you guys think? BAV for all these patients, self-expanding? I think you have to. You have to. Yeah, this, is a, this is a very decent calcium burden. You are really aiming for a very precise level of depth here. Um, you, you tend not to want to post-dilate for a couple of different reasons, but I think the most important one here is you don't know how much foreshortening you're going to get on that valve frame if you don't pre-dilate and fairly aggressively. Obviously, our practices use non-compliant balloon. You guys are using a Z-Med. Regardless, pre-dilation, absolutely key. Um, to really get that depth that you want on that implant. Then don't pay attention to the wire, Hamill. So Hamill, I, 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 I told you I'm not going to say anything bad <laughs> at all. Question for you. So how do you size your balloon? We go usually by minimal yeah. depth. Are you getting more aggressive with that now? or? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so so Catalina, you know, we're, we're going mean for most of our patients. Now you got a little bit of a chunk of protruding calcium here. And so maybe I'd be more inclined to min, min plus one on this one. Uh, but I think the vast majority of our cases, we're doing mean uh, annulus versus LVOT, whatever's the lesser of the two. That's the true balloon size that we're going to pick. And uh, we, we've obviously had some good success with that approach. And is it, is it more aggressive with the uh, portic or the Navitor than the Evolute, do you think? Or do you think you need I, to be more aggressive with the Navitor? Simple man. So basically, I just I try to, you know, broad brushstrokes paint my pre dilation strategy for all self expanding platforms. And so I haven't noticed a difference. If anything, the benefit that I've noticed with Navitor is just that annular stabilization because the radial force is really distributed very well all up the length of the valve frame and the cylindrical shape versus the flaring out of the Evolute. So I've noticed a lot more stability on tab release as a result of the Navitor, but honestly, has not changed my pre dilation practice. And for those watching, obviously we're rapid pacing uh, as, as we do this, hence you see a flat line uh, on there. So The other point that I wanna make here, if you look at the top left-hand screen at our hands, uh, light gloves is me, dark gloves is Ebes. 
the, the patients and the primary care docs often say, well, who actually does this thing? And I want you, I, I just want to demonstrate that there are two integral sets of hands on this thing. One, one positioning from a depth perspective and one actually deploying the valve. And that, that's a common question that we get. So that's the only reason I bring that up. The gloves are supposed to match my olive tan skin. So. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about the deployment mechanism for this, uh, Justin. The, the advantages. system with the Navator valve, and what we're doing here is we have the pigtail in that non-coronary cusp. We're injecting contrast to get us to the right level, and then you can see the dot on the delivery catheter, which we're trying to pull back and position uh, directly at the nadir of the sinus and the nadir of that pigtail. Um, we go to about 80% by turning that wheel that you see in the top left-hand side of the screen. There's a hard lock out there, and we do this again under rapid pacing with low aortic pressures. Once we reach that hard lockout, we will wean the pacemaker. We will not just turn it off. A lot of these patients with uh, right bundle branch block will have conduction delay when we stop pacing and we may need to, to temporarily pace them. So we will wean that pacemaker. Um, and then we will take a look at our valve and we'll take a picture here in this view, which is our traditional cusp overlap view. We'll take a view in the uh, LAO projection to see where we are. So we've taken our cusp overlap view. We're going to scroll over to the LAO view here. We're looking for the non coronary leaflet of the valve and, or, and position the frame relative to that. And then as we scroll over to the left, we want to see where the position is on the left uh, sinus, we want to make sure that we have annular contact there, and we want to make sure that we're one to two millimeters below that, ideally. So what do you think, Catlin? Um, before I answer that, uh, are we broadcasting this or are we seeing him as uh, live? No, this is being broadcast, right, James? Everything's being broadcast. This is, yeah. All right, sorry. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, this, is, this is a technique that, um, the, you know, cusp overlap technique with some modifications um, that, that Hamill has been instrumental in, in, um, in developing. And the concept here is that um, when you come with the self-expanding valves, the uh, non-coronary cusp is the lowest point. So if you secure that point, almost 100% of the time, you're going to be, be below the valve everywhere else. And the second thing is that um, the, the higher you are, the less likely you are to have a conduction problem. And that's why we were talking about, you know, um, avoiding uh, conduction issues with this, with this technique. Uh, it's slightly different for the Navitor valve. I think this valve um, rotates differently upon deployment than the, um, the Evolute valve in my experience. And this is why we kind of had to adjust a little bit of the technique and make sure that we're sitting below the left cusp as well. Hence the uh, the additional view that um, that we we take, um, but it's has been it's been working well, and I think it's becoming sort of the standard way of uh, of implanting this uh, this valve nowadays. Uh, Amber, what did you think of that first initial placement? Like it? Hate it? I think that um, you know it's useful to wean the pacemaker to figure out. We already knew that we had a high rate of pacemaker risk going into this case with the baseline um, conduction abnormalities. It's helpful to kind of wean the pacemaker, see where we are from a conduction standpoint. I think it's possible to um, implant the valve at a little higher depth, um, but certainly not. Yeah, I, I think you're being too kind. I think <laughs> Hemel is nodding vigorously there. So, uh, so we knew that he was watching and he's going to be commenting on this. So we decided to recapture and redeploy here, right? So what do we think of this, Hemel? Very nice. Uh, no, I mean, and, and, and this is done, you know, just expertly rightly so the great thing about this view and the great thing about the the nature of the self-expanding platform the recapturability is the fact that you can adjust like this and it's a beautiful example of that and so to catalan's point you definitely want to make sure that you caught the left cusp uh, we have noticed that with navitor as well uh, the valve does release a little bit different uh it does tend to stabilize a little bit more in the annular plane and not shift as much because the radial force isn't as centralized down there in the annular plane. And so really catching the left cusp is really the shallowest that you need to be, right? Or can be. Um, but other than that, on the non-side, you're free to do whatever you'd like. And so with the sub-millimeter precision in the cusp overlap technique, lifting this thing up a few millimeters is to your advantage for a couple of different reasons. The conduction disturbance issue, which we've mentioned, but also the fact that hemodynamics tend to improve with this platform the higher you implant it. At least anecdotally, that's been our experience. But what do you think, Eves? I mean, have you noticed that, the higher implantations with this valve? Yeah, you know, honestly, we've been so pleased with the hemodynamics and Amber showed you some of the data we presented at TVT last year and CRT this year, uh, which is, you know, it doesn't matter how we, where we, I mean, perhaps it does. I think 
there's probably more arguments to make about durability and the way the valves function, perhaps preventing halt and ham with appropriate deployment uh, than the hemodynamics. But I, I agree with you. I mean, I think you catch on to a good spot. I think if you're high and, and nice, it does make a difference. The advantage is, again, this is an intraannular valve, right? So you're not, you know, being at one or two doesn't mean you're much higher than that. You're really in the annual plane, which I think makes a huge difference here. We saw this with Optimize Pro as well, which, which Amber kind of reflected on. And with these higher implants, with a self-expanding valve with an external wrap, we've seen, I would say some people would call it paradoxically less paravalvular regurgitation. That's because of that wrap's ability to really interdigitate with the leaflet anatomy, you know, versus leaving it down in the LVOT. And so with Navator, I think we're going to find the same thing, that these higher implants are going to lead to less conduction disturbance rates, um, probably better hemodynamics, less rates of halt ham, and then obviously less PVL as well. For sure. Conrad, what do you think of that positioning? Happy, would you post dill, leave it alone? Perfect. Good. Amber? It looks great. I actually have a question for Hemel. So when you're pacing out the wire, um, typically when we're happy with the 80% mark, we pull the wire back into the into the uh, device platform and we have a traditionally a pacemaker in place. How are you guys doing that um, from your standpoint in terms of pacing if if you are pacing out the wire? Yeah, we just go slow. So that's a good point, Amber. So, I mean, if we if we notice a conduction disturbance at that point, we can always put the wire back so that there's some LV contact and, and pace accordingly. As long as you don't have the delivery catheter pulled back too far, that'll insulate just fine and conduct just fine. But our tab release um, or paddle release is done with the wire pulled back and it's just slow and deliberate over about 30 second period of time. This is Dustin. You want to wrap up with closure? Yeah, sure. The the you know we we briefly went over the hemodynamics there, but there's essentially you know mi minimal gradient on this valve, single digit gradient as we see on the self expanding valves. And this is us with closure on the left side. So we we basically are cinching down our percloses with the J wire in place in case there's a rescue uh, necessary and we need to go with something else. So we'll pull those. We'll pull our twelve French sheath. We'll pull out our wire here, uh, and then this is just immediate hemostasis in the OR. We're still fully anticoagulated at this. point point. Uh, we do tend to give a low dose of protamine at this point, uh, usually 25 or 50 milligrams. And, and we're trying to reverse to, you know, a, a, an ACT of less than 150, 160. If we have no bleeding and it's 180, we leave it alone. Uh, we'll remove our suture material here. Uh, and this guy will be up and ambulating later on in the afternoon. You can see it has quite a, a deep access there as I'm uh, going down and cutting these knots, which is uh, not a, a concern with you know, modern devices and these closure techniques, we've gotten pretty savvy with this. Uh, on the left-hand side, we'll pull the vein out and, and hold manual pressure. And on the right side, we will um, uh, just use a closure device traditionally for the small arterial access site. The other point about the case that was interesting that we sort of glossed over, but I mentioned the STs earlier, uh, you know, we, we put the Navator valve in, we felt the STs were still elevated and in, you know, 30 seconds, we're able to easily engage the coronary in this case with a JR4 and show that the right coronary is widely patent. And we do see these ST changes in the setting of patients with pulmonary hypertension and bundles and RV dysfunction from time to time. And that was our conclusion here, but it was nice to have a valve that was very easy to, to navigate through and see a coronary uh, on our way out. It made us feel a lot better before we got to the PACU and saw the post-op EKG with, you know, ST change. Changes. Uh, conduction was intact here, as you saw, based on valve positioning. So we were satisfied with that. Great. Uh, I think just to sum up, uh, Catelyn, you want to just share with us where you think this valve tends to shine and the advantages over the other commercially available platforms? Yeah, so uh, certainly the hemodynamics are superior to the, uh, to the balloon expanding valve based on our experience um, and based on what we see already, um, you know, um, everywhere else. Um, and as far as relative to the other self-expanding platform that we have, um, the coronary access is, is markedly better with this, right? I mean, the cell size in this valve are significantly larger. In fact, if you put a portico inside a portico and a misalign them 180 degrees, so perfect misalignment, the cell sizes are, are still larger than, a, than an Evolute. So you can put two of this one inside of the other and achieve the same thing. Um, uh, the, uh, the other thing is the deliverability is perhaps more deliverable. I mean, it's a, it's a newer, latest generation, later generation um, a delivery platform. Uh, and one thing I'm looking forward is to sort out the commercial alignment, which remains a bit of a problem. I think the, uh, the company is, is working at ways of doing this. I mean, I really think that's going to be important, especially as we're moving into a younger patient population and, um, and, and doing this in, in low risk and moderate risk patients in the, uh, in the trial. So. Great. Hemel, anything to add to that? 
No, I think uh, all the comments are dead on. And, and I think the commissioner alignment piece is something that just needs to be figured out with this valve. One valve that we did not talk about really is the accurate uh, accurate valve, Boston Scientific uh, valve that just it just completed its accurate IDE study. So more data with regards to that and just a whole nother discussion with regards to valve therapies once that comes into the market. Great. Wonderful. We'll wrap up there. We'll just take a two minute break and we will be back on. Thank you so much. Eves, just let me know when the hall's ready to get started. James, are we good? All right. Uh, well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good, quick uh, bio break. Our next sessions on mitral and tricuspid valve disease and uh, and a little bit of potpourri. Uh, Hemel Gada will be moderating the next session. Uh, if you practice interventional cardiology in the uh, in North America or really anywhere in the world, you know who Hemel Gada is. He has had a tremendous amount of contribution in the structure heart and transcatheter heart valve space. Uh, thank you, Hemel, uh, for joining us virtually, and I will hand it over to you. Eve, such a kind introduction. It's a it's a distinct honor to to really join. Apologies for not being here personally. Had some personal kid obligations to take care of this weekend, so it uh, it, it it couldn't allow me to to get to Pittsburgh. But I'm really hopeful that next year I'll definitely be able to join. So I'd like to turn it over to Conrad Smith, uh, who needs no introduction. Uh, his experience in this space is unparalleled, uh, and he's going to get us started with transcatheter mitral edge to edge repair in low risk patients. What are the global posts, Conrad? Great, thanks, Hemel. Uh, if I could have a first slide. Great. So uh, the, my task is to talk to you about uh, tier for primary mitral regurgitation versus surgical repair. What are the goalposts? So a little bit of context, you know, mitral clip has been uh, used for primary mitral regurgitation and has been, this is the 10 year anniversary of its FDA approval. And with that, since that time, you know, there's been a, over 150,000 of these implants worldwide. Um, there've been generational changes in the device. And like TAVR, the evolution and the safety and the efficacy of the device in this setting has really taken off. So much so that we are now thinking about extending the indications of use of this valve um, to lower risk patient populations. So what do, what do we need to be able to do that? What are the safety, efficacy, and durability targets that will establish this as a, a reasonable alternative to surgical mitral valve repair? And are these targets within reach? And then if not, if we don't have that data now, what additional pieces of data are needed to make that a reality. 
So this all goes back to two, the 2011 when Ted Feldman and the group, um, the Everest Two group, published this uh, landmark paper uh, looking at uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair with a mitre clip versus surgery. These are all surgical patients, 279 patients, randomized two to one, um, the clip to the valve, and the, with a, an endpoint of being 12 month freedom from death, mitral valve surgery, or recurrent three plus mitra, three plus or more mitral regurgitation. And, and no, no question about it, surgery won hands down with respect to that primary endpoint. Um, there was there was a significant reduction in that. It really was driven by the the need for repeat surgery. But more than twenty percent of the patients that had the clip performed um, ultimately needed to have a, a surgical repair moving forward. Um, Interestingly, at six at one year, there was no difference in the mortality between the two groups, six percent in each group. Um, but but clearly, the 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 valve uh, the 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 clip did not perform as well as the surgery. Um, in fact, you know, twenty three percent of the patients um, had severe mitral regurgitation at the leaving leaving the hospital. Ten ten of those forty patients, it turns out to be, um, didn't even have a clip placed. So so things that needed to be needed to happen with the valve for it to improve in its its therapy. Um, the the one thing that came, one of the interesting things that came from the trial was that we saw that the clip was safe and it did reduce the regurgitation in a significant percentage of the patients. So it was clear that in a group of patients who were not surgical candidates, this was an alternative. And clearly we know that as, as mitral regurgitation is increases with patients increasing age, and there are a large group of patients did that were not qualified for surgery, um, they were, there was a clear unmet need and this was able to fill in part that need. So as we move forward, there has been there have been changes over this last decade with respect to the trike, the the mitra clip itself. You know, really four generational changes. Um, initially, we were we had just the the um, the classic clip, which um, did not even the grippers did not even come down fully to come into contact with the arms. As we moved forward, they were they fixed that. They gave us larger clip sizes. Um, they allowed us to open up one arm versus the other to really allow us to quite precisely in in, in a very nuanced fashion, um, treat more um, severe and complex uh, types of disease outside of the range that we saw with the, the transcatheter edge to edge um, that was done in Everest, which was, as you can see here, really based on the A2P2 portion. But we've gone well beyond that. We see now the, the A3P3 we can do. Um, we can even do uh, multiple clips in different fashions and with, with interesting results. We so uh, moving forward, how has we've we've seen the generations have changed? How has this generational change affected our ability to get good results with the clip? Well, the expand registry was a group was a a prospective multi-center registry that has echo core lab adjudication of all of the echoes. So really a high quality um, enrollment of patients. And this was just published uh, recently this year by Cybel Carr and, and the Expand group, where they looked at over a thousand patients that had that had uh, primary and functional mitral regurgitation that were included with, this is the third generation of the clip that was reported in this data. And what they found was that in this highly, uh, highly, uh, uh, this high risk group of patients with STS is a 5.5 mean age of almost 80 years of age, um, that there was a significant improvement in the reduction of mitral regurgitation. When we look back at what we saw with the, the Everest trial, you see now that, uh, that, that less than two plus mitral regurgitation, which we feel is our gold standard was up to 96% as opposed to the 80% that we saw with Everest. And that, that was durable out to one year where 93% of the patients um, had that same reduction. And another interesting piece is that when we look at the more uh, more rigorous criteria, looking at less than one plus, less than or equal to one plus mild mitral regurgitation, we see that 80% of those patients, over 80% of those patients up to one year um, were able to achieve that result. And, and data has shown that one plus versus two plus, there is a, a little bit of a signal that that's going to give you um, somewhat greater durability. Um, with this, we saw fairly low rate, rates of mortality at 12.5% in this group of patients. And again, it's a very old group of 
group of patients, and we've seen a decrease in heart failure hospitalization as well. So again, going back and looking at Everest versus the expand primary uh, mitral regurgitation registry, and this is just those patients in the primary MR um, for the uh, expand registry, we see again those very high rates of success with respect to um, the, the achievement of that those low rates of mitral regurgitation. But, and we see how that translates to a fall in the likelihood of mortality at one year. On the right side, you see the Everest um, data at 24%, uh, 24 um, the all-cause mortality. Um, when we look at the TBT registry that was published in 2017 with Paul Sarajah, um, that, that is very high, uh, you know, looked at our, our earlier experience um, with the primary MR patients, that was about 25%, again, high-risk patients, um, all, all non-surgical cancer. Candidates and that same group of patients, looking at them now with the expand registry, it's been really nearly cut in half that late mortality. So, the the experience with the the clip as well as the generational changes in the device have led to significant improvements. Now, that's not all that's happened. Again, this was just the the third generation of the CLIP. We know that there's a fourth generation of the CLIP, which has further enhanced our ability to treat these patients. We see that there's been an inter interval uptick in the success that we have in decreasing the mitral regurgitation. Here you see the expand G4 registry, again, that last iteration um, where we have wider CLIPs, both small and short, uh, and small and long CLIPs with independent gripper arms. And with this, we've been able to, to, to inch up that now that very um, very challenging, less than or equal to one plus mitral regurgitation, up to almost ninety percent in, in the patients at, at thirty days. Uh, and compare that to the expand registry, and that's, that's a, again a significant uptick in that, that group of patients. So with this, and this was re reported in uh, last fall in TCT, we've seen further improvement of the patients' outcomes, and this looks at their thirty day mortality. You see, it's down to very extreme low rates of 1.3%. Again, these are all patients that were deemed high risk for surgery with STSs in the, the four to five range. So clearly a dramatic improvement over the last 10 years with respect to what we're able to do with the, the device. Now, we, how are we doing on the surgical side? Well, the surgeons do a fantastic job. We have great surgeons that are, that are speaking in the audience today. And we find that the mortality that is associated with surgery, and this is from a paper that looked at the STS registry by the name Badwar, they found more 30 day mortality for surgery shows just 1.1% um, mortality, uh, which is which is really extraordinary. The surgeons, they are to be applauded for the, the work that they're able to do with this. Now, they they looked at morbidity mortality, which is 8.8% of those with, with the uh, components that you see here. Um, and there was a small conversion to mitral valve re replacement, um, but but very small. And overall, just really um, qu quite a high bar has been set with respect to what we're what we need to do from a transcatheter standpoint. What we know, though, is that from this is that it was the data is limited in the sense that the STS registry didn't really give us an idea um, from uh, the STS risk of these patients compared to all the patients that I've shown you from the trans the transcatheter side have necessarily been high risk patients given the the uh, FDA approval for this group of patients with primary mitral regurgitation. There's not really echocardiographic follow up, meaning a finding uh, the the severity of the mitral regurgitation after the surgery and the, and the late follow up along those lines, um, and then the functional, uh, functional capacity and quality of life data is not there. It is in, in registries that we're doing for our transcatheters and as a requirement of uh, having the availability to do that. And then the, looking at the other interesting and important component, that intermediate, uh, the one-year mortality. Um, the, the, T, the STS ACC TBT registry does require all those components. And this is from Mike Mack in late, late 2022, uh, 2021, excuse me, where we see that, you know, the median length uh, of uh, hospital stay was, was just, was down from three days to just one day after a tier procedure. Mortality continues to fall down to 4.6% at 30 days in 2019. And then we saw the, the uh, functional class of those patients. These are very sick patients with 82% of them have been class three or four New York Heart Association um, uh, 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 functional status. Afterwards, you know, clearly 80% of them were class one or two. So a dramatic uh, uh, turnaround in their functional capacity that we are tracking. 
and then the echocardiogram data that, uh, that I've shown you with the, respect to the success of the reduction of the MR and without the, a significant increase in the mitral valve gradient. On the right, you see just how things have really taken off with over 10,000 um, tier procedures being done in 2019. Now, looking specifically at the primary mitral regurgitation patients, this was data just out of the ACC, which I think is fantastic by Raj Makar and his group at Cedar sinai And they looked at the a subgroup of these patients, the PMR patients from the STS registry, 19,000 patients. They found that they looked at the primary success as they defined it of less than two plus or less than or equal to two plus MR and a gradient of less than 10 millimeters of mercury. And they their, their endpoint was in hospital, uh, 30 day and one year death, heart failure, hospitalization or mitral valve re reintervention. Uh, again, older group of patient over 80, STS again, higher four and a half percent and then uh, including patients, 10% of whom were on home oxygen and had had heart failure hospitalization within uh, the, the the two two weeks prior, 77%. So clearly a sick group of patients, but look at these mortality rates at 30 days and you see just 2.66%, well below the STS um, prediction for them. Um, the reintervention rates ex exceedingly low, heart failure um, rates are low as well, uh, as well as all potential, all other um, stroke uh, need for dialysis, all in the 1.5% range or less. What we know about the success rates that have occurred have improved over time from 2014 to 2022. We see that really over 90% success rate is defined um, by this study. Uh, we found that at post-discharge, the MR severity was, exceed, was less than two plus in over 95% of the patients as well as that was durable out to 30 days. And even that very low mild mitral regurgitation um, was uh, fairly durable in two thirds of the patients at 30 days. And what does that, how does that translate? They did something really nice in this study. They sort of looked looked at the ability to achieve that less than two plus mitral regurgitation and the ability to achieve less than, than 10 millimeters of mercury gradient and less than five millimeters of mercury gradient, the mean gradient across the mitral valve. And they looked at how that affected the patient's outcomes from a heart failure standpoint at one year, intermediate results and death at one year. And you can see there's a, there's a, a clear gradient. So that if we're able to achieve mild mitral regurgitation and with a low gradient, the likelihood of a heart failure readmission, heart failure readmission at one year is only 6.2% and mortality Again, a high-risk group of patients down to 11.4%. So I think good intermediate data. And I think what this says is that we're, we are on our way to being able to, 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 to challenge some of these less severe risk, uh, surgical risk patients. Now, it's not head-to-head -head data. These are different groups of patients. So what, this, what do we need? We need head-to-head -head data. And those things are happening. These are two trials that are currently ongoing. We see the repair MR trial that's, that, that we are happy to be a part of. 500 patients one-to-one -one with mitral clip versus surgery and uh, with uh, the intermediate risk being defined as age greater than 75 or STS risk of greater than 2% or increased surgical risk is determined by the surgeon. Um, looking at just severe degenerative mitral regurgitation um, and the ability to be clip or with surgery, get that down to that one plus. Um, the the uh, the, this is a non-inferiority trial looking for equivalence or near equivalence between the two groups. Um, and it will, we'll look at this uh, very carefully as we, we continue to enroll. The second trial, which is the primary trial, is a, is a little bit different in the sense that it's looking at very young patients, patients that are greater than the age of 65. It's looking at three risk categories, mild, uh, intermediate, low, intermediate, and high risk groups of patients. And they are going to look at all-cause mortality, valve reintervention, hospitalizations, um, and, and stratify them by the risk category that the patients are in. So these two trials we're look, we'll continue to follow them very closely. It's going to give us the information that we need to determine if and when um, the, the CLIP is really able to safely be used, considered in the, those more intermediate groups of patients. So in closing, I'll just say that, you know, severe primary mitral regurgitation is associated with poor clinical outcomes if it's untreated. Um, that surgery does remain the, the standard of care. And for good reason, we saw those excellent surgical results that were out there. Uh, but as tier improves, there may it may become an alternative to lower in, even in lower surgical risk patients. 
the data we have seen uh, suggests that uh, we're we're making progress. Um, ongoing clinical trials will help give us more definitive answers. But keeping in mind the residual MR uh, that you're left with, the the mitral valve grading and the durability of that residual MR are going to really define how these patients do, and it's going to be reflected in their 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 uh, longevity, uh, their functional capacity, and their quality of life. Um, so with that, I'll close. Thank you. Thanks, Conrad. Amazing, comprehensive talk. Um, just for the remainder of the speakers, try to let's try to keep it in a ten minute window. I want I want to engage Conrad and the rest of you in discussion afterwards with some provocative uh, questions. So why don't we move on to Jeff Fowler? Uh, thinking beyond the clip, the role of transcatheter mitral valve replacement. All right. Thanks, Hamel. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so we just heard a lot of uh, really good data about um, the the success of tier and even looking at um, you know, looking at patients who are lower risk uh, and comparing it to the surgical outcomes. But what we didn't hear is that there are challenges to tier and some of the anatomical complexity of the mitral valve um, do make it challenging to place tier. And some patients aren't candidates for tier. And so with that, there's hope that a transcatheter mitral valve replacement may actually be able to treat a larger group of patients that have that increased surgical risk, um, but aren't candidates for tier. Um, of course, there are challenges with TMVR as well, and so we're going to talk about that and see sort of where, where we're left here at the state of things at this current time. So the challenges with um, TIER really go down to um, the complex mitral anatomy. Of course, we know there is a heterogeneous etiology um, of MR. We saw a lot of data about primary MR. There's uh, also good data to, um, for TIER in degenerative uh, functional MR as well. Uh, excuse me, functional MR, um, but the anatomy it can limit our ability to use tier. So if you have patients who have small annulus or high resting gradients or mixed disease with mitral stenosis as well, placing a mitral clip on that valve becomes much more difficult at getting that great result with low mean gradients. Um, other anatomical features like thickened leaflets, the cordae, calcified leaflets with concomitant MAC, multiple jets or clefts, large coaptation gaps. And even though we're getting much, much better at this, um, sometimes visualization during the procedure can limit our ability to get, you know, sort of those great results that we're looking for. And so there's really hope that TMVR or a trans transcatheter valve replacement um, can overcome some of those challenges. And so what we'd really like to see is a device that was it can be agnostic to MR etiology and will perform in real world anatomy, including those patients with MAC, small annular sizes, and mixed disease. And ideally in the, the least invasive method possible, which is likely going to be a transeptal delivery system. So the mitral trans, uh, transcatheter mitral landscape right now has just exploded. This is a slide from TCT just showing all of the different devices that are under um, investigation at this time with multiple different um, uh, methods using both edge-to-edge -edge repair, direct and indirect annuloplasty, um, a, a whole host of mitral valve replacement devices, as well as looking at the subvalvular apparatus as well. And so there's a lot of devices under investigation, and there's challenges with these devices. Um, and so we, we need to find a device that um, can adapt. It's designed to fit a multitude of these anatomical variations. Uh, we've talked about small annular sizes with MAC, but the, the annular size is quite large in the mitral space and anchoring these devices appropriately um, while minimizing paravalvular leak and getting adequate seal is important. And so you can see in that top uh, graphic there, there's been multiple different methods from tabs to paddles to apical tethers to try to both anchor and seal these devices appropriately. And these large devices have to be packaged in small catheters in order to be um, delivered in the least uh, invasive way possible to help um, these high-risk patients who aren't surgical candidates. When we look at um, further anatomical challenges, um, LVOT obstruction or the, the so-called neo-LVOT that's created once the device is in place is another um, you know, large consideration here. There are different um, anatomical features that make this uh, more challenging, including the anterior mitral valve leaflet length, um, asymmetrical septal hypertrophy bulging into that LVOT diameter. The aorta mitral angle, angle plays a, a large role in the size of the LVOT afterwards. 
as well as de device related co concerns, um, including device protrusion or flaring that's necessary. And so we've gotten um, really good using our structural CTs to um, overlay a uh, so-called virtual valve in there and look at how uh, an individual patient's anatomy will in be impacted by um, the device that we're implanting there and try to gauge what would be the complications that we may see or whether there is adequate space um, for, for one of these devices. Um, there are several different devices that are currently under clinical trial, and it's a really exciting time right now. Um, and my point in putting this uh, slide up is just to show you the, the different variations that are out there as far as um, the valve um, design and it's, uh, you know, the, those features trying to anchor and seal and, um, you know, provide adequate um, uh, solutions for multiple different anatomies. And under randomized clinical trial, um, there are pretty strict inclusion and exclusion criteria for each of these different patients. And so we do see right now that we're having um, a little bit of uh, some challenges getting these patients into these clinical trials to evaluate them with relatively high uh, screen failure rates that are predominantly related to anatomical variations and just, you know, looking at how these devices perform in each one um, does become a little bit more of a challenge. But I think, you know, despite these challenges in the design and engineering, the deliverability, the wide scale applicability to different anatomical variations. There's a lot of patients that real stand, really stand to benefit from a good TMVR solution, one where they're too high of a surgical risk and they don't have um, a great tier option. Having a transcatheter mitral valve replacement is going to be an important part of this. And so we're excited about um, you know, trying out these different devices in the clinical trials, seeing how patients do. And what we're seeing in sort of the early feasibility and pilot studies is that these devices perform really well. So this is um, data on five different devices showing um, their re residual mitral regurgitation. And you see good durable results, um, you know, sort of Conrad was describing that um, residual MR of less than one plus or one plus or less. Um, and all these devices um, show that significant improvement with durability, um, some of the top data there out to two years even. So let's finish with a case. Um, this is a 76-year-old male who has ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EF of 30% and severe functional MR. He's fully revascularized on good medical and device therapy and yet has persistent NYH, a functional class two to three symptoms. He's high risk for surgical valve replacement and his anatomy is an amenable for TMVR. And so he was enrolled at our institution in the Summit Randomized Control Trial with the Abbott Tendine TMVR approach. So the Abbott Tendine is a transapical um, device that is a repositional and retrievable valve that's composed of two self-expanding night in all frames and a porcine pericardial valve inside. You can see on the animation that's playing, the transapical sheath is uh, advanced across the mitral valve. The valve is unfurled, repositioned um, under echo guidance in the appropriate position. And then there's an apical tether you can see in the top uh, picture there with a apical pad to help both anchor and seal this device. And so this is sort of the intraprocedural imaging that we have of our patient here. You can see in the top panel, the severe functional MR. On the bottom panels, we see the uh, delivery sheath advanced across the mitral valve. And on the far right bottom panel, you can see the, the device is being unfurled in the annulus there. Um, as we move to these beautiful 3D images taken by our, our excellent uh, cardiac imagers, which you're going to hear from a little later, we can see the device protruded out of the sheath. Um, once it is um, partially deployed, we can recapture, reposition this and place it in the uh, appropriate place. And then the final pictures here show just a, a, a great um, result of a valve that's working well with no residual MR. Um, the, uh, the valve is anchored at the apex and then the lateral thoracotomy incision is closed. This patient did um, excellent. Um, he had no paravalvular leak, no MR, and a mean gradient of two on implant. He was discharged home within just a couple of days. And his one-year follow-up, he had um, no heart failure admissions, persistent uh, functional class one and two symptoms with no MR, no paravalvular leak, and low gradients. And so I think, um, you know, what I'm trying to say in these 10 minutes is that despite the many challenges of TMVR, um, there are a lot of ongoing trials with different designs and different devices that we're trying. There is device iteration advancement that's happening. 
and even interventional techniques and tools that's going to help um, to place these devices in these challenging anatomy. And so I think what we're going to be end, end up with at the end of the day is really a mitral valve toolbox where we're not going to have one device that's going to treat all different uh, disease types, but we're going to be able to continue to use tier and different, uh, maybe multiple TMVR devices to find a good solution for all of our patients. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jeff. A great, great talk on, on the replacement technologies that are kind of perpetually in the offing uh, with clinical trial development. And we're very fortunate at UPMC to have access to a number of these different clinical trials. But an important patient population, or when we're grooming these patients to be in, in these clinical trials, we have to think about their heart failure management. Not only is it a requirement to entry into these clinical trials, but it's just appropriate management in general. So to discuss that a little bit more is Jennifer Kleiner with regards to does heart failure management in heart valve disease work? Thank you, and thank you for having me here today. So heart failure management in valvular heart disease. We'll start with the definition. Heart failure is structural heart disease and evidence of elevated filling pressures. Historically, we had two categories of these patients. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or HEFREF, and those are patients with an LVEF less than 40%, and the patients with heart failure preserved ejection fraction with an LVEF greater than 50%. Last year in April 2022, our new guidelines came out and they added a heart failure mid-range ejection fraction category. And that's important for those patients that fall in between the HEFREF and HEFPEF. These are patients with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 41 to 49%. For this talk, I'm gonna focus solely on the HEF-REF patient population. So why is it important to talk about heart failure management at a valvular symposium? It's because these patients are going to come to you through your valve clinics. They're going to be referred for mitral valve intervention and surgery. And if they have reduced ejection fraction, we really need to <clears throat> be managing them per the guidelines. And you can see at the bottom of the algorithm are all of the interventions, right? This is what we've been talking about all day. But if you look, feed the algorithm back up to the beginning, it starts with guideline directed medical therapy managed by heart failure specialists. So this is an important step that often may not be done when these patients get referred to you. So what does GDMT or guideline-directed medical therapy look like in functional MR with LV dysfunction? It's the same as with isolated LV dysfunction. Quadruple therapy is the standard of care. These include our beta blockers, our ACE, ARBs, and ARNIs, MRAs, and SGLT2s, which are our newest category in, that made it into the guidelines. The estimated cumulative effect of these four medications is a 73% relative risk reduction in mortality over two years. So it's not trivial. And most importantly, the goal of GDMT is to get patients on the clinical trial defined target doses. That's very important that we strive to not only get therapy on, but to up titrate it where we know patients will get their best benefit. These are the target doses that we strive to get to. I won't spend any time on ACE or ARBs because I think, as we all know, they've fallen out of favor to ARNIs. Um, I'll just focus your attention on the Entresto dosing. So Secubitril Valsartan max dose that we should be striving for is 97,103 twice a day. Beta blockers, metoprolol succinate, 200 once a day, and carvedilol based on weight, 25 or 50 twice a day. MRAs and SGLT2 is a little bit easier, not much um, dose titration due, uh, for the MRAs and SGLT2s is one dose. So in pagliflozin, and dapagliflozin, and they don't need any work once they're added on. So how are we doing with guideline-directed medical therapy? Well, according to the CHAMP Heart Failure Registry, which looked at over 3,500 outpatient management of heart failure, patients on targeted doses of each therapy was less than 20%. And 1% of eligible patients were prescribed triple therapy. Now, this is before um, SGLT2s were in the guidelines. Now that it's quadruple therapy, we can assume that we're pretty close to the 1%, if not still even a little bit less. 
So why is that? We know these medicines work. We know what they are. Why is it so hard to get patients on therapy? It's because it's very labor and resource intensive, right? These patients don't want to come to the office once a week for dose titrations. There isn't any physician in this room that has the availability to see their patients once a week for dose titrations. Inconsistent follow-up. We see a patient in clinic, we start them on low-dose beta blocker, and we say, call in a week with your blood pressures and we'll adjust your medicine. And they never call, they show up three months later for their follow-up echo, and they're on essentially no GDMT, and we've lost a lot of important time. Delay with communication and frequent dose changes. This is difficult for patients, right? They need a lot, you know, four new medications, two of which have significant dose adjustments. So it's a lot for them to handle. The other piece that's very difficult for patients to navigate is the cost and coverage. Some of these medications require prior authorizations and are costly, and it's difficult as a patient, even as a provider, to navigate some of those cost constraints. This data was just released about two days ago, um, looking at guideline-directed medical therapy and co-op. So we were looking at the reasons and the rates of intolerability of GDMT. So for the patients who had, in the co-op trial, who had an LVEF of less than 40%, it was 464 patients. Um, you can see that by figure A, 38.8% of those patients were on triple therapy. Again, before um, SGLT2 was in the guidelines, um, the most tolerable category of medication was beta blockers, followed by ACE, ARB, and ARNI, and then the MRAs. The most frequent cited reason for um, drug intolerability was hypotension, followed by renal dysfunction. And only 2.2% of patients were at gold doses of all three guideline-directed medical therapy. So what do we do about that? How do we fix that? Well, at our institution, we've created a medication optimization clinic. We refer to it as the MOC. And it's a 12-week um, advanced practice provider, so nurse practitioners and physician's assistant-led clinic for patients with HEFREF, and we use structured algorithms for rapid initiation and up titration of medications. These patients have appointments once a week for the full 12 weeks in which we call them and review labs, vital signs, symptoms, and medication side effect. Medications are adjusted weekly as tolerated. We assist with all the copay, prior authorization, insurance, peer-to-peer -peer reviews, everything that we need to get to assure that patients can have access to therapy. And again, captive audience, so we provide heart failure education. The goal is to get four drugs on by four weeks and then use the following weeks for subsequent up titrations. When we first looked at our data at our single center 18 months, we had 206 patients that came through our medication optimization clinic, comparing that to a two to one propensity matching control group of 412. We saw that we were successful in decreasing both heart failure and cardiovascular hospitalizations at the three and six month mark. We also were able to increase the number of patients on quadruple therapy from 6% to 49%. So this was really exciting for us to, to see that this actually works, but the question we got over and over was, is this scalable? Yes, it's often easy to do these things at a large academic medical center where you have more resources, but is this reasonable to think that we could scale this across the system? So we did just that. We expanded to seven sites across the health system for a total of 10 advanced practice providers and they were across the entire state, so different demographic areas, and we're fully integrated into our valve center. So if a patient is referred for mitral valve um, evaluation and they have a low EF, it's an automatic referral to the medication optimization clinic. So we re-looked at our data at a little over um, the two and a half year mark, and I know this is a busy slide, so I'll, I will slim it down to the important things. Looking at our end, which is now 772 patients who came through the medication clinic, compared again to a two to one matching of um, a little over 1,500 patients. Not only were we successful in, in getting folks on therapy and getting to that 50 to 100% target dose, we 
were consistent in that increase in quadruple therapy. So we were able to increase the number of patients on quadruple therapy from 9%, 9.7% to 50.1%. So again, a significant improvement in, in therapy. Most importantly, what does this look like for hospitalizations? So if we are looking at heart failure hospitalizations at three, six, and 12 months, as well as cardiovascular hospitalizations at three, six, and 12 months, we were able to impact all of that. Heart failure hospitalizations at 12 months were decreased from 23.8% to 8.42%. So a significant decrease. Mortality at three, six, and nine months, also significant decrease. If we're looking, if we're looking at the one year mortality data, that was able to be decreased from 10.9% to 1.68%. I wanted to show this Kaplan Myers curve for the mortality at 12 months, only to point out um, one point. You can see the separation begins early. So these patients are getting effect almost immediately by being put on guideline-directed medical therapy. And that's important because we, we have to stress that we can't wait to refer these patients. When they're identified as having low EF, we need to get them on therapy quickly. And also, this is the reason that we're not quick to scale back on therapy. If a patient isn't doing well, we want to try looking at all other avenues before we scale back because we know it's beneficial. So in summary, dedicated medication optimization clinics are effective for rapid initiation and up titration of guideline-directed medical therapy. We should all strive to achieve the target doses of therapy. And to treat the valve, we must treat the ventricle. Medication optimization clinics are scalable. And patients managed through medication optimization clinics have a three to four fold reduction in hospitalizations and mortality. So it may be labor intensive, it may require resources, but it's the right thing to do. And doing the right thing is never the wrong thing. Thank you. That was, a, that was a really great discussion, thanks. And I'm sure that we'll have more comments about the role of medical therapy and then the great work that's been done, obviously in your heart failure clinic and just making sure that we have compliance. You know, if we're talking about adding a little bit of real estate to the portfolio with Mitral, we're heading full blown into emerging markets now. So really to uh, kind of begin the discussion with regards to that, we'll turn over to Matt Suppoletto, percutaneous tricuspid valve repair, making it a reality. Okay, greetings everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to give this talk. Uh, I have no disclosures. We will be discussing though an investigational device that we've been using at Presby, the TriClip. I'm going to be showing some pictures. So uh, we all in this room know tricuspid regurgitation is prevalent. It's prognostically significant. This is a higher risk surgical cohort by the time this is diagnosed, perhaps because of late discovery or patient's comorbidities. And in the percutaneous space right now, we have only investigational devices. We don't have a, an FDA approved device. But um, as we've shifted our focus to percutaneous approaches to the tricuspid valve, we've really seen a paradigm shift as far as how we image the tricuspid valve. So for this talk, I'm going to be reviewing tricuspid leaflet anatomy as it pertains to um, percutaneous solutions for tricuspid regurgitation. We're gonna talk about how to assess severe TR, uh, discuss briefly the types of functional degeneration and talk about some of the echo considerations as we uh, approach percutaneous solutions to the tricuspid valve, tricuspid regurgitation. This is Rebecca Hahn. She is really a thought leader in our field. Uh, I'm showing this paper because if you are an imager, if you have any interest in learning how to image the tricuspid valve, she is a really important figure and a, a real Jedi master of the tricuspid valve. Extending that analogy, I'm showing my partner, Bill Katz, where the, the imagers as part of our tricuspid program. And, uh, and, and we are aspiring to, to, to Jedi masterdom there. Um, this is who I was when Bill first handed me a probe in the early 2000s when I was a fellow, and I realized that this is what I've become. This is where, where we are now. Um, and again, extending that analogy, let's talk about our tricuspid valve team. We have Dr. Conrad Smith, our interventionalist. Never tell him the odds. Jeff, I took Luke, so you know who you are. Chewbacca. 
And uh, also a couple of our other structural imagers, Josh Levinson, who's in the crowd, Dr. Zach Reinhardt, I wanted to call attention to them. Because of the limitations of the, the protocol, they are not our active imagers for our tricuspid program, but they participate in our heart team waking up for a 6.30 meeting every Thursday. So they deserve a little bit of attention too. And last but not least, PA, Katie Fatiganti is in the audience. You might not even know who this is, Katie. This might be before your time, but, but you really are rounding out the cockpit here with us. So jumping right in, let's activate the hyperdrive and advance my slide. So um, tricuspid regurgitation, it's prevalent. Uh, it's prevalent in our elderly population. We see a higher prevalence with the diseases we know well, our patients with atrial fibrillation, our patients with pacemaker leads, the patients treated for their left-sided valve disease, either surgically or, or percutaneously. And we're plagued by late detection for a lot of different reasons. And this might be because tricuspid regurgitation may be clinically silent early. We might not be good at detecting it in the echo lab, but that's a whole nother subject uh, and really deserves some attention, both uh, from a sonographer and imager level. And by the time we discover it, there's often entrenched comorbidities, longstanding atrial fibrillation, right-sided heart failure, pacemaker lead present, kidney disease, liver disease, as we all know. Uh, I'm going to Briefly, uh, uh, I'm going to skip over that. That's a, a topic for another discussion, but uh, severe TR, know it when you see it. And even aside from some of the real sophisticated quantitative methods or 3D imaging we use, if you are seeing, oh, where's my marker there? If you're seeing reversal in the hepatic veins, if you're seeing a really triangular dense tricuspid signal, if you're seeing a big right atrium and a big IVC without the Re another reason for being there, like a, like a, an ASD, um, you should really be paying attention and looking for the tricuspid regurgitation. We have really sophisticated uh, quantitative methods. I remember as a fellow, when I learned PISA, I said, oh my God, this is so um, you know abstract and academic. Why are we ever going to use this? Well, we are using PISA and PISA radius. It's really enter the lexicon. Even our, our interventionalists know what PISA is and talk about the PISA dome and baseline shift as we're imaging. Um, so severe TR, no, when you see it, this is one of our patients. We see here a very, on the upper right screen, a very dense triangular tricuspid regurgitation signal. We see a uh, PISA dome flow convergence indicating a high volume regurgitation jet. And we're seeing on the bottom part of our slide there, hepatic vein reversal. And let's try my other slide advance. Um, so we have quantitative methods to say what is severe TR. When, and when we're talking about um, percutaneous uh, uh, solutions for the tricuspid valve, tricuspid regurgitation, um, this is the criteria used in the triluminate trial. Um, Notice we have two additional categories here. We have uh, created massive TR and torrential TR. We needed these both for descriptive purposes uh, because we, we know that there are patients who have severe plus and severe plus plus MR. But we also needed to monitor this because with our percutaneous approaches, we might not reduce um, below severe, but we might reduce to a lower grade of severe. So it helps to have a descriptive framework. Now, this may ob be obvious to the surgeons in the room, but even to people who've, who've made their, their career imaging, um, tricuspid valve anatomy is variable. We've traditionally learned this is a three leaflet valve, but, but actually now with imaging, we're realizing that there's quadricuspid valves and even quinticuspid valves out there. And really, even with very high quality TE techniques, when we're using a planar imaging technique, it's really hard. It's like the fundoscopic exam. You know, to, to, until we had a technique like 3D echo to really see all these leaflets laid out in a single plane or the surgeon's view, we really didn't appreciate the variations in anatomy, which I'm showing there. Um, this is uh, a couple of the techniques we use in the TE lab, and this was a uh, procedural planning for this patient. On the left side of the screen, I'm showing 3D MPR, that's multiplane reconstruction. This is a, a really a workhorse concept for us, both uh, pre-procedure and during procedure. Um, we're using a 3D data set and using steerable planes to uh, evaluate the valve at different levels. And if you look on the left side of the screen, if you look at our um, middle view here, you might appreciate there that this is a quadricuspid valve. It has a very diminutive um, uh, posterior leaflet as well as a, a larger posterior leaflet, larger, thicker. The anterior leaflet is down in the four to six o'clock position in our septal leaflet. And that's obviously going to impact our approach, particularly when we're talking about an edge to edge repair. Um, this exact patient, the analogous view, this is a transgastric 30 degree view we do from the stomach. A lot of people have learned this view. Um, but notice in this same patient, we don't quite have the, the, the appreciation of that fourth 
a posterior leaflet there. So even though this is a, a useful view, I think with the MPR, when we can do it well, we get a lot of additional information. And this is a, kind of a, a tilted anatomy. This would be a type three B valve. I don't use that, but, but we see two posterior leaflets. So I think it's a useful discussion. We can apply color Doppler techniques to these same two views. And I think that's very helpful, both for procedural planning and grading severity of TR. We can get these views even with 2D, uh, with a transthoracic techniques. This is a transthoracic image taken from our lab and one of our triluminate uh, enrolled patients here. So even with a really high quality, uh, three, a 3D probe and high quality transthoracic imaging, we can get the same kind of surgical type view. Um, when we talk about tricuspid regurgitation, there are causes of primary tricuspid regurgitation I have listed there, but oftentimes the majority of our patients are patients who have, have secondary tricuspid regurgitation, and we lump this into categories, atrial functional, ventricular functional, and also pacemaker associated, and it's important to note that, that really these can coexist. We can have, by the time our patients come to us, they may have both atrial functional plus a pacemaker lead. Um, they may have a component of leaflet tethering because of RV remodeling as well. So really there's gonna be some overlap, but these are broad categories that I help, uh, I think help the discussion. This is a, a patient of ours we ended up implanting as part of the triluminate trial. And this was a patient with primary myxomatous degeneration, but, but probably also some annular dilation. By the time she came to us, we see thickened myxomatous tricuspid leaflets as well as mitral leaflets there. This is a uh, functional ventricular uh, regurgitation. I think on the right side of the screen with the absence of tissue Doppler, you see that we have apically tethered tricuspid leaflets with a wide tricuspid regurgitation gap. And that same patient using a 3D technique, this patient also had a pacemaker lead. It may be a little difficult to appreciate. I don't think I have a really great functioning pointer here, but this patient has a pacemaker lead in the kind of seven o'clock position that we see on the left side of our screen. Now that pacemaker lead, uh, though it may have some interaction with the posterior leaflet, look at the coaptation gap and, and look at our far away from, from that, the anterior leaflet and the septal leaflet are not coapting. So this is a pacemaker that, uh, that probably has, has little functional significance to the degree of TR that this patient has. Atrial functional, we see effacement of the tricuspid leaflets, a really broad annulus and a regurgitation jet. Um, briefly, pacemaker leads, um, we, we have encountered them. We know that they can have leaflet interactions. We know they can also cause leaflet injury and fibrosis. It, it's now you know, pretty widely accepted that even if you detect this and their pacemaker lead is interfering, um, pacemaker lead removal is, is a morbid, uh, complicated uh, a proposition. And also that fibrotic lead injury doesn't go away um, when we remove the pacemaker lead, uh, if that was the cause. And just some imaging here, this is clearly a pacemaker lead interacting with our septal leaflet. I think that the lower left panel shows it best, but we can also use a sophisticated uh, 3D transthoracic technique as well to, to really understand how that, that leaflet, the bright spot in the lower right corner is right in, pinned against the septal lead, septal leaflet and holding it back. Um, large coaptation gaps, we've had to uh, be able to assess and address these, describe them to our heart team and our interventionalists and know that this is a, a complex proposition, particularly when we're talking about uh, edge to edge repair. Um, our experience, just to, to briefly summarize, we have implanted 21 patients uh, as part of the triluminate trial with a uh, tricuspid tier approach. Pacemaker leads were present in a number of these, and we've had some successes even with the pacemaker leads being present. Uh, challenges we faced, and, and I hope during the discussion we can talk about this a little bit more, large gaps, flail uh, septal or posterior leaflets have proved challenging, uh, flail small leaflets, fibrotic cordae, ventricular tethering as far as getting purchase and, uh, and getting a, a nice grasp on the leaflet, and of course cases where, where we have suboptimal visualization, we're not able to create those beautiful MPR slides. Much like in the mitral space, we've talked about kind of uh, green light, yellow light, red light. So there are, uh, there is guidance out there in the literature to say, you know, who who are we? Who is uh, going to be a successful candidate? Who's going to be a more challenging candidate? And who is a candidate for tricuspid edge to edge repair that we should probably uh, avoid doing? Um, I don't think I have time to go into this case. This is a case that Jeff, uh, we talked about and he urged me to present. This was a quadru quadricuspid valve. We put two clips on. I'm just going to, in the interest of time, show kind of the money slides here. So this is us in the intervention using MPR to guide our clip placement. This is our first clip. We're trying to get a nice septal anterior grasp here. Then we shift to X plane, which shows us the grasping view on the right side of the screen really well. This is our grasp, clasp, and release on the right side. 
got a nice result. First clip in place on the right side of the screen. If you look in the three o'clock position, that's our clip. And if you look uh, towards the, the top quadrants there, we'll see that this is us positioning our second clip going for a septal posterior leaflet grasp. We have the leaflet. We use our transgastric view to show leaflet insertion, a nice clover leaf appearance. Confirm with MPR release clip. Got a really nice result in this case. And this is after implantation, significant reduction in tricuspid regurgitation. So just to briefly summarize imaging for success, we have to see the leaflets. We have to know the leaflets. We have to be able to describe the leaflets, count the leaflets to guide uh, our, our clipping strategy. We have to mind the gap. Our large gap patients are going to be difficult. Plan our grasp. Be willing to abandon a position or regrasp if we are not liking what we're seeing. And with every move, anticipate what our next move will be during the case. Programmatic success, heart team dynamic. Um, interest in advanced echo techniques, a willingness to learn, a willingness to uh, to uh, to push the bounds of what we're doing and train our sonographers to do so. Um, talented interventionalists, of course, willingness to learn, comprehensive cardiology care, MOC clinic, uh, and a patient-centered approach. And with that, I'll show a bibliography and uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thanks everyone for your attention. Thanks a lot, Matt. Uh, so we'll transition from the world of repair to the world of replacement. And this talk is titled TTVR, the new TAVR. And uh, as you'll see, this is kind of a tongue in cheek statement. So let me just go ahead and share my screen so I can show you my slides. Uh, hopefully those are transmitting well. If they're not, just let me know. Okay, uh, so here are my disclosures. Uh, I am going to be talking about how TTVR is the new TAVR, but in the case that they're both heart valves, inserted in percutaneously potentially with three leaflets and there in the similarities end. So the quagmire is that severe TR is obviously vastly undertreated, more out of mind than out of sight. It's a large historical issue with the reluctance to treat it, increase in hospital mortality, particularly following left-sided cardiac surgery. Percutaneous therapies are a challenge due to the anatomy. Tricuspid leaflets are thinner and more fragile, high cortal density and RV trabeculation challenge navigation. RV dimensions can be small, limiting throw into the RV. Lack of calcium can present ceiling problems. The annulus is dynamic, as Matt pointed out in his talk, and we're limited by our imaging. TE is particularly challenging because of the anterior orientation of the tricuspid valve. So um, this is a proposed uh, a standard echocardiographic tricuspid valve nomenclature by Becky Hahn and colleagues, as Matt kind of discussed as well. And obviously it's much more, uh, complex than anything that we have in the aortic uh, valve world. So we're entering into a minefield. When we're talking about transeptal, or sorry, not transeptal, transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement, there is no transeptal support, and the distance between the IVC and the tricuspid annulus can be quite short. Several surrounding structures can be at risk, the AV node, the right bundle of Hiss, the RCA, the non-coronary sinus of Alsalva, the coronary sinus ostium. Many patients have pre-existing pacemakers and ICD leads. Our case here, I wanna show you just to elaborate on the complexity here, 91 year old female, severe functional TR, permanent AFib on Eliquis, history of a mechanical MVR, chronic diastolic heart failure, history of breast cancer, STS bridge risk mortality of repair, mitral valve repair is 18%, tricuspid valve repair is not in the STS uh, database as far as calculations concerned. So we evaluated for one of our clinical trial platforms, the Medtronic Intrepid TTVR that I'm gonna go through in just a second. She initially screen failed secondary to a poor creatinine clearance, but eventually was accepted four months later after the creatinine clearance uh, criteria were revised to GFR. And so we can see here where this jet is coming from, and it's basically commissure to commissure, commissure to commissure, uh, really just very centralized, but assume, expanding into the commissures of the tricuspid valve space. And on the scale of being massive torrential, sorry, torrential massive severe, we're probably severe to massive with regards to the amount of TR here. And so uh, 0.45 centimeters squared on the PISA uh, as far as the um, 3D assessment was concerned. RV dysfunction was just mild uh, with a relatively preserved TAPSI. We'd CT size all these patients, obviously. CT uh, sizing of the tricuspid annulus can be quite complex. Uh, you can see the oversizing here that we're willing to accept for a 48 millimeter device is on the verge of true sizing or slightly undersized. And so you can see here the maximum diameter of 46.2, minimum diameter of 40.3. 
CT sizing in the RV. And so the length of the right ventricle definitely matters. Um, you know, we're concerned about injury, pseudoaneurysms, perforations, things of that nature. And here things look very good. Obviously, the minimum and maximum view. Uh, this trial was actually halted in the early term, secondary to incidents of those types of events. And those have been largely resolved with the refined criteria to assess um, the depth or length of the right ventricle. We look at access, we're looking at venous access, obviously, and the capacitance of a 42 French outer diameter system or a 39 French outer diameter system up from the groin area into the IVC. Sheath to femoral vein ratio is something that we look at. The average perimeter here is about uh, 0.82 uh, for the 37 French, and that's deemed to be suitable for our transfemoral venous access. So this device is a dual stent frame device. There's this outer stent frame that kind of conforms to the anatomy that's 42 or 48 millimeters in diameter. The inner stent frame is 27 millimeters in diameter. And so there are some considerations here to be aware of. Uh, you can see here that we've got dense coral structures, IVC TV, annulus distance trajectory issues, RV length, RV size, variable TV, annulus dimensions, Horizontal hard axis can present some orthogonal challenges or being able to lie this valve perpendicular, some anatomic shadowing as well. And so here we look at the delivery system, uh, the cradle and stool, which is off the shelf, the sheath and step, step up dilators uh, as being kind of part and parcel of how we do this procedure. And so to move on to some of the NPR rendering and 3D imaging, you can see us here coming in uh, via the SVC and the right atrium with this device that basically has a brim structure to it that we then lower down to the annular plane and we complete rapid pacing to deploy the brim just for sake of time. I won't go through this in too much detail, but you can see here with the 3D and NPR assessments of what we're actually doing. When we go to deploy this valve, and again, I'll kind of fast forward here just to show you what happens. Uh, that it's a hydraulic end deflator, the valve gets deployed, and at the point of deployment, we look pretty good, but when we release the brim of the valve um, and, and the actual internal fixation of the valve, uh, we do see a little bit of kick up on that posterior aspect of the valve. Um, and what you'll see here is basically that we've caught basically the annular plane with the lower set of cleats, but that the valve is basically migrated out a little bit. And this is obviously concerning. When we go to our color Doppler here, you're gonna see there's a tremendous amount of color flow here indicating significant paravalvular regurgitation. And so this is definitely an issue. So now what? We think about the Super Bowl, we think about the Eagles pushing uh, their, their quarterback, Jalen Hurts, into the end zone. And that's exactly what we elected to try to do. Uh, so we definitely jam this capsule of the device between the inner and outer stem frame to basically try to move this device in more to an annular level. And uh, what we accomplish with that is actually pretty good. Uh, so we go from here to here. And so we do shut down paravalvular regurgitation to a certain degree. But unfortunately, when we, uh, when we move back the capsule, we end up with that same PVL jet that we did before. A patient wasn't really tolerating this very well. Uh, and, and this was not a suitable surgical candidate. So what did we elect to do? We elect to put in a 29 millimeter Sapien 3. And these are kind of like the, um, not in a textbook, uh, kind of creative solutions that we're gonna have to think about in this era. And so here we elect for 29 millimeter Sapien 3 to be deployed a little bit more in the ventricle. And by deploying this, we cut off that PVL jet, as you see here on color, just a very mild amount of PVL remainder. Uh, and so we get a pretty good outcome there. All right, so our peri and post procedural follow-up looks pretty good. Transthoracic echocardiography showing um, really good solutions uh, with regards to what we had employed. Um, so really just trivial PVL left over and a good tricuspid valve replacement in replacement. So some final thoughts here. Uh, they do well in their preferred anatomies, but understanding what those anatomies are is a work in progress. This complex consists of a very flimsy valve, variably shaped annulus, sometimes dense chordal apparatus influential chamber, chamber dimensions and random trajectories, provided you could see it during the procedure at all. However, the patient population is plentiful, very much in need, and most are without any effective commercially available treatment. This field more than any other will require collaboration to build and refine an absolutely essential toolbox. So thanks so much. Here's my contact information. Appreciate your time. And without further ado, we can move on to the next talk, which is gonna be about concomitant maze and left atrial appendage ligation.
uh, heart valve surgery. Do not forget about AFib. We'll turn it over to Dr. Chu. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. We'll shift gears a little bit about uh, surgical treatment for AFib and concomitant valve disease. Um, Here, you go. Here are my disclosures, uh, specifically relating to this talk, I uh, borrowed some slides for the Atricure uh, company, um, but uh, other disclosures are not relevant for this uh, talk. So uh, as we know, most of us um, understand that AFib is uh, it's clearly um, a, a big uh, medical and financial problem and burden for the United States, and uh, only one-third of the atrial fibrillation is treated during heart surgery. So clearly a very undertreated uh, disease. And, and currently, there are more than 33 million people still suffering from AFib worldwide. And as the population grows and ages, there's clearly a need for um, um, uh, atrial fibrillation treatment. Clearly, the burden is going to increase, estimated to be 12 million in uh, 2032. Um, many studies have shown a clear relationship between atrial fibrillation and uh, heart failure, and um, um, clearly that uh, the restoration of the sinus rhythm uh, improves the ejection fraction, and especially so in patients with severe left ventricular hypertrophy with other valvular disease, and the restoration of sinus rhythm in these patients, uh, even uh, with cardiovascular disease, is clearly beneficial from a heart failure and survival standpoint. In 1995, um, uh, one of our um, surgical giants, uh, Jim Cox, developed a technique alongside with the electrophysiologist, a, a, a cut and sew surgical maze procedure, uh, which is really transforming in terms of surgical treatment for atrial fibrillation. Uh, this technique uh, initially was described by Jim Cox and uh, as a Cox Maze 3 procedure, it involves cutting, literally cutting the right atrium and the left atrium into maze little pieces and then sew back together. So as you can imagine, clearly it's, uh, it's really uh, a lot of needle holes of potential bleeding and, and, and didn't really take off until a different energy sources uh, became available. Uh, this is a meta-analysis uh, systemic review of really specifically looking at whether or not the uh, diff utilization of different energy sources in a, uh, compared to so cut and stone technique is beneficial. And, and this systemic meta-analysis review clearly showed that uh, the sinus rate conversion between the classic cut and sew that Jim Cox developed and the alternative energy sources are similar. So this is just a quick diagram of... Um, uh, what so surgical maze look like, um, um, essentially isolating the pulmonary veins and creating uh, lesion, ablation lesions to the uh, tricuspid mitral annulus and really uh, interrupting the, the micro and microbial entry circuit for atrial fibrillation from an electrophysiology standpoint. And as you can see here, uh, multiple sources have really demonstrated the uh, uh, cure rate, the potential cure rate for, for persistent or non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is upwards of 90%, which is really, really quite impressive as evident by multiple um, uh, studies. So why is it that, um, that, that, that this type of uh, procedure in surgery is not occurring more common in concomitant valve operations? Well, I'm just going to go over a few uh, studies really documenting why it should be done. Uh, this is a, a early study from uh, Niv Az group, uh, who is a protege of Jim Cox's group, uh, really showing that, um, uh, answer a question whether uh, operative risk is increased with additional Cox Mace 3 procedure to uh, aortic valve or, cardio or coronary artery bypass operation. And, and albeit this, pa this paper is only uh, has 20, 95 pairs of propensity matched patients, a relatively small uh, population, but the, essentially, the message was that the addition of the maze procedure in other concomitant cardiac surgery operations did not add any increased morbidity or mortality. As we move on, in the same group, uh, as they get more experience, a uh, higher volume of patient and higher sample size, and on a similar note, uh, looking at both concomitant uh, mitral and tricuspid valve surgery, uh, really, the message of this paper, which is published in our premier journal, was no increase in morbidity was associated with this procedure in mitral and tricuspid valve uh, surgical patients. Uh, in similar fashion, as, uh, as, as the same group really look at the long-term outcome, 
uh, out of uh, 473 patients who underwent the MACE procedure with mitral valve procedure concomitantly. This study suggests the addition of a COS-MACE procedure uh, uh, with mitral valve disease has high degree of complexity, but did not increase overoperative risk. So um, uh, in even longer term uh, per, uh, outcome, the, uh, in a similar uh, fashion, they look at more patients, now it's up to 711 patients, um, which also show that uh, in, in, in addition to success of uh, cure for atrial fibrillation, uh, the procedure itself did not add any additional morbidity. So all those papers I showed you were early, but uh, really small sample size. So, so as we get more experience um, for this type of procedure in a surgical fashion, this group in um, the New England Cardiovascular Study Group looked at really the STS database over 20,000 with suggested patients and clearly showed that there's an increase in survival in the, at least in the midterm and um, for patients who underwent uh, concomitant procedures in other uh, cardiac surgery, which included cabbage and valve diseases. Um, this, uh, again, um, a really increasing sample size, looking at specifically the um, uh, um, uh, STS database over 10,000 patients also was suggested, really showing that the performance of the MACE procedure is associated with increased and improved long-term outcome in patients undergoing uh, uh, cardiac surgery. So um, more recently, uh, a group of experts for uh, around the world really uh, trying to answer the question, what we should do as surgeons and provide expert uh, guideline in reviewing uh, uh, many, many published literatures, as well as uh, expert consensus to identify the question whether or not we should, as surgeons, treat atrial fibrillation in, 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 as a standalone procedure or as a concomitant cardiac surgery procedures. Um, I won't go through, uh, because of the time constraints, I won't go through the details, but essentially I want to draw your attention to the, the guideline, which is, um, number one, in, whenever you do mitral valve surgery from an um, open surgical standpoint, it is actually a class one indication based on level A evidence to do concomitant mace procedures in patients with previous uh, uh, atrial fibrillation. And what about other type of uh, surgery in addition to uh, mitral valve surgery? Well, it's also class one. Level of evidence is B. It's a little bit less strong, but certainly a class one indication. Um, so what's more importantly is that patients with atrial fibrillation who is scheduled to undergo surgery must have a multidisciplinary heart team discussion uh, to really uh, optimize what the treatment uh, options are. And this is not just the STS, uh, multiple other uh, organizations, including cardiology, cardiac surgery around the country and around the world also uh, recommended the concomitant surgical ablation or maze procedure. It's a class one indication uh, to treat patients with previous uh, uh, atrial fibrillations with other heart valve diseases. So to conclude, um, atrial fibrillation portends to poor survival, uh, which we all know, a MACE procedure has been shown by multiple studies to cure uh, uh, atrial fibrillation up to 90% of the time. And the radiofrequency ablation and cryolesions have similar outcome as a traditional uh, cut and sew technique. And, and very clearly, after many um, um, evaluations from, from numerous publications and uh, just study reviews, it's a class one indication for concomitant procedure doing surgical heart valve operations. Now, class one, I always tell the residents, is essentially an error of uh, um, uh, omission. So if you don't do it, you go to jail. So it's important that we do that. Um, and, and surgeons really consider doing this uh, operation is, uh, at the same time. These are some of my references. And um, that being said, thank you for your time. Appreciate the invite. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Chu, and clearly a very large patient population Venn diagram intersection between AFib and valve surgery or valve uh, valve disease. So uh, let's go ahead and, and try to limit the next two talks to about eight minutes. Uh, so we'll embrace the robot for mitral valve surgery. Dr. Bonatti, please go ahead. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to look together with you uh, at where we stand with using a surgical robot uh, for mitral valve surgery, more specific, uh, less invasive, minimal invasive mitral valve surgery. The surgeon uh, sits behind, as we know, a console, looks into a 3D HD binocular and controls the surgical instruments 
uh, with uh, joysticks or masters as we call them and also using uh, foot pedals at this uh, console. Here is a view on the docked uh, robot. We have uh, four arms that are of course uh, draped in sterile fashion. We have a camera, uh, two instrument arms and a one arm for holding the left atrial retractor. Work of the patient side uh, surgeon is extremely important uh, for uh, proper work. Here, uh, we start out the operation uh, with a very small mini thoracotomy on the right chest. It's the fourth interspace and we insert a soft tissue uh, retractor. In parallel to these steps, one of us uh, cannulates the patient in the right groin usually. Uh, we have the venous drainage uh, cannulae, uh, bringing the, the oxygenated blood into the heart-lung machine, and then it's pumped back uh, through the arterial cannula. We insist on a distal perfusion cannula like we do in ECMO to ensure proper leg perfusion during the procedure. After going on pump, a long cardioplegia cannula is inserted into the ascending aorta and uh, connected to the cardioplegia vent line. You can use either an endoballoon or a uh, cross clamp, uh, the so-called chitwood clamp that is brought endothoracically to the ascending aorta. We cross clamp the aorta and induce cardioplegia. This is the uh, endoscopic robotic surgeon's uh, view on the anatomy. Uh, you appreciate the ascending aorta with the cardioplegia cannula, the left atrial retractor that now pushes away the uh, right atrium so that we can uh, access the water groove and we have the left and right instrument, robotic instrument uh, in our site. Once uh, we open the left atrium, you see here a P2 flail, typical myxomatous degeneration. We use uh, a ruler just to get an idea how much we reduce, re reduce the height of the posterior leaflet. We target 1.5 centimeters. And in most instances, if we do resectional techniques, use a triangular resection of the P2 uh, segment. Curved scissors are used to, to do that and the resected portion is handed over to the patient side surgeon. The defect is closed using a double layer running 4-0 proline suture requires good coordination again between patient side surgeon and console surgeon. And uh, in the end, uh, this uh, suture is tied using a what we call a knot pusher, which we will see in a second here. The um, annuloplasty is, I mean, essentially every mitral valve repair is concluded with an annuloplasty. And in most instances, we use an annuloplasty band. The valve suture placement is also very well doable with this fantastic view that you have on uh, the mitral valve and all the structures. And you see, as you see here, the valve sutures are secured using a titan titanium fasteners, the so-called core knots. Another example, uh, this is not myxomatous degeneration, but fibroelastic deficiency, much less tissue as you see here. And in those cases, we are more reluctant to resect uh, the tissue, but use neocords for the reconstruction. The neocord vortex CV4 is anchored deep into the papillary muscle and then goes again through the papillary muscle at the insertion site of the Words, pull it out of the chest and then bring the neocord through the free edge of the leaflet twice and then it is secured with eight knots by the patient side surgeon. We also look into the length of the neocords. That's the tricky thing about the um, neocord technique, how to how long to 
keep them. It's usually something between one centimeter and one and a half centimeters that we use. And then again, conclusion of the repair with a annuloplasty band. A water test shows us a completely competent valve. Now, which patients, any patient with an indication for repair can be considered and undergo specific uh, workup. There are several uh, caveats or contraindications, severe AR, severe MAC, severe left ventricular dysfunction and dilatation of the ventricle, severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, hypertension, all that you see on echo. Related to cardiopulmonary bypass, aortoiliac atherosclerosis is something to respect and the femoral artery diameter. Um, chest deformities such as uh, pectus excavatum is a contraindication, severe forms, of course. And uh, we also look into lung functions because we have to collapse the right lung with a double lumen tube. Severe forms of lung disease we don't do. We are... Um, reluctant with uh, reduce additional CAD, coronary artery disease. Sometimes we do stenting before the minimal invasive mitral valve repair, uh, or we uh, suggest sternotomy in these cases. Poor RV function is also a contraindication. Um, so, okay, good. All right. How is that uh, being done all over the US? These are data of the STS, um, if you follow the, the gray line, you see that since 2015, robotic mitral valve repair has increased from 10 to 14%, and videoscopic um, approaches from 19% to 27%. Overall, making this 42% of procedures being done in uh, a less invasive approach in the US. Um, a current review that we performed showed us uh, in more than 5,000 published patients over 20 years that the mortality rates are way below 1%, about 1.5%. 1, uh, Stroke rates, 1%. Revision for bleeding, 2.5%. 23% transfusion. This is also data from a recent uh, presentation it's about to be published of the uh, Task Force on Robotic Surgery um, in looking into robotic approaches versus stenotomy approaches uh, in more than uh, 6,000, close to 7,000 uh, propensity score matched uh, patients. What we see is that uh, all hospital events are 31% in the robotic patients, 40% in stenotomy, uh, transfusion and atrial fibrillation are less. Also, the uh, ventilation hours, 42 hours versus 34 hours. ICU stay is shorter and the hospital length of stay, essentially six days versus five days in favor of the robotic approach. So you can reduce the hospital stay by one day and uh, operative mortality about the same, same for morbidity mortality combined. In uh, Pittsburgh here at uh, the um, uh, at the Presby and, Shady, and and sorry Passament hospitals, we started the program, restarted the robotic program in July 2021, so almost two years ago, and we have performed 96 cases of robotic surgery. More than half of them were mitral valves, and the other half is essentially coronary surgery being done with robotics. And out of the uh, robotic mitral valve repairs, plus minus tri uh, tricuspid valve repair, we had uh, two conversions out of 49 cases, no mortality, no stroke, no revision for bleeding, no residual MR intraoperatively um, greater than mild and one patient needed to be reoperated so far. So we're happy with these uh, results. Uh, the advantages uh, for the surgeon are much better ergonomics. The vision is fantastic. Uh, give this beautiful 3D HD view into the chest and into the left atrium. Dexterity is better. And uh, we see advantages in the, with precision for the surgeon. We have uh, significantly reduced surgical trauma, complete sternal stability, 
and pr overall preservation of integrity. Cosmesis is one aspect of that. Faster recovery, essentially a return to all activities within three to four weeks as compared to the 12 weeks uh, sternal precautions with sternotomy. And here you see a patient four weeks follow up after robotic mitral valve repair, really a significantly reduced uh, trauma and much more accepted by the patient. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Bonatti. Uh, we'll move on to our last uh, uh, segment of, of this uh, particular section, uh, just a complete uh, different uh, concept, endocarditis with IV drug use. We need to talk about it. So let's talk about it, Dr. Yoon. Well, it's called maximally invasive heart surgery. Okay, and, uh, next slide. Oh, am I pushing it with this? Okay. So uh, no disclosure. Um, so at UPMC Presbyterian, we have a multidisciplinary endocarditis team, and uh, these are the team members. And sometimes we, we get even more subspecialties involved. Oops, how do we go back? Oh, this one, okay. Okay. It's moving too fast. Okay. So uh, since the start, we've had uh, 258 valvular endocarditis patients evaluated, and this excludes the, uh, the lead infections. And out of those, those are the numbers of procedures that we have uh, performed. So we're gonna talk about the good, the bad, the ugly uh, of the uh, endocarditis and IV uh, drug use uh, patient population. Ah, like, what the? Oops, this is old, okay. Clicker. Okay. I sent you the shortened version. That's probably the one that uh, would have been fine. Yeah. Okay. We okay now? Okay. So uh, the change uh, in etiology of uh, endocarditis is the main thing is that if over, over the last couple of decades, the IV drug use uh, patients have become really the uh, big portion of this patient population. And these patients have 140 increase in uh, risk of endocarditis. So to discuss the good and bad and ugly, I'm gonna give you some uh, case reports. Here is a uh, first case, uh, HD, 30 year old female. She had aortic valve replacement and other complex procedure done in 2015. And uh, she actually stayed uh, sober for uh, a decade and uh, complying with all the methadone clinic and such. And she returns with uh, severe prosthetic aortic valve stenosis. And uh, upon request, she quit drinking right away and, you know, novel, you know, really compliant. And then we end up doing a surgery, redo ABR on March 28th and was discharged home on April 2nd, uh, really a five days. So really a good outcome. So what, what is uh, bad about it? Well, the morning of surgery, this patient, well, somebody called our uh, or front desk and saying this patient is drunk and doing all kinds of drugs the night before surgery. So, you know, we're thinking about canceling this patient's case. Well, it turns out it was her mother, who's a drug addict, uh, decided after, because she had an argument the previous night that uh, she decided to sabotage this patient's surgery. So it really shows the social aspect of a lot of this patient population. They really have frequently very unstable social situation, and that becomes a big problem in managing these patients. And this is the, uh, you know, really uh, just the uh, structural deterioration of the tissue valve after eight years, and she got a nice mechanical valve. 
The other case, uh, polysubstance abuse, IV drug use, ETOH. Uh, she, he also had a lot of uh, other issues, HCV, cirrhosis, pancreatitis, Crohn's disease, status post ileocecectomy. He was admitted with uh, left thalamic stroke and right uh, parietal subarachnoid hemorrhoid, uh, hemorrhage, sorry, not hemorrhoid. <laughs> so um, patient during, uh, uh, had the renal splenic infarcts, MSSA endocarditis during the hospital admission patient ended up having a ruptured spleen and the required splenectomy and also had event of hypovolemic shock with PEA arrest. Patient also required other procedures such as embolization. How do I play this? So this is the uh, aortic root abscess. And in fact, actually the abscess really looks like outside the aortic valve, I mean, ascending aorta. He underwent a uh, resection of infected bicuspid aortic valve with a uh, vasectomy and debridement of aortic root abscess, exclusion of the aortic root pseudoaneurysm, aortic root replacement with a homograft, and drained acidic fluid, pericardial effusion, and pleural effusion. At the time of surgery, EF was 20%. If you look at this uh, slide, patient was in the hospital literally from July 2020 till April of 2021. So you're talking about really eight, nine months of hospitalization. And, you know, the operation itself was a, you know, pretty ugly procedure. But the good news is that patients EF improved from 10 to 15%. So after several months of management by the heart failure team, EF improved to 55 to 60%. And this patient's been drug-free for the last uh, two years. Uh, it's an ugly case, but good outcome. Now, this patient has lived with her mother, his mother for the last two and a half years. And this, that's been really, the family support's been very important. He's actually going to be leaving uh, his home uh, to become in independent. Now, how well he's gonna do, uh, we hope that he will continue to do well. These are some of the tissue that we re, uh, uh, pulled out and the patient had a homograft and this is a procedure he's had. This is another case. Um, Patient was admitted uh, at Mercy uh, May 19th uh, with shortness of breath, malaise, progressing to septic shock. MLSA bacteremia, tricuspid valve endocarditis with septic pulmonary emboli, complicated by respiratory failure, requiring uh, mechanical ventilation and acute renal failure. Patient was transferred to Presby and underwent uh, tricuspid valve uh, replacement uh, with tissue valve and uh, uh, patient did well. Um, Preoperatively, we have multidisciplinary uh, team approach with involvement of addiction medicine. And really, uh, you know, we try to set up these social situations as best as possible. Unfortunately, you know, we last spoke to her on August 24th and she reported things were going well and she was being very compliant. August 26th, uh, she died of a fatal overdose. And this is a sample of a, a lung CT on the left side and you see, and that's the uh, tricuspid uh, large vegetation. And this is some of the tissues we pulled out and she, he got, he's got, she ended up getting a tissue valve. The problem with uh, this patient population is recidivism. And the frequently we are faced with, you know, second and third, the fourth, you know, operations. And if you look at these patient's outcomes, you know, every time we go back for redo, their uh, mobility mortality, you know, skyrockets. And if you look at really the big picture, these patients die from really the recidivism, not third surgery. So drug addiction is the primary pathology and, you know, the endocarditis, these are basically their symptoms. And we know that it is cost, the, the inpatient cardiac rehab is, you know, very cost effective, but, you know, availability for amount of problem we have is just minuscule. So, you know, we face an ethical dilemma, you know, I mean, as we saw in one of those patients, patient was in the hospital for eight or nine months. So, you know, is society able to, you know, pay for that, you know, you know how do you allocate resources? And also, when does recidivism come for utility? We had a patient as, as patient was leaving the hospital was injecting. 
So, you know, is, is that futile? And also while patient autonomy and safety is highly valued, what about safety and autonomy of the surgeons and teams? We have a patients, you know, really, you know, cursing out the nurses, calling all kinds of names. I mean, how do you deal with that? But uh, some feel that how is this different than, you know, the cabbage patients that we treat after discharge within a few months, go back to smoking. And you know the morbid, morbidly obese patient. After we do the the procedures for morbid obesity, you know they frequently do go back uh, becoming morbidly obese again because uh, they failed procedure not because of the surgery but because of a uh, you know uh, really uh, the lifestyle. So you know so one would ask how is this different than you know those? But uh, you know that's food for thought. But this is certainly a difficult patient population. I think UPMC Presbyterian is probably in uh, endocarditis, as far as endocarditis uh, is concerned, we do cover Western Pennsylvania, Maryland, and West Virginia, because we get patients from all of these areas. These are not patients that I think other hospitals are very freely and willingly to uh, send to a Presbyterian University Hospital. With that, uh, finish my talk. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh it just clearly uh, a lot of content laid in discussion there uh, as far as uh, endocarditis patients are concerned, clearly a drug to society economically. And we've got to intervene earlier on these folks, both from a behavioral standpoint, but then also when they get their uh, valve issues. So uh, we got about five minutes uh, for just very focused discussion. So I would like uh, all the distinguished members of the panel to comment broadly on a couple of different topics. So one thing that I've noticed with these mitral valve repair replacement trials, Conrad and um, Jeff, is that you know we're actually inaugurating new technology within the constructs of these studies. And then we're also changing the study designs as we move along. So what was a randomization of surgery then becomes maybe a tier exclusive cohort with maybe the maybe the maybe maybe future development more towards tier randomization that sort of thing how are we going to interpret these results at the end of the day more for the replacement studies than obviously the tier studies but uh, as we inject new technology and change study designs what exactly is that going to lead to scientifically yeah no i think it's a, a great question and I, I think in part you know uh, uh, the this is um become the case uh, as the tier technology has shown uh, evidence of benefit in, in earlier studies and in clinical practice. So it, in, in some patients, it was not felt to be reasonable to randomize the, them to, uh, to, to have uh, not not have tier as a reasonable arm for randomizing those patients, but I think it's it's a standard of care. It's what we're dealing with now, and I, it, I think it was an important step for both enrollment in the trials, but also in, in as we're looking at patients. To what is what are the options that patients have moving forward, and how that is going to define the. the true utility of these these valve replacement therapies as jeff mentioned i mean it's a tough field it's a very tough field with respect to the number of patients that are um, not deemed um, eligible for for anatomic reasons or for other reasons so so uh, it, it, our ability to sort of maximize and optimize the, the number of patients that we're able to en enroll in the trials and look at the data uh, down the road to see uh, to see where we are. I think you, you've experienced it uh, as well in the, the work that you guys are doing. And I think it's, it's it, it, not only is it the challenge in enrolling the patients, but it's uh, the modifications of devices and approaches that are going to make it a challenging field. And I think I feel that it's, we still have a lot of work to do. Jeff, you have any comments about that? The transformation within studies, new devices getting injected in, study paradigms changing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just gonna, it's gonna be an iterative process. And, you know, as we get new devices that become more of the standard of care, we're gonna have to compare it against, you know, that new level. And so, I mean, I think this is probably not gonna be handled as much in randomized control trials, more in real world registry data as we get commercial devices that are on the market and we see how they respond, um, you know, kind of in a real world anatomy with different techniques that we're using to be able to use an individual device that maybe wasn't studied in the randomized control yeah. trial. So, I mean, I think it's just gonna keep evolving as we go and we get more devices commercially available to use. That's an excellent point. And I mean, I just think that this is like apples to oranges at this point. So we're really transforming how we view clinical trial development in this particular field, 
randomized control trials may not be you know, feasible or practical in any way. To transition to um, the great talk that was uh, made with regards to heart failure by Jennifer Kleiner, and then more towards a clinical cardiologist perspective, Matt Suffoletto, TR patients, how do we optimize their medical management and what exactly does that consist of? You wanna start? Well, so, you know, if they have a low EF, then it's easy, right? We just use the same guideline directed medical therapy that we have for patients, again, with mitral valve disease um, or isolated LV dysfunction. So what about isolated tricuspid regurgitation? Is there like a target dose of diuretic that you're gearing up to do? And I mean, obviously SGLT2 inhibitors and diastolic heart failure have been obviously, or hef, hef ref have been promulgated as a very promising therapy in these folks. I mean, are you trying to achieve the same targets? And what is your monitoring of a TR patient with right-sided heart failure? So we're trying to get them as close as we can to euvolemia, that is very difficult in this patient population. Um, so diuretics, we, you know, we use them aggressively. We use them at high doses. SGLT2 has been wonderful to supplement, um, you know, diuretics. Uh, I've been very impressed about the amount of diuretic effect from SGLT2. Um, we do not uptitrate those again, just the, the um, once a day dosing, but we have been successful in getting folks who's historically difficult to manage from a diuretic standpoint. Um, with a fine balance of SGLT2 and, and loop diuretic. Matt, any comments about that? Difficulties with this patient population? To, yeah, to, to jump in. Actually, one of the um, cases I showed, which was the ventricular functional TR in my talk, where we saw these, uh, these apically tethered tricuspid leaflets with a very uh, wide jet big gap. So that patient was an inpatient at the time. After those images were taken, she uh, underwent inotrope facilitated diuresis. She left the hospital on SGLT2 inhibitors, somewhat heroic doses of Bumex three times a day. And she came back to see me in office and she said, I haven't felt this good in a while. She had no edema, stable kidney function, stable potassium level, and, and really was a, you know, I wouldn't say asymptomatic, but, but her symptomatology improved that I then kicked her back because we were bringing her in to screen her for trilumin. And I said, listen, she's doing really well. And, and, and uh, actually my partner Bill did a, a TE on her and we can see that her leaflets are now co-opting. They're, yeah. they're apically tethered. So we definitely impacted the degree of TR and how she felt and the anatomic position of her leaflets. So, you know, in fact, we, you know, we, we have her kind of on, on in a, it, orbiting now as far as do we try and enroll her to continue to access or, or not. So that was a really gratifying case. And that's how we approach that. Excellent example as to what can be achieved with medical therapy in this population. Turn over to the surgeons with regards to durability. So what do we know about mitral valve repair durability, tricuspid valve repair durability, and do you think that there's a role of percutaneous therapy versus surgery trials in assessing that further? I mean, if you look at, you know, I mean, the outcomes that uh, Dr. Bonatti, uh, you know, showed, I mean, your mortality with mitral valve, you know, repair, surgical, open surgical versus mitral, I mean, it's just, it's a decimal point of percentage. And, you know, mitral valve repair, I mean, they're durable. And mitral valve replacement, no different than really any of the tissue valves that, uh, you know, the uh, percutaneous valve would be. And so, you know, I, I think uh, definitely whether it's tricuspid, you know, or mitral valve repair using uh, clips, I think they need to be compared to surgical outcomes. Uh, you know, otherwise it's, uh, you know, comparing apples to oranges. Any other comments about what we know about durability in the surgery or surgical arena? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, what we cannot uh, deny is uh, a, you know, long-term freedom from uh, reoperation, you know, in the 95, 90% range. So we have to prepare the patients for a reintervention, reoperation in the range of 5, 10% over the coming years. What we also know is if the uh, repair is good uh, right after surgery, it will hold. So that's where we are. Excellent. Final okay. comment, Sabrina? One, one quick comment I want to make is uh, the mitral space is very exciting because whenever I get a referral for MAT, for rheumatic mitral disease, it, it's one of the most treacherous, technically complicated operations that I face. So, so I, I welcome, you know, the development of transcatheter mitral valve replacement. That's what's really going to benefit for a lot of these patients because 
the technical challenge of these type of operations is extremely difficult. We have several patients at the VA right now that we're sort of struggling. Um, another comment I have about optimizing patient re revived ventricular failure and TR, is that, that's one reason why the SAS database has the highest mortality for TBR, because I, I, think, I think many of us, including senior surgeons, do not know how to manage post-op tricuspid valve surgery as well. They go into RV failure. It's just the nuance of RV failure is really tricky. So I yeah. think that's, that's what is important for us as surgeons to collaborate with cardiologists before the operation, during the case, and afterwards to really get these patients through. So that's- That's excellent. That's an excellent uh, pointer. You know, I mean, some of the uh, adverse outcomes that we've seen with concomitant tricuspid valve surgery in the setting of other valve slash revascularization surgeries probably explained by that inadequate medical management, perioperative management. Uh, what we ho hope, of course, for is uh, that our repair failures can be treated percutaneously. How is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and we have, we have, uh, and uh, Bill Katz has put together a nice paper of the number of the patients we've seen that have had um, failures of uh, of repairs, and we've. Um, it, they're, they're more challenging patients. Thankfully, we have a variety of clips that are enabled us to do it. We've successfully been able to clip them without the development of that mitral stenosis that you can see that we know is has adverse effects. So it's a case by case basis, but uh, that it, it, it's I think a nice option, um, especially for some of these patients where a redo is a really um, would be a really challenging um, situation. It's great not to cut off the discussion, but we do have to move on. This has been a really great section. Appreciate all of the great content and appreciate this very lively discussion. So we'll turn it over to the uh, panel for the moderated live case uh, that uh, we did actually at our institution. And so we'll invite uh, Sandeep Jain, Dustin Kleiner, Amber McConney, and Matt Suffolletter to stay. Uh, and I will show the case that we did. So this is not more of a voiceover thing that we did initially. We're trying to experiment with different formats. Uh, this one is kind of like a pre-recorded thing that I did, and then we'll have time, I think, at the end for, for comments. Um, but I'll go ahead and share that case now. Sorry, I've been told that you can't hear. I got to work on that. Yes, when okay. you go to share your screen, make sure you select yep. the share system audio. All right, let me do that. Uh, so sorry, I'm just do a new share here and share sound. Easy enough. All right, I'll just uh, go ahead and uh, start that again. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Hamil Gata uh, presenting a uh, amulet left atrial appendage occlusion case that we did recently. Uh, I am joined by my colleague in the case, Dr. Roberto Hodaro, who would be handling the TE imaging. So the Amplatzer Amulet is a left atrial appendage occluder that's been out in the commercial market uh, for a couple of years now. Uh, the disc at the very end of that device is designed to completely seal the left atrial appendage at its orifice. It's a disc, disc and lobe or a disc and hub model. Uh, the lobe itself is what provides the radial force to really bind to the appendage. Um, it has stabling wi stabilizing wires, which engage with the wall of the left atrial appendage to help hold the device in place. And then this waist that really maintains this uh, distance and tension between the lobe and disc and this flexible connection allows the device to self-orient, as we'll hopefully see in our case. Uh, the Amulet IDE trial was completed, and that led to commercialization of this device. Um, this is a very busy slide, but in general, uh, about 2,000 patients were randomized in one-to-one -one fashion between the amulet and the watchman device. And you see that it was really non-inferior at um, all the hard endpoints that were studied with regards to watchman. So our case is a 70-year-old gentleman with proximal non-valvular atrial fibrillation. He's had a history of supraventricular tachycardia that was status post-ablation. He has an existing iatrogenic ASD that is mid and anterior, as we will see. 
uh, history of congestive heart failure, hypertension, multiple sclerosis with recurrent urinary tract infections and hematuria. He has stage 3 CKD. He had an acute subdural hematoma back in 2011, but did resume anticoagulation safely from that point. Um, because of all of this and really his recurrent hematuria that's required hospital stays, uh, he was deemed a suitable candidate with shared decision making for left atrial appendage occluder. So here's our baseline TE assessment marching through at zero degree, 45 degree, 90 degree, 135 degree. There is a very small wing, um, both anteriorly and a little bit of a pouching posteriorly as well, as far as this appendage is concerned. Um, there are some proximal trabeculae that we will hope to cover with this particular device and its two components. When we do our measurements, um, we measure a centimeter from the orifice down into what's called the landing zone for this particular device. And you can see that that measurement is 22 millimeters, 21 and a half millimeters, 16 millimeters, and 19 millimeters. And when we look at the way that sizing has worked for this device in the past, um, we really look at this uh, chart A here. And when we're in that ballpark of 19 to 22 millimeters, as far as our landing zone is concerned, we would be uh, behooved to move forward with a 25 millimeter device. Um, the table below is another analysis that was done using CT data. Clearly, we're using TE data here, so it's not at all pertinent. So really, our only access is going to be the eight and a half French uh, right femoral venous access that we use for the Bayless system. And then we're going to transition that to the 12 French Torque View 4545 that we're going to be using to deploy the 25 millimeter amulet. We will be using a C1 needle for this case, and uh, we will try to use the iatrogenic ASD and not really buzz across the septum, creating another hole. And we are going to be using a closure with a finger, figure of eight suture at the completion of the procedure. So uh, let's move on to the case. Uh, we did package it together with GHX Explorer Surgical, as you'll see. Thank you. Okay, great. Let me take the needle. Can we give heparin, please, Ed? Yeah. Thank you. There we go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, going in with the bailiff meal. Thank you. All right, so we'll aim for that iatrogenic ASD from the SVT ablation. Sit up here. Let me ask you a question. Uh, you're, you're doing TEE imaging pre, no CT imaging pre. What about a TE makes you pick one uh, commercially available device versus another? It's a great question. And so really, um, I think that the osseal nature of, of pectinate muscle clearance, the mitral valve is going to have you pick one versus the other. Those are the two that I really go for. And then, of course, some other dimensions that would be related to the appendage. You know, we're being about 60-40 CTTE at this point. This patient just happened to have a transesophageal echo, but would love your thoughts with regards to CT versus TE in, in assessing these patients. Yeah, true. Okay, good. All right, so we're through that previous ASD now, and then we'll take up our... I think it's an interesting paradigm with TEE, the slippery slope the is here, not obtaining up front TEE, the um, TEE on the table. 40, 40, 40, 40, 45, and those are the cases where I pick the, one manufacturer um, versus amulet. another one device versus another if you're simply looking at the TEE for sizing of the device you've already chosen. Um, and that, right, that's, that's helpful good. to have something up front and nice. not in there. study with the CT. Okay. Uh, if, you know, the sizing is set up and, and equally easy to do on each. I right, think yeah. Yep. I just uh, pan back to the septum. We'll cross the sheath through it. All right, good. That should be across now. Excellent. Yep. Awesome. Okay. So then let's go ahead and walk the dilator out. And then we'll take that um, copal. Yeah. And you can just put the copal on first. Sorry. Yeah, one, three, one, three. 
put it on here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Very good. And then we'll load the pigtail in. Let's go to a fluoro over the shoulder view here to open up the ostium of the appendage. So that'll just be like a roughly RAO 20 cranial 20 view. Let me know when you have wire. Got it? Hey, you take wire out. Yep. All right, here's our pig through the mitral valve. We're not doing that today. All right, so that in the appendage? Yep. yep. Sure. Wonderful. So we'll just walk our sheath right over there. So we typically don't do much in the way of contrast injection here, but we will for this procedure. Um, yep, I'll take contrast. And then we'll also take uh, an ACT syringe. ACT syringe. And uh, do it give me like uh, 20. Um, yeah, 20 full strength. Yeah, that would be fun. Yep, and that little recess, yeah. That would be great. Emil, I see that your imager there went to an X-plane modality, and I think that's really helpful. And this is okay. one of those areas where our, our interventionalists and, and our EP docs who may not pick up a TE probe in their life know this Here's view. Our EPC. It's always interesting when they say, you know, give me the X-plane. All right, we'll do a contract. Idea. Absolutely critical. Nice. All right, so it definitely lays out the um, ostium of the appendage quite well in this RAO cranial view. Um, the thing that we lack, obviously, is discrimination uh, anterior posterior. So we, we know that there's like an anterior wing component to this. Uh, but what we can make out really very nicely here is the ostium of the appendage uh, coming down to the contour of the left atrium. So this is a pretty good view. So we've already uh, examined our TE parameters uh, as we already walked through, and we're gonna pick a 25 millimeter device to deploy here. So we'll go ahead and take this all out. Come on, when the you went in, and the co you coming out, and what we'll do is kind of uh, plus here, plus what connection. Either way. I think either way. I mean, I think that the great thing about this particular device is yep, it, you don't quite know how it's gonna interact with the anatomy the until you get here. there, but there's a lot of flexibility as you'll see. So as we go to kind of the three components of deployment here, you'll see the immense flexibility that you have with this particular device and navigating within the within the appendage and then just defining where you're going to actually deploy the lobe versus the disc. Um, so we'll, we'll go through that in just a moment. There is a de-airing mechanism uh, that's very important here uh, with this device. Um, no, uh, not so much with Watchman Flex, so good. but with this, we do let the device back kind of chewy, lead back a little bit a nice before going ahead here. and inserting. And then we do a slow flush as we insert the device okay, in through the nice sheath. So we're coming up to the distal edge of the sheath right there. Good place to pause. I thought we could stop flushing and take the syringe off. I'll center the uh, fluoroscopic image here just for clarity, but we're in a good place here to unsheath the ball. So that's what we're going to do here. So I'm just going to go ahead and just fully unsheath. Push this forward just a touch. Yep. And now this is going to be our okay. ball right here. And this allows us to rotate. So you can see here that we're kind of outside the appendage a little bit, but hopefully just by counterclocking this thing, I get it to sit a little bit more into the appendage. And if I need to, I can just back this up just a touch. There it is, nice and free there. And you can see I've got like plenty of depth here to work with. So now I'm really nicely in the body of the appendage. And what we're looking for here is basically where we wanna go anterior or posterior and be able to torque this thing. Now you can see that there's kind of like a blunt end to this, a blunt end. So we don't really wanna lean forward on the device at this point. And so in order to create that safety profile, I'm gonna push out the triangle here. And so now that flattened the distal part of the device, 
And now I'm free to, to move the device in if I want to. And I will a little bit because I kind of want to anchor it right up against that pectinate. So right here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to push out to low. And that's lobe right there. So you can see that the device is nice and deformed here, actually, the lobe is. Uh, what I want to do is just maintain half of my device, at least half of my device, below the left circumflex. So Roberto, try to get the circum view. So it's, you see it right there in long axis. Very uh, nice, yeah. yeah. So you can see that like about 70, 80% of my device is below the left circ right now. Let's go back to a 45 degree view where we can clearly see the osteum a little bit more. Yeah, and you see the circumflex really nicely there and I'm really tucked in very nicely below the circumflex. And so the lobe is in decent position here. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna unsheath that disc. Um, and you can see again, the lobe is nicely deformed. So we'll pay attention to that. But I'm just gonna go ahead and unsheath the disc of the device here. And really, we want that to lay right over the cuminid ridge like that. And uh, we get decent separation between the lobe and the disc here, which is one of our uh, criteria that we're going to use to assess this device. So the device itself and placement looks good. We're well past the circumflex with the lobe. The disc is covering the ostium very nicely and completely. And so now what I'm going to do is a tug test by basically pulling on the disc of the device, creating like a football shape, and seeing if anything happens with the lobe. And I just basically hold here for about five seconds. And you can see here that the lobe is nice and stable and really anchored very nicely in the appendage. And so I'll go ahead and let that go right down to that. And then Roberto, why don't you just do a TE assessment here and um, we'll give a little bit more contrast actually just to look, but yeah, we'll take another 20 yeah. Sure, we can put color here. Yeah, Roberto, just, just talk through what you uh, are. Yeah, right now we, we're just uh, putting color. It's important to drop the color scale uh, to 35, 38 uh, to make sure we detect uh, any low, uh, low velocity flows. And this looks well sealed. We see pulmonary flow there, but not flow through the device or through the. Uh, and we'll do that in all angles. So we go 0, 45. Again, it looks here that there is no flow to the device, uh, very device flow, 90 degrees. The device looks well positioned, as we said, below the circumflex, and then 135. So this looks like a, a good position. I don't see any evidence of, of device flow here. Excellent. All right, so just for instructional purposes, we'll take another contrast shot here in that same um, over the shoulder fluoroscopic view. Again, we'll be able to see like the true ostium of the appendage. And the great thing about this device is that that disc is really going to hug the ostium with no protrusion into the left atrium, as you see right there. So really just complete coverage of the ostium of the LAA. Uh, you can see the nice separation between the lobe and the disc. And uh, this looks really good. So we'll, we'll go for release. Now, the release here is very akin to um, ASD PFO devices made by Abbott. And so basically what we're gonna do is just counterclock the, uh, the cord um, that, that is basically attaching the device right now, just counterclocking and that's it. So Roberto, why don't you take another look? Sure. Let's put color here again. I'll take the figure of eight. And we're gonna go again. And this view, and again, this is a, a very critical view, the 135 view, and I think there is some gutter flow there, but there's no flow through the device, as you can see on this view. Uh, I don't see any flow getting inside the appendage there. We can also do a color off, and we can do a 3D view here, so we can do a, an assessment on 3D. Can we get 50 apronamine, please? Thank you. Good. And we can put color here again. Uh, it looks very good here on this one. And we look at the intraceptum. We, we went through the 
previous so hemolytic morphology so works out really well for here. amulet here with the, the wing. So, Roberto, what's, after you do that, just show the what's your anticoagulation the plan? You've got a really good skill here. Is this yeah. a DAP patient? Is this a, a DOAC patient? So another, you know, kind of for us, this would be DAP for a month, but, or sorry, um, for, yeah, for about a month, actually. As well what about as for you? What would you be doing? And we definitely don't want the disc to interact uh, in any meaningful way. Uh, I think a lot of times, structures. And you can see just here depends that we're on what they may have come in on, if they've been tolerating uh, yeah. the black or the disc, I'll continue uh, it for the six weeks or two months yeah, until the, the, the follow-up team. And and if they've been on nothing because it's no been prohibitive. All right, perfect. And then the other uh, thing, uh, obviously, we've done for, given the clinical trial data, is the presence of a pericardial fusion. Um, and we typically do get transthoracic echoes routinely on these patients later on in the day. But as you see here, uh, there's no evidence of the fusion um, after the deployment. Yeah. And we'll do Are that you sending these patients well on the same day? Sure. No. Um, so let me just, uh, yep, I think we're done with that. So yeah, I think that uh, the whole thing about this particular patient population right now is it is still coded you know, underneath an inpatient DRG. So we are still keeping these folks overnight. Um, I think that in, in the COVID era or the peak of it, uh, we were putting that little uh, remind or that little note in the chart indicating that in the COVID era, you know, we are trying to move these patients out quicker just for bed capacity issues and whatnot. Um, but right now we, we are keeping these folks overnight. We have a couple of minutes uh, for discussion here. So, um, I, Sandeep, Dustin, Matt, Amber, any comments about the device selection here, the deployment, and 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 kind of your insights onto left atrial appendage occlusion in general? I mean, I'll just start. You, you had a great result. Back to Dustin's original point of how do you choose up front? I think ideally down the road, this should be the type of thing that we can choose on the fly. That that you you uh, because I've at least gone away from routine CT because I don't think the measurements are helping me much. I, I'm relying on the TE more and more on my angiogram if I need it, and. I think 90%, 95%, we can treat with either device. We just need to decide over time which one is, is going to serve us better. Uh, one question I'll, I'll leave with uh, for you, though, is how often have you run into um, any issues with the disc and the mitral apparatus? So it's always there in theory. We're almost never looking at that number. We're sizing everything on the lobe. I've never seen it where it's gotten too big, but at least in theory, we start discussing it. Have you had that? Yeah, I, I guess I try to screen those out, right? And so like, you know, because we have both devices and we're kind of a splitter account, those are the devices that I mean, those are the cases where we are getting the pre-imaging up front. And on CT and TE, I can be pretty kind of methodical about understanding what my clearance is. And so if it's not like five millimeters, then I definitely pause. And there are some minority of cases where I can just do a measurement quick from that inferior board of the appendage down to the mitral valve annulus. And if it's ringing up five, seven millimeters, I kind of shy away from an amulet in those cases. But I personally have not seen any disc interaction with the mitral valve. So as somebody relatively new in the space, let me ask this question. Uh, going back to my pre-procedure planning with imaging, if it's not an imaging criteria that you're looking for and you have a very broad size range and the success rates in the trials as or they are, what is not a flex case, right? I mean, what, why, why do yeah. you need a second device? What is not yeah. a first device? I'd say, I'd say broadly speaking, so what I do look for now in a little bit more nuanced way is osteopectinate, right? So complexity that's more proximal in the left atrial appendage contour, that's gonna shy me away from flex because I'll either end up with a large shoulder or I won't cover something, or in some cases, both. And I think it, you'll be surprised how many anatomies, if you do pre-screen, you'll find like that. And those definitely swim you towards amulet. I think the other case, large funnel shaped appendages where you're gonna end up probably placing a Washman device deep, and then you worry about these caked on DVTs, uh, DRTs. Uh, we, you know, we've had a couple where they were failed on Watchman 2.5 that you can come back and very smoothly do, a, do, a, do an amulet. Yeah, and I think the procedural planning here is key. And so, uh, you know, understanding that measurement that you would make kind of interprocedurally a centimeter down, choosing the right device size, which obviously gained with experience, I think this is as efficient as a flex procedure 
um, you know, most of the time. And I haven't, I haven't encountered any inefficiencies because of bringing amulet in to be a sizable percentage of our left atrial appendage occlusions. Um, well, last year, when I had spent some time with you, you were starting to incorporate intracardiac echo uh, yep. in watchman placement. Do you feel like there's a future for that with amulet or is it too nuanced for that? No, I think that there's a future there also, Amber. I think that right now, I mean, obviously it's just economically prohibited for us to be throwing it out there for every single case. Our shop runs pretty efficiently with the TEE algorithm that we've employed um, or, or use, utilization of TE. Like we're able to you know, crank out seven cases and be done usually by about 2, 33 o'clock in the one room. And so, you know, I think the, the procedural planning up front matters, um, you know, having a really great team to turn over the room matters. Uh, but I do see ICE as being, you know, obviously a future component that we'd like to employ. Uh, it's just economically prohibitive right now, given the margins that we have on this device. Excellent. Thought, oh, yeah. I thought that the, the, the way that the disc sat in that case was really, really nice. And sometimes we haven't quite achieved that. We have this kind of radar dish type look. And, and I'd like to think of probably that the effort you took at the beginning of the case to really tuck your ball underneath that pectinate, really get a yeah. deep, you make sure you had, you know, what you estimated, I think 78% of your device, the, 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 the cake part of the device below the, uh, the, the circumflex made a difference and it sat really beautifully. I was wondering, I was wondering how it was going to do with the mitral annulus uh, when the disc came out, but it looked good. You just, you just summarize the entire procedure, Matt. And I mean, that, that's really it. It's just really getting that ball to sit right where you want the lobe to end up. And then hopefully you don't get that kind of recoil out. And if you do trying to position the ball in a different, in different place, and, and that's kind of the nuance. Uh, that it takes to deploy this device, I think, uh, effectively. Uh, but I, we'll close this uh, this component of, of our uh, symposium. Uh, but just a couple minute break here and then go on to the most intriguing section, heart valve disease, what does the future look like? So thanks again, appreciate it.
Good. All right. Uh, thank you again uh, for stick, staying with us today. Uh, excellent discussion so far. We'll meet, move right on to the next session. Uh, home stretch for us. So the next session is entitled Heart Valve Disease. Uh, what does the future look like? Uh, part of this is what we think uh, future heart valve therapies will look like. Uh, part of this is a little bit of potpourri of heart valve disease. Uh, and really the third aspect of this is we couldn't figure out where to fit this in the first or the second session. So our first speaker is also our Twitter czar, as I refer to him, Dr. Josh Levinson, uh, who is an imaging expert and a cardiologist with the Heart Vascular Institute. He's one of the directors of the Echo Labs, uh, is the director of cardio oncology and one of the associate program directors for the cardiology fellowship. So thank you, Josh. Thank you, Ebes, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak. I wanted to spend... Uh, the next five to 10 minutes really asking the question of whether we should be treating, meaning intervening on moderate aortic stenosis. And he gave me the title, what are we waiting for? And the, let's see if I can move forward. Here we go. So the philosophical question again is how should we define severe aortic stenosis? And I think you will be able to think about this topic a little bit if we take this null hypothesis question. Here we go with my slides. Thank you. There we go. Go back. So the null hypothesis here is that severe aortic stenosis has been traditionally defined correctly as an aortic valve area less than one centimeter squared and a mean gradient by uh, echo uh, as more than 40 millimeters of mercury. And that these are the right patients who should be getting an aortic valve intervention just before or right as they are getting uh, symptoms for the, from their valve with the idea being that historically, our traditional paradigm has been we have valve degeneration and we have asymptomatic uh, stenosis, which becomes severe, followed by symptomatic severe stenosis with angina, heart failure symptoms, syncope, and if we don't intervene, death. The concept which we're all familiar with has been disease progression in the valve leaflet with uh, calcification, uh, and you could see a, a normal valve with mild uh, leaflet degeneration followed by moderate and then severe calcification. And ultimately, as there is more and more uh, calcification, uh, we have then limiting the ability of the valve to open. The traditional paradigm uh, dates all the way back to the 1960s from this classic, uh, really Kaplan-Meier curve, which we presume was from predominantly uh, bicuspid valves, although we don't truly know, but mortality from medically treated aortic stenosis was that of very limited uh, mortality until the very late stage. And then these patients would progress within two to five years of uh, severe symptoms followed by death. The question that I want everyone to think about is, how do we define aortic stenosis? And if we go back to the 1990s, looking back uh, data from Catherine Otto and her team, uh, looking at valve disease patients who did not have symptoms, uh, they did echocardiographic uh, evaluation and exercise predictors and followed them clinically. And what you'll notice, uh, which I think has really predominantly defined the way we define valve disease these days is that we can use echocardiography with a peak velocity, a continuous wave through the valve uh, to determine true uh, uh, risk of fatality and in need for intervention based on the peak velocity. And so this has been some of the predominant data showing that a peak velocity over four with correlates uh, mean uh, gradient over 40 uh, as having the worst prognosis. What's worth noting here is that the patients who had a peak velocity between three to four millimeters uh, meters per second 
were not free of disease. They have quite profound uh, uh, progression to events um, within several years, uh, which is very different than the patients who had a peak velocity less than three. And this variability in the rate of uh, AS progression, um, it was quite individualized. Here are just eight patients, and you can see some of these patients had marked uh, rate of progression, whereas some uh, stayed quite flat. And more recent data from Harlan Krumholtz's team uh, looked at large volumes of patients to say maybe we could use the rate of progression to determine uh, who is truly the highest risk and then identify those as those who would need to intervene. And you can see here, if we smooth out this individual data, we can see that some patients truly stay quite stable over many years and others progress very quickly. And the need to intervene on these patients uh, based on traditional criteria does uh, really have some prediction from uh, this progression. But the overall rate of death was actually very similar, suggesting that maybe this is the same phenotype going on uh, underneath all of this data. In addition, it's worth noting that the outcomes for these patients uh, in other cohorts really is predicted uh, based on the valve velocity. But if you notice, even in these patients with aortic valve disease from a large number of international clinics, there's not a freedom from uh, severe symptomatic uh, disease or death, uh, despite having a valve velocity less than four, suggesting that there may be severe pathology going on underneath all of this. And another nice long-term survival in patients with moderate aortic stenosis shows that these patients over five years have a quite high mortality despite having valve uh, gradients less than 40 millimeters of mercury. And as my uh, colleague, Dr. Kleiner always says, these are not necessarily patients who have low flow severe AS. There are patients out there in the world who have truly moderate aortic stenosis that uh, meet the traditional criteria. And despite that, you can see in the purple, they behave almost the same uh, long-term survival-wise as those who have a, a velocity over four. So this uh, makes me wonder, and I think others have as well, about whether we should be changing the way we define aortic stenosis. And a large group of uh, clinical registries have used a more novel staging criteria that suggests uh, we should not only be looking at the valve, but also at the myocardium, at the uh, phenotypes of the left atrium and the right heart, and ultimately right heart damage that can occur as a result of aortic stenosis. And here's uh, just this broad staging schema from zero to four, and multiple papers have shown that this independently predicts outcomes. So maybe we shouldn't be focusing on the valve and look at other criteria. Regardless, we know that novel imaging modalities can better define whether valves are truly calcified and uh, degenerative. Uh, CT has really helped us show this. I think you can see a, a nice cross section of a valve that has leaflet calcification. And here we see two different patients, one with mild aortic stenosis and one with severe based purely by aortic valve calcification, suggesting that maybe we should be using CT to define this. And I think multiple registries have shown that. And I think as we saw from Dr. St. Hilaire that we have an active process going on in these valves. And so maybe what we need to do is really look at imaging uh, from a different modality. The long story short is that we need to continue to find novel ways to find patients who uh, have valve disease uh, that needs to be intervened on. And if you look at the novel criteria that have evolved out of uh, the European guidelines, Traditionally, we would use a valve gradient over 40, a velocity over four, and an, uh, an AVA less than one. Uh, but in the 2017 guidelines, uh, we really uh, allowed for a little bit more stricter uh, approach. And to uh, qualify for time here, I'll just show that when we were a little bit stricter, we were able to declassify patients from severe AS to moderate AS uh, based on the 2017 guidelines. 
And the, uh, that actually took a large number of patients here, almost 25 to 30% were reclassified. Yet despite reclassifying those, uh, they did still uh, behave as if they had higher risk, saying maybe these are patients who really aren't moderate and need to intervene on. Uh, and for the sake of time, I'll say there are ways to risk stratify these patients, but it's leaving me wonder whether we should be treating these patients with moderate aortic stenosis. And the answer is we need data and we don't have a data set that I think answers this with a randomized trial. And so this is a plug that I don't have uh, a true financial bias in this, but I am inquisitive and wondering whether uh, these are the right patients we should be doing TAVR on. And this uh, trial, the PROGRESS trial, is going to answer that question um, nationwide. This is uh, actively randomizing, and we're excited to be part of that uh, trial here locally. And you can see we will be taking traditional moderate aortic stenosis patients and uh, randomizing them to, try, uh, to TAVR to see whether that this, these are the right patients who will benefit. Thank you all. Thanks, Josh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Agnes uh, Katsu. Uh, she's very kind to share with us some knowledge, what we need to know uh, regarding heart valve disease in pregnancy. Dr. Katsu is an assistant professor of medicine and division of cardiology and part of the Women's Health Program. Thank you so much, Agnes. Hi, thank you so much to the course directors today for inviting me to talk to you about valvular heart disease and pregnancy. All right. All right. Here's my brief outline for today. We'll talk about uh, physiologic changes in pregnancy, then we'll progress from the most well-tolerated right-sided regurgitant lesions, and then go on to the less well-tolerated left-sided obstructive valvular heart disease. We'll really briefly touch on considerations for interventions um, during pregnancy, and then we'll talk most importantly about where to refer your valvular heart disease patients. We'll embed this talk in a case, and we'll start with a 37-year-old um, patient who's at 27 weeks gestation. This is her first pregnancy. She has no known cardiac history. She had a murmur heard at her prenatal visit by an OB, so she had an echo obtained, and she was found to have severe pulmonic stenosis with a mean gradient of 77 millimeters of mercury. She had an estimated RVSP of 99 millimeters of mercury. Her RV was noted to be dilated with a flattened IV septum, and she was referred to the cardio OB clinic for recommendations for pregnancy and delivery. So let's progress to physiologic considerations in pregnancy. So from a hematologic perspective, really starting in the second trimester of pregnancy, we'll see about a 30 to 50% increase in cardiac output, which is really driven by an increase in plasma volume. There's uh, interestingly a drop in systemic vascular resistance, and there's a compensatory increase in heart rate um, that's really um, increases throughout pregnancy and really peaks right before delivery. And this really contributes to an increase in cardiac output as well. There's a number of different hematologic changes, which really um, culminate in a hemodilutional effect that we see as a relative anemia in these patients, and a number of different uh, hematologic changes that also result in a high risk of thrombosis that's realized really throughout pregnancy and all the way out to about 12 weeks postpartum. There's a number of different metabolic changes, including an increase in GFR that translates to a lot of renal clearance considerations when we think about medications, as well as some inconsistent hepatic clearance um, when we think about medication changes as well. So how does this all uh, impact physiologic changes with consideration of valvular heart disease? Well, really throughout pregnancy, we're expecting to see increased flow in gradients, um, really due to this increased cardiac output and somewhat due to this relative anemia that we see that starts in second trimester and really continues throughout um, peaking sort of at delivery. 
Um, what do we do to intervene on this? We try and um, control heart rate with medications and often give diuresis to these patients. There's an extreme predisposition to thrombosis that continues into the postpartum period, often due to increased coagulation factors. And we think a lot about anticoagulation for these patients. The nuances we sort of don't have time for in this talk. Um, and then there's an increased clearance to medications, often due to the increased GFR and some inconsistent hepatic clearance. And so oftentimes we'll take medications that we do daily and we'll increase those to BID. And we often monitor anti-XA for our anticoagulation. So let's move on to right-sided valve disease. So regarding tricuspid and pulmonic valve disease, so regurgitant lesions, we see tricuspid regurgitation extremely commonly in these women, and it's for the most part really well tolerated. For our patients that have a lot of issues with right-sided heart failure, we do prescribe diuretics. Furosemide um, is, we have the most safety um, information for. For obstructive lesions, we do see pulmonic stenosis more commonly than tricuspid stenosis. And for the most part, as you'll see in this case, even severe pulmonic stenosis is pretty well tolerated in pregnancy. We do do serial echoes. Again, we will see that um, gradient increase um, throughout pregnancy. We're really monitoring for right heart function in these patients. Um, we're also looking to see with serial clinic visits if they're symptomatic, and we will consider uh, balloon valvuloplasty for these patients. There's a number of different pregnancy risk scores that we use for these patients. The Zahara risk score um, particularly deals with valvular heart disease. As you'll see, I um, just starred two of the valvular heart disease pertaining risk scores, and you'll see that left-sided obstructive disease is denoted a much higher risk score than either right or left regurgitant um, valvular heart disease, which again is overall much well tolerated than obstructive valve disease. Regarding left-sided valvular heart disease, so looking at mitral or aortic valve disease, again, regurgitant, both mitral and aortic valve disease in general is really well tolerated, even at severe ranges. Um, things that we're dealing with symptomatically is really heart failure and in the left-sided valve disease, in particular, atrial arrhythmias. We treat these with metoprolol and labetalol if we need a little bit of blood pressure control with these patients as well. If we're dealing with atrial fibrillation, we'll often use digoxin or flecainide and sotalol. We try really hard just to avoid amiodarone in these patients. For obstructive valve disease, the most commonly in the aortic side, we'll see bicuspid aortic stenosis. A lot of times we'll see this de novo um, diagnosed in pregnancy, so we'll do an MRA on these patients often really looking for aortopathies and coarctation. I highlighted just the WHO pregnancy classification risk scoring system on the top right. As you'll see where I start off, some of the highest risk scores are for patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis, really not even the severity of bicuspid aortic stenosis, but if they have an aortic dilatation over 50 millimeters or severe native coarctation um, actually denotes them at the highest risk for pregnancy. So when I see a patient with bicuspid cuspid aortic stenosis, I'm actually thinking about what sort of riding with the bicuspid aortic stenosis, almost less so than how severe the bicuspid aortic stenosis is. Um, when I'm thinking symptomatically about these patients, um, you know, things that we're thinking about is treating the heart failure, arrhythmias, and oftentimes with severe classifications, we do see preterm birth and low birth weight that comes along with that. Mitral stenosis is definitely the most poorly tolerated uh, valvular heart disease for these patients, particularly with moderate or severe. Um, oftentimes, this is due to tachycardia, like we talked about in the physiologic section. Tachycardia starting in the second trimester and basically throughout pregnancy is just a physiologic manifestation of pregnancy. So oftentimes, we'll uh, AV node blockade with beta blockade um, these patients throughout pregnancy to kind of get them through symptomatically. We also see a lot of heart failure and preterm birth with these patients. So case continued regarding the severe pulmonic stenosis for this patient. We continued to assess her closely considering balloon valvulotomy for her, but she remained asymptomatic throughout pregnancy as often these patients, patients do. This is often a congenital heart disease that they've sort of uh, developed chronic manifestations um, 
for. Um, oftentimes we see preeclampsia develop in these patients for the end of pregnancy, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are um, realized uh, at a higher rate than the normal population in these pregnancies. Um, and so we do do induction of labor at 37 weeks for these pregnancies. We do recommend uh, vaginal delivery with assisted second stage. And basically that just means we um, recommend some assistance with active um, pushing and delivery of the child um, from the obstetric team. Oftentimes with um, relief of the IVC and with autotransfusion of um, delivery, there comes volume overload in the immediate postpartum settings. We do a lot of postpartum management with diuretics and blood pressure med titration of these patients. Interventions in pregnancy, extremely rare. If you look at the literature, there's just case reports for these um, patients, and we really only do in severely symptomatic refractory NYJ class three and four heart failure, um, but um, theoretically pretty safe. Uh, the radiation dosing just shouldn't exceed 50 milligrams. Um, some of the recommendations are for abdominal shielding, though technically um, there's concern that actually that will contain a lot of the internal scatter in the abdomen. Um, they recommend safe cath techniques, collimation, avoiding uh, angulated views, fluorosave, et cetera, and waiting till gestational age exceeds organogenesis and neurono stem cell development post 14 weeks. If you're interested in a deep dive in catheter based interventions, during pregnancy, one of our own, Malama Contoras, is hosting a multidisciplinary talk on this next week. Um, feel free to go to the ACC site and register for that with the QR code. And perhaps most importantly, where to refer your patients. We have a high-risk cardio OB program at the McGee Heart Clinic. This is our direct line. Extension Zero will get us to your front desk. Feel free to epic message or email us if you have a patient that's pregnant with valve disease. If it's urgent um, and you have a burning question, feel free to call or text us. We're always available to talk about your patient care needs. We meet monthly and have a multidisciplinary clinic to talk about high-risk patients. We meet with MFM, that's the high-risk OBs, ACHD, anesthesia, family planning, and we basically talk to them on a daily basis about all these patients. So and that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agnes. That was very illuminating, and and I really think we have such a robust uh, cardiopstetrics program. We're we're very fortunate at UPMC. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Bill Cass, the director of one of the directors of our Echo Lab Senior uh, Structural uh, Imager, who has taught us a lot uh, locally and uh, is about to teach you a lot with respect to referral for valvular heart disease. Should we lower the threshold? Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, when I was putting together this talk, I came up with some things to think about. Is the natural history of valvular heart disease to inevitably worsen over time? Are there identifiable and modifiable risk factors that we should be thinking about? And ultimately, can interventions used for the asymptomatic patient change the course of the disease and either improve quality of life or prognosis? Here's the outline that I'm going to follow, a little bit about prevalence, evaluation staging, and a couple of cases. Um, valvular heart disease, as we know, increases with age. By the time you get into your 70s, it's about 15% of the population with moderate or severe aortic valve disease. And this carries uh, prognostic implications, uh, those with and without valve disease, with valve disease, lower mortality or higher mortality and morbidity. And why is this? Well, valvular heart disease leads to ventricular failure, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation. So I think besides just thinking about the valve, we, we need to be thinking about these other things and intervene before we get to these complications. What does aortic stenosis do? It's an afterload problem. We, we see a ventricle gets very thick with small cavity. Uh, this is from the Laplace relationship. And as uh, Dr. Levinson showed us, once we get symptoms, prognosis gets worse. But you know what? This curve starts going down even before you get symptoms. And why is that? Um, there's an asymptomatic stage. And 
we looked at uh, velocities as a predictor, even less than four meters on the right-hand side uh, showed poor prognosis, but with valve replacement, we, we get back on the, the curve. Well, one thing about these lower velocity patients is we, we have to wonder, are they truly asymptomatic? Were their Doppler measurements actually done adequately? There's a entity we're all getting familiar with, low flow, low gradient AS. This wasn't really recognized based when we, these studies were presented. So maybe we should be th thinking about an earlier threshold for treating. And I wanna go a little bit into the role of imaging. Um, I just popped up a little image of a strain uh, for somebody with low flow, low gradient AS. And this strain was abnormal, despite the patient being asymptomatic. What about volume overload? Well, we can use mitral regurg as a uh, model. Um, leads to LV dilatation, which in turn leads to left atrial enlargement, pulmonary hypertension. And if you wait too long, you're gonna not get recovery of LV function if you do an intervention. So we have to be thinking earlier. What are the resources that we have? Starts with our primary care physicians, primary cardiologists, having expert imaging and imagers, uh, ultimately a multidisciplinary heart team. And we have a lot of guidelines that can help us decide where to go. Uh, the guidelines, um, are evidence-based. And one, one thing that I took away from preparation from this is that we, we always talk about GDMT. Well, in this, um, the M is not medical, although it includes that, it's the management. So GDMT is management. So what, what does this uh, lead us to? Clinical evaluation, diagnosis, medical therapy, and procedural treatments. With the goal to improve symptoms and prolong survival, and trying to avoid irreversible LV dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, and atrial fibrillation. So how do we evaluate the patients? Patients may present with symptoms, or they may have a heart murmur, or it may be a totally incidental finding on an non-invasive test. These patients, to start off, should have a meticulous history and exam, EKG for heart rhythm, chest X-ray, and a comprehensive transthoracic echo. The echo should include obviously looking at the valve and being very accurate with your quantitation for the stenosis and severity, looking at the LV size and function, looking at things like volume index, stroke volume index, global longitudinal strain, associated abnormalities, LA, LA size by volume index, not AP diameter, sending aorta, PA pressures, other valves, and have the ability to compare to prior studies. The, the lab has to be a high quality lab. Uh, valvular heart disease can be staged and uh, basically asymptomatic, A, B, and C, or symptomatic, stage D. Now A basically is your uh, mild, B, moderate disease, C, severe disease, but asymptomatic. And they break, it, they break it down into C1 with normal LV function and C2 with abnormal LV function. Finally, D, symptomatic. Um, and, you know, echo is our non-invasive way to follow these patients. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, every six months to every year, um, other modalities that we have. TE, very important, especially now that we have 3D for valve imaging. CMR for a lot of the things that the echo does, but also look at the myocardium for fibrosis. Very importantly, stress testing can give us an, an objective measure of whether somebody's really symptomatic or not. So why do we do exercise testing? Again, to uncover whether somebody's symptomatic and um, we look primarily at their exercise capacity, blood pressure response. These potentially are high risk procedures, so they need to be very carefully done. And if you add echo to it, you can also look at the valve response to exercise, the ventricular response, the hemodynamics, and this may assist you in your management. So let's take a case here. 
um, 62 year old woman with known MVP, last echo four years ago. She has some mild dyspnea on exertion, no other symptoms. She's sedentary, non smoker. She has a little bit of ankle edema. Echo was done at the primary care office that said LV size and function normal, posterior MVP with mild to moderate MR, normal left atrial size by AP diameter, normal PA pressure, EKG, some PVCs. If you classified this mitral regurg, you'd say stage B. The PCP though was a little bit nervous and said, um, surgery may ultimately be required at some point. That is a possibility, but we want to have the experts on board before that is an emergent situation and with heart failure. Never want to say, I wish we looked into this more previously. So the patient was referred and on presentation was hypertensive on no meds, a little bit overweight, BMI 30, had a mid systolic click and an increased P2, suggesting some pulmonary hypertension. The outside echo images were reviewed to make sure that it was interpreted correctly, and we, we didn't think it was. So now we had some questions. Was this patient really actually symptomatic? Maybe this MR is more severe than we think. What stage is she, B, C, or D? So we did a treadmill test, and she only went four minutes Bruce protocol, which is abnormal. She had dyspnea. Her baseline echo showed left atrial enlargement, pulmonary hypertension, her, her exercise test, not, nothing that came from that to show ischemia. So now we're thinking maybe she's stage D, symptomatic with severe MR. We started some blood pressure medicines and uh, for primary MR, some other things you look at for staging is whether the left atrium's big, whether you have pulmonary hypertension. So we went on, did a TEE, she has a very severe posterior leaflet prolapse with severe regurgitation. This was done on blood pressure medications with quantitation. And we felt this was something that needed to be intervened on. So we sent her to Dr. Bonatti who did a very nice mitral repair. So we, we have the guidelines, we have these flow diagrams. For this patient, she was stage D. Uh, on the left-hand side, so she should go for mitral surgery. Or maybe you might argue, well, she was not medically management, a little overweight, maybe she wasn't really that symptomatic from the valve. But even with that, this was a repairable valve. So uh, the dotted line uh, flow could also apply to her. So let me show you uh, one other quick case. Uh, patient, nursing student at Pitt who had Cardiac arrest, resuscitated with an AED. Her echo showed she has mitral valve prolapse, which she didn't know she had, with mitral annular disjunction. Um, this is a not an insignificant problem. Uh, arrhythmic mitral valve prolapse and sudden death. What do we do about it? Well, we had this patient get an MRI that showed late gadolinium enhancement of her posterior base related to this mitral valve disease. How do you stage somebody like this? Where, where do they fit into the guidelines? They don't really. This is how this patient presented. Uh, she received an AICD and is now being followed in our heart team clinic. And also there was just recently a law passed in Congress to support valvular heart disease uh, research. And this comes from a congressman <clears throat> uh, who lost his wife from Sudden death. Okay. Um, to finish up, some final words from Ben Franklin. An ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. So again, we gotta be thinking earlier. And uh, also Thomas Edison said, the doctor of the future will give no medicines, but will assist in patients in the cure of the human frame and diet and the cause of prevention of disease. We probably don't hope this is true. Otherwise we won't be here doing, talking about all the things we're talking about. Um, so in summary, um, our goals intervene before ventricular failure, pulmonary hypertension, AFib. GDMT includes the management, not just medicines. We, we need to identify who's truly asymptomatic. And um, thank, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bill. 
Thanks, Bill. That was great. Uh, please. Um, next up is Brian Goldstein, uh, who will talk to us about transcatheter pulmonary valve replacements in adults with congenital heart disease. Uh, this is uh, occasionally, even though the tricuspid valve is famous for this, this tends to be the forgotten valve in adult uh, symposia. So, so, Brian, please refresh your memory. Great. Thanks very much uh, for the invitation uh, uh, from you, Eves, and the other uh, program leaders. Uh, it's really an honor to be here at this uh, really important symposium today. Um, I do have some disclosures. I think most importantly, uh, we'll focus on patients with congenital heart disease, which is a, a little unusual, but I think important. Uh, as many folks in the room will interact with these patients uh, rarely, but at times, uh, and uh, knowledge and access to folks with more knowledge will be uh, helpful. So it's worth a, a brief refresher on the history of transcatheter valve replacement. This is Philippe Bonhoeffer, who in Paris in the year 2000 implanted the first successful transcatheter heart valve, which was a pulmonary valve in a child with congenital heart disease. It wasn't for two more years that Alain Cribier implanted the first transcatheter aortic valve successfully uh, in the same institution. So if one evaluates uh, patients with congenital heart disease, what's clear is that survival has uh, increased dramatically over the last several decades, such that now adults represent two thirds of those patients living with congenital heart disease. So this population is really quite important to understand. Um, and although survival has improved, morbidity is quite impressive. Uh, a third of patients over a one-year span uh, with severe congenital heart disease will be hospitalized from these data out of Quebec, and 20% of patients with mild or moderate forms of congenital heart disease will be hospitalized in a one-year span. That's a high incidence. Um, Tetralogy fallow, which is one of the more common forms of congenital heart disease and something we'll be focusing on today, um, has low mortality over the first two decades of life, but the hazard of mortality increases substantially into the third decade. Uh, and if one evaluates uh, tetralogy flow versus other forms of congenital heart disease, the median survival is less than 40 years of age. That's impressive. So why does this happen? Uh, if we start at time zero, which is transing or patch repair of tetralogy, the most common uh, type of repair, this happens early in childhood. And with VSD closure and the transannular patch placement, there is the development of right bundle branch block and an increase in the QRS duration. There's also the presence of pulmonary insufficiency. Over the first two decades with progressive pulmonary insufficiency and the resultant dilation of the right ventricle, there is further increase in the duration of the QRS complex. At about 180 milliseconds, there's a significant increase in the risk of ventricular tachycardia and sudden cardiac death. If we overlay the survival curve of tetralogy, it becomes clear what ma the manifestation of sudden death is really all about the underlying physiology and its progression over the first couple of decades. Moreover, in addition to the QRS changes, there's substantial right and left ventricular interdependence such that LV function reduces substantially with RV dilation. Tetralogy is not the only form of right ventricular outflow tract dysfunction in congenital heart disease. There's other patients too, such as those with valvar pulmonary stenosis, truncus arteriosus, the Ross procedure, after aortic valve disease, both congenital and acquired, double outlet right ventricle, and many additional uh, rarer forms of congenital heart disease. The timing of pulmonary valve replacement ultimately is critical to best outcomes, just like we've heard in, in mitral valve disease and aortic valve disease. And, and our indications, our guidelines are really. Um, problematically varied substantially across the different uh, societies, both in the U.S. Uh, and beyond. So uh, we need to understand not only when to do this, but what we can do. I want to focus now on the current state of transcatheter approaches to pulmonary valve replacement. About 20 to 25 percent of patients with congenital heart disease have anomalies affecting the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, those to the right of this line are, are the minority and re are repaired with RV to pulmonary artery connections to grafts conduits. Um, these patients typically manifest with conduit dysfunction in the form of uh, either stenosis or mixed stenosis and regurgitation. They represent about 15% of patients are managed with balloon expandable transcatheter pulmonary valve technology. The brief case to show a patient who has complex conduit obstruction with both involvement of the distal conduit and proximal bilateral branch pulmonary arteries, as well as proximal RV to PA and anastomosis uh, conduit obstruction. 
This patient was managed with placement of a unilateral pulmonary artery stent, a dilation through the side cells of that stent to open up a connection to the contralateral pulmonary artery second stent placement to form a bifurcation stent, treating the distal conduit and PA stenosis. And at that point, a uh, pulmonary valve was able to be placed proximally in the proximal obstruction, thereby relieving obstruction proximally and distally and restoring uh, pulmonary valve competency. We've learned other things with balloon expandable technology. Uh, frame fracture, as uh, is well known in the aortic world, uh, frame fracture facilitates the implantation of a larger transcatheter valve and valve implant. We've also learned that moderate or severe tricuspid valve insufficiency does not need to be managed surgically. Simply replacing the pulmonary valve in a transcatheter approach will improve the TR uh, grade by at least one, if not two, uh, scores in both patients with moderate and severe uh, tricuspid insufficiency. And the outcomes uh, laid after transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement in these balloon expandable constructs are quite good. 72% of patients are uh, alive uh, at 10 years of age without explant uh, or reintervention. On the left half of this uh, uh, diagram is what's really changed in the last couple of years. These are patients typically with tetralogy of Fallot who have pulmonary insufficiency uh, and represent the majority of patients with RV alpha tract dysfunction. And the challenge for both academics and industry partners is managing the very heterogeneous uh, anatomical subtypes of RV alpha tract dysfunction after early surgery. Uh, in 2001, uh, we really heralded sort of the new era for us in transcatheter technology uh, with the Medtronic's uh, Harmony transcatheter pulmonary valve and Edwards Altera adaptive pre-stent mated with a standard Sapien 3 valve uh, being cleared by FDA. Uh, so I'm going to show a couple of case examples. This is a patient who underwent Harmony transcatheter pulmonary valve placement, a 24-year-old who had a freely leaky pulmonary valve with the dilation of the right ventricle and symptoms. And here you can see the fit analysis provided by the uh, company uh, demonstrating the relationship between the patient-specific anatomy and the valve. Uh, here is an overlay of what they think it may look like. And here is the uh, invasive angiography before and then after pulmonary valve replacement, these are pretty quick procedures under an hour now uh, to achieve a pulmonary valve replacement. And this is a nice landing zone for future balloon expandable transcatheter valves when this prosthesis fails. Now, this is six months later showing a, a remodeling of the right ventricle with uh, no pulmonary insufficiency or stenosis. Case from the Edwards Altera adaptive pre-stent in Sapien 3 is a 56-year-old uh, male with tetralogy who had stage repair as a severe pulmonary insufficiency and RV dilation, who's symptom, uh, symptomatic. This is a baseline angiogram showing the pulmonary insufficiency in the complex PA anatomy. After placement of the Altera adaptive pre-stent, you can see an unobstructed pulmonary alpha tract, but no valve competency. And then following deployment of a balloon expandable Sapien 3 valve inside of the Altera adaptive pre-stent, there is now restoration of pulmonary valve competency uh, without issues. The midterm outcome of these valves are still uh, pretty new. These are just 20 patients here in the very early uh, feasibility study showing that at five years, the valve works uh, excellent without uh, insufficiency or obstruction. And here at one year in a larger population of patients who so underwent valve placement with either the smaller or larger harmony prosthesis, greater than 90% freedom from PR, PS, or reintervention. Early outcomes from Altera and Sapien 3 are also quite good, although the population of patients studied is limited to these 15 patients that are in the literature. There's been nearly 1,000 implants uh, in the uh, native RV alpha tract in the two years since commercial approval of these valves across the world. Uh, we had the opportunity to be a part of the very early experience being the second commercial site launch for both uh, products. And here's our experience, which is uh, 52 patients who were referred for evaluation 36 patients were treated with Harmony, six patients with the Altera product, three un were, under, were able to undergo blood expandable approach, and seven were referred to surgery. And this yielded a, a number that was pretty good. 87% of patients referred were able to be treated with a transcatheter approach and were able to avoid cardiac surgery. But in the absence of a mandated registry, we await large-scale outcomes data. This is being worked on actively, and indications for pulmonary valve replacement need to really catch up with clinical practice. So how do we best care for ACHDK patients with RV alpha tract dysfunction? I think it's important to recognize that survival is improved with ACHD referral center care. Only about 40% of congenital heart patients remain in congenital cardiac care by the age 18 to 22. This is a real problem for our field. And more than 50% of ACHD patients have a lapse in care of more than 10 years, which was associated with an eightfold greater need for an urgent intervention upon presentation. 
So my sense is it's critical to partner with a team-based multidisciplinary accredited ACHD program to facilitate easy transition from pediatric cardiology care, as well as referral from general cardiology to promote lifelong congenital heart disease care. This is just a plug for our team, Arvind Hoskapel in the center here, leads, leads this group of three uh, uh, physicians who are all outstanding and there's their email address to get patients plugged into, uh, into the care they need. Thank you so very much, I appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Two things I got from that. Obviously, it's very humbling to see how poor the outcomes are for ACHD patients when they're not taken care of by the team. Uh, more importantly, it's clear that the adult interventional cardiologists tend to steal the spotlight from pediatric interventional cardiologists based on the Alan Cribbia story. So, uh, next up is Dr. Jackie Kreuzer. This is a very special lecture, and this is really our keynote lecture. Jackie is a professor and chief for pediatric cardiology. Uh, I've heard about this talk from no less than 20 people. Uh, which was given at the ACC, so I'm pretty excited. So thank you so much, Jackie. Thank you so much, Yves, and thanks for the organizers. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you guys today. And um, I, um, yeah, although the subject of this session, this part of the session is the future, I'm going to take you actually very, very much to the past. And um, um, so um, what I'll try to do is I'll go over the history, of, of the contributions of the very early pioneers, in the field of congenital cardiology, the women pioneers, um, touch uh, also on the changing role of uh, women in cardiology over time and some of the diversity of the pediatric cardiology workforce and compare that with adult cardiology. I tried to find a good cartoon of the evolution of the cardiologist over time, and I came across this one that I thought was interesting. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so take, um, cardiology has been traditionally been a very male-dominated specialty, and even pediatric cardiology as well. But it is ironic that pediatric cardiology actually started primarily as a result of pioneer work of extraordinary women that I'm going to uh, refer you to. So we're going to go back really, really early. We only have the stethoscope and the EKG, and penicillin hadn't even been discovered, and pediatric cardiology started as the study of heart specimens um, really teratology. And that's when Maud Abbott created the early foundations of pediatric cardiology. She was Canadian. She graduated from college from McGill University and then wanted to study medical school, going into medical school. But even though she was valedictorian at McGill, um, she was rejected because McGill was not taking any women at the time. So she did end up going to medical school at Bishop's College. She was the only woman in her class. And as she, after she graduated, specialized in treating women and children de and developed an interest for congenital heart disease, which at the time was heart specimens. So she became the curator of the McGill Museum. Uh, and as you'll see in a lot of these uh, pioneer women, they always had a mentor and a sponsor that supported their career growth. And for her, it was Doug, uh, William Oxler. As a true, or she was an artist. You can see that her description of aortic valve leaflets, uh, disease the leaflets, is just amazing. And William Orsler recognized her uh, as there had been no collection in North America or in England that came close close to it. And that's uh, her drawing of the Holmes heart, a single ventricle, doubly left ventricle with normally related great arteries, and that is very historical. Um, so she describes that uh, you can actually get that atlas of congenital heart disease in Amazon now, um, a thousand cases with pa clinical pathological correlation. So it was not only the morphology, she actually figured out the clinical side. And she also tried to uh, interpret why those malformations happened and brought ideas such as uh, incomplete torsion of the conotroncos could uh, result in heart defects and had these uh, pretty advanced thoughts on developmental and comparative anatomy studying other species, the heart in other species as well. These are some of the valve descriptions. Uh, they're beautiful. This is a quadricastic pulmonary valve and then some aortic valves, deceased aortic valves. And she actually described uh, a case with a spontaneous dissection of the aorta in a bicuspid valve, and she's recognized in the bicuspid aortic foundation for her contributions uh, in their website. The clinical classification is just amazing. So she had acyanotic, cyanotic early, and cyanotic late. And you can see here a beautiful description of coartation with all the collateralization, vascular rings, and then totally understood the trilogy of Fallot. You can see the nice diagram showing the overriding aorta, right to left shunting, and the implication of chronic cyanosis with clubbing. 
She even figured out that if you if patients with a single ventricle who had an elbow part, so solitus atrium and ventricles inverted, were at risk of heart block, and she figured that out. And um, I totally understood Eisenmenger syndrome. So here's the VSD, left to right, and then cyanotic late. There were those who converted because of the high PBR to right to left shunting. So pretty brilliant. Now you can see how tough the times were in those days. This is a clinic um, in Montreal. Uh, Dr. Osler is co conducting um, is in the surgical theater an autopsy. And you can see there's not a single woman. However, she was there, um, but where was she? Um, you can see she's up there. <laughs> and she's probably to see only the only face that is not illuminated probably wearing a veil because um to cover her face but that's 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 how it was those days uh so pretty courageous to to succeed in those days what she recognized she did end up getting an honorary medical degree from McGill in 1910 and she was inducted into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame and they had a um, stamp with her name uh it's called the heart of the matter and she was also recognized by Paul, uh, Dr. Paul Dudley White as the world's authority in congenital heart disease and a living force in medicine of her generation. So she did get some recognition. The ACHD program in Montreal also is, carries her name. Um, so we all have heard the true mother of pediatric cardiology is Helen Brooke Telsing. So she uh, has also has a in, in, very interesting story. Uh, she was born uh, in Massachusetts and her father was an economist professor at Harvard. And she um, um, wanted to study medicine, of course. Now um, she went and speak to the dean of the medical school. Um, and he said, well, I, you can study medicine, but you can't get a degree to which say, well, who would be such a fool to spend four, year, four years studying and not getting a degree? And he said, no one, I hope. <laughs> so she said, well, I will not be the first one to disappoint you. And, uh, and that's when she went to Johns Hopkins. Now, John Hopkins was taking women, uh, but the, it's very interesting, the history. The reason why Johns Hopkins was taking women is because in, in 1890, when the medical school opened up, they, they had run out of money. And, uh, and it was embarrassing because they had all the professors lined up to start working at the Hopkins Medical School, but they, don't have, they didn't have money for the building. And so the board of trust, the, the daughter, four daughters of the board, um, uh, Johns Hopkins, made this proposal. We can raise the funds as long as you accept women. And that was where Johns Hopkins accepted women. So they reluctantly agreed. And uh, essentially, that's, that's why that happened. So she did terrific, but got a fellowship in the heart station and, uh, and then became in charge of the cardiac clinic. She was fascinated by the blue, baby, the blue babies and figured out that it also had a continuous murmur did better. And that when the continuous murmur went away, they pretty much ended up dead. So that that was fatal. And that's where the thought came about, you know, building a ductus and reestablish blood flow could treat these cyanotic babies. So she started thinking of therapy. And in those days, uh, Robert Gross was closing the PDAs in Boston. So she goes up to Boston and asks Dr. Gross, can you build me a ductus? And uh, so no way, I'm in, not in the business of closing PDAs. I'm only in the business of treating them. Uh, uh, not in the business of building them. So, um, so and those days, Alfred Blaylock had been recruited um, to Baltimore, and um, he was doing a lot of research um, experiment with his very, very experienced technician, Vivian Thomas. And uh, when Helen went to uh, see um, him close up the first three PDA, she said, oh, well, I stand in awe and admiration at your surgical skill, but the really good day will come when you actually build me, build me a ductus to, for a child who's dying with hypoxemia. Uh, and that's how it ended up. Um, as he was doing experiments, anastomosing the subclavian artery to the pulmonary artery to develop a model of pulmonary hypertension, which actually never succeeded, um, that, that surgical skill, especially with uh, Vivian Thomas skill, uh, ended up being the basis for the shunt that saved so many lives. Eileen Saxon was an 11 month old, very severely cyanotic, cachectic child who was dying. And she, uh, with permission of the parents, had the first operation that was successful in 1944. 
And that was like a boom of you know, therapeutic interventions in congenital heart disease um, and treating cyanotic kids. It became obviously news all over the world. And that's what we call now the Blalo uh, Tausig Thomas shunt, BTT shunt. Um, so that led to an influx of patients and people to come and learn. Uh, she started a fellowship program uh, and a lot of the future pioneers in our field actually ended up going through uh, Dr. Tausig's uh, training, um, textbooks of congenital heart disease. And she did get some recognition, no question. Uh, you can see some of some stuff here. She even got the Medal of Freedom from President Lyndon Johnson for her work on thalidomide. Um, and um, I think something that she's often not, not recognized for, but if you read um, Bill Rashkin, who is you know, the father of interventional cardiology, recognizes that her words were very inspiring after he presented the original cases of the balloon septostomy, which were in animals. Um, Helen Tause actually wrote to him and said, it would be wonderful if we can do some of the simpler operations without opening the chest. I think that's a real advance and a real look into the future. And he accepts that that inspired him to keep going because in the beginning, it wasn't very encouraging that that would work in a baby. So, and truly, if you look at this, this is really an example of a partnership between cardiology and CT surgery that has really been the theme for our field ever since um, that started then. With to regards to recognition, these were her words. Over the years, I've gotten recognition for what I did, I did, but I didn't at the time. It hurt for a while. It hurt with Dr. Blaylock. Uh, Blaylock was elected to the National Academy of Arts and Sciences, and I didn't even get promoted from assistant to associate professor. Um, so the next generation, I'm going to go a little quick over these. I could be one could talk a little more, but um, Mary Allen Angle uh, in, in, in New York, she had incredible number of contributions, more than 400 publications in all different, very, very pivotal um, um, subjects in congenital heart disease and also leadership role. And she essentially de developed um, within the American Academy of Pediatrics, pediatric cardiology being a subspecialty. She was also a fellow of Dr. Tausig. I have to talk about Stella Van Praag because she's almost like a mother to me. And she was a very renowned uh, pediatric cardiologist and pathologist who came from, from Athens to the US for training under Dr. Helen Tausig. And then also John Keith in Toronto, married to Dr. Van Praag. And she says, we got engaged over right-heartedness and married over single ventricle. And then they moved to Boston where they created the cardiac registry where people from all over the world went to learn about congenital heart disease. And she had that ability to make the most complex heart defects seem very simple and comprehensible to everyone. And especially in those days, the cardiac surgical team who came coming down to figure out what went wrong, because in those days, mortality was really high. And that's how, how you would learn you know, the, the future. She also made you love congenital heart defects because of her cooking. So there was the homemade bread in the back of the lab and the smell of homemade bread and then the formalin at times, but then it, and then sometimes some baklava and in the end you ended up for some reason loving congenital heart disease. Um, she was a proof that a woman can be, a uh, woman cardiologist can be complete, a well-rounded human being, an excellent clinician, great mother, a teacher, wife, you know, and an amazing cook. So she's truly an inspiration to all of us. Across the Atlantic, we have Jane Somerville. So Jane, um, she, Tough, many of you know the tough time for the they, she went to an old boys school during the World War II, and the story is, is very interesting. But she did have mentorship from Dr. Paul Wood. She was fascinated by Alfred Blaylock and wanted to be a surgeon, but she tells you she had no surgical skills. And, and she truly was appalled by, by the disasters of surgery and was a very, very big advocate to detail accurate diagnosis, had significant contributions in terms of anatomic understanding and clinical correlates. She really started talking about adult congenital as a subspecialty. Now she, she called it Gooch, grown-up congenital heart disease. That's how it started in the UK. Uh, and was very much an advocate of bringing all these subspecialties within the uh, cardiac together. So CT surgeon and cardiology in the World Congress and train people all over the world. You can see this pretty historical picture. Jane Somerville, Mary Allen Angle, Helen Tausig, and Denton Cooley all together in the World Congress. So... Uh, and that's how things moved there on in terms of collaborative with city surgery. 
Roberta Williams, I have to mention, mention her at least briefly. She was truly a mother of imaging and echocardiography. All the initial correlates of cardiac pathology with images by um, echo and geography, you can see there, transposition, those, those kids in the, those days, you came in, had no idea what was going on, went to the cath lab and shoot the high pressure chamber and try to figure out what was the congenital heart defect. So bringing this with to the echo to try to understand the, the view to mimic was, was just amazing accomplishments. And indeed, she was uh, the first director of, the, of an echo lab, pediatric echo lab in the Boston Children's. And interestingly, also the first medical director of a cardiac, a dedicated cardiac ICU. So that was obviously very, very novel. Uh, and that would be really Dr. Nada so who, who made that happen. But, um, and she has, you know, she still goes to, to conferences. She has a passion of continuous comprehensive care for congenital heart disease from fetal life to the adult. Jackie Noonan with her Noonan syndrome and contributions such as hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, Jean Kahn, the first pulmonary balloon valvotomy. Uh, that would let that when she was 37 years old, so the groundbreaking paper. Uh, and then there's many others. Uh, Maria Victoria La Cruz with heart development. Uh, and I probably can't go to all, all of these pioneers because of the time constraints. These women had a lot of things in common. They had vision, they had curiosity, they had strength and resilience. Following the steps of these amazing women, we have a whole new generation of leaders in cardiology, whether they're clinical, in clinical research, in electrophysiology, interventional cardiology, heart failure, fetal, uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, and they truly, truly stand in the shoulders of this giant other women who started in the field. My friend Meryl Cohen wrote a column at the ACC and made a reference to Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, so he would dance in some of those many movies in the 30s and 40s, and uh, you know, recognizing that Ginger did everything he did, except that she did it backwards and in high heels. Um, uh, and that sometimes makes us think a little bit about women in medicine. And uh, if you look at uh, women in healthcare in general, about 60% um, of the workforce, however, when you're looking at CEOs, only 15%, and the same goes on for board uh, members. Uh, R01s as well, significant discrepancy between females and, and men. Some of the statistics for cardiology, 20% uh, of the fellows um, are female, and then it's lower when you go to cardio uh, uh, cardiologists in practice. And so even though, 46% uh, of the students, graduates are female in the study. Uh, when you go to about trainees, it's 21%. And when you go about board certification, it's 12. And if you go and look at underrepresented minorities in medicine, it's, it, it's even worse for cardiology. What happens with pediatric cardiology? Well, you saw the start of the specialty, it was all women. But then when it got interesting, it was taken over by men. Uh, and then it was pretty much a male predominant. Um, and then, and you can see this as fellows, you know, how in the last 20 years, there's been progressively increasing in women representation in the cardiology, pediatric cardiology fellowship training, being about 50-50 now for several years. In this very recent paper, um, it, you can see the blue bars are women, 54% in fellows, but as you go from faculty to the division chiefs, the doubt chairs, et cetera, the percentage decreases significantly. So as you go in leadership positions, they, they, it's very, very underrepresented. And in the orange bars, those underrepresented minorities in medicine, which is a lot worse. With regards to compensation, um, Molly Shah, who's one of the interventional cardiologists um, in the pediatric world, it had a survey at PACES that really demonstrated significantly lower compensation for female electrophysiologists compared to male counterparts, and that adjusted for a bunch of variables. We don't really have a lot of other data. Um, it, so about 50% of trainees, much, much lower representation in terms of leadership. Let's not talk about CT surgery, that's even worse. Um, promotion delays, low compensation. But we've come a long way. <laughs> if you look at the class, how it was and how it is, uh, clearly a huge difference. Um, and uh, I think that there's a lot of efforts in place to make those changes uh, continue uh, for a better future. And to give you a little bit of note of hope, we have to remember the recent win for the US soccer team, 24 million in settlement. Uh, for, uh, so 
uh, for compensation. So this, this, this is really the future. The future is bright, I think. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jack. That was, that was incredible. Um, next up is uh, Samir Saba, is Professor in Chief of Division of Cardiology and Co Director of the Heart and Vascular Institute. Uh, he will be enlightening us about what we have learned about left atrial appendage occlusion over the past decade. This will build nicely on the, on the live recorded case that Pem will uh, demonstrate earlier today. Thanks, Samir. Thank you, Eves, and the organizers for the invitation. So, my task over the coming eight minutes is to talk about percutaneous uh, left atrial appendage occlusion. What have we learned? I'm going to jump uh, right into it because there is a lot uh, to cover. These are my disclosures. All right, I'm preaching to the choir here when I tell you that uh, atrial fibrillation is associated with is a strong predictor of uh, the risk of stroke. About 15% of all strokes are attributable to atrial fibrillation whether the patient is known to have atrial fibrillation at the time of the stroke or not. In older patients, this is even worse. It's the number one predictor of stroke, and uh, obviously oral anticoagulation is the treatment. The problem is that 40 to 50% of patients who should be on oral anticoagulation do not take oral anticoagulation, either because of a prior, risk, uh, a prior history of bleeding or a perceived risk of bleeding, and that leaves a lot of strokes and a lot of costs uh, on Medicare and the healthcare system. Well, it's not that patients do not recognize that there is a risk of stroke. It's just that, excuse me, they feel stuck between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, the risks of stroke and the risk of atrial uh, of bleeding go up hand in hand. So it's kind of almost like uh, choose your poison. You see the overlap between the has blood and the chas to vas score. It's a catch twenty two. Do you rather get a major bleed or a stroke? And that's the dilemma that we've been facing until we had the percutaneous left atrial appendage closure devices. As Jackie mentioned, uh, when we move from open surgery to uh, over or excise the left atrial appendage, it's limited in terms of its applicability. Until we got the percutaneous option, it became much more of an option that you know broke that vicious circle that we have. This has been present for the past uh, uh, 10 years in Europe first, as is often the case. And then the Watchman was the first device approved in the US in 2015. And it's a plug, <clears throat> excuse me, with a mesh on top of it that you deploy at the entrance at the ostium of the left atrial appendage. And then six years later came the amulet, which as we heard earlier, is uh, built on the platform of a PFO closure device. It has a lobe that goes a little bit deeper in the ostium and then the disc that uh, sits on the outside as a suction cup. So. What have we learned over the past uh, 10 years? Uh, I uh, consolidated uh, the, the, the lessons into 10 lessons that I'm gonna go over in rapid fire. All right, first of all, the procedure is uh, technically very successful. Whether we're talking about the ACP, the Amplatzer, which is the predecessor of the amulet, or whether we're talking about the, the Watchman, we have a success rate, a technical success rate of closing the appendage of in the mid 90%, 90% like four or 5% failure. And depending on the study, you have even smaller numbers. It's also a very safe procedure. As you see the curves, when you get to more recent, as, as we develop the, the skills, the, uh, uh, the, the procedural uh, major complications, including embolization of the device or uh, stroke or death or tamponade have become around 1%. So that's important. Lesson number two is that these devices really help, and over the long term, they do protect against uh, uh, stroke or thromboembolic events. These data are from the Prevail and Protect AF trials, which are the Watchmen. Those are the two trials that form the basis of the approval uh, uh, by the FDA. And when you look at the five-year outcome between Coumadin and the uh, uh, left atrial appendage closure, you, you see that there is no, it's non-inferior. It's equivalent in terms of the protection. Needless to say, the patient that had the device had less bleeding, uh, uh, hemorrhagic stroke and what have you, which accounts for a lower uh, all-cause mortality, at least in this analysis. Third, uh, the, the two devices that, have, that we have available are the amulet as well as the uh, watchman. There was one randomized trial, 18 plus 100 uh, patients, randomizing those patients to the amulet and the watchman, and there is non-inferiority, meaning that uh, uh, in terms of the bleeding risk or cardiovascular death, from a safety perspective, they're equivalent, as well as at 18 months from the protection against stroke and thromboembolic events, they're also equivalent. A caveat uh, here, this was uh, funded by 
Abbott. So this is the amulet study that showed the non-inferiority. And this was compared to the uh, Watchman 2.5. So this is not what we implant today with the Watchman Flex that we have. Not that the, the, the results would have been different, but just putting it out there, we don't have data on this comparison. Lesson number four, the things that are complicated have fallen as they should by the wayside. What, is, what does that mean? The lariat, you may, some of you may remember, it's a complicated procedure where we would go transeptal into the left atrial appendage, and then we connect through the subxiphoid, through the pericardium, and the two wires are magnetic. We connect them together, and then we, we advance a uh, stitch to the ostium, and we cinch it down, not only closing the uh, left atrial appendage, but also killing the muscle and the uh, you know, most of the places that have done a lot of these procedures have had close encounters with complications. And uh, most importantly, we have better options that are much, much simpler. The last attempt at reviving this uh, uh, this technology was the AMAZE trial, which said, well, by killing the muscle, you reduce the likelihood of recurrence of atrial fibrillation. So the AMAZE trial basically uh, randomized patients to AFib ablation alone or AFib ablation with the lariat device and did not show any difference in the recurrence of atrial fibrillation. So that was the last nail in the coffin of this technology. Okay, lesson uh, number five, anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. The left atrial appendage varies in size and morphology. We used to use a lot of those uh, uh, food uh, analogies, the chicken wing and the broccoli and the uh, what have you. Needless to say, the, the devices have to adapt to the varying ana uh, anatomies. And the two devices that we have today in the US are the Watchman Flex and the Amulet. But there are other devices elsewhere in the world, in Asia, the Lambre, et cetera, uh, that uh, so far they're not available to us. And on the anatomy and the things, uh, we guide ourselves with uh, mainly TEEs and fluoroscopy and sometimes CT scans ahead of time to, to plan the procedure. And sometimes you have a very wide ostium and very uh, shallow. Uh, the second, this, the small ostium, this was a case that I uh, aborted earlier this week because the, uh, the ostium was four millimeters. There is no device that closes a four millimeter uh, uh, ostium. And uh, you see here the five sizes of the Watchman Flex going from 20 uh, millimeters up and then from for the, uh, the eight sizes for the amulet going from 16 millimeters up. And uh, the, for, the, for the amulet, by the way, it's the size of the uh, lobe, not the size of the disc that we're talking about. Lesson number six, imaging is very important. Uh, number one, we need to rule clots, correct? You know, if you have a clot in the left atrial appendage, we're not gonna be doing anything for it. This image on the left is the biggest clot that I've seen in the left atrial appendage sent to me by Madur Singh from our group in, uh, in Hammett. But it's not only the clot that prevents the procedure from happening, it's also this whole DRT, device-related thrombosis that sometimes happens, and our experience is about 4%, meaning a clot forms on the outside surface of the device, and that's a problem, especially if you're implanting the, the device in someone who has a very high risk of bleeding, uh, that patient has to be committed to anticoagulation, otherwise the risk of stroke is, is, is very high. You know, managing the procedure itself, where do you cross uh, the septum? Yesterday, literally yesterday, I crossed, uh, I did a patient who had a uh, mitral clip and I learned yesterday that we cross high in the septum with a mitral clip, I didn't know that. So I took the short uh, the, the short course and uh, crossed and I couldn't align the, the watchman with the, with the appendage. So I had to go back on heparin low and recross. So that is one thing. So guiding where we cross, guiding where we size for the amulet we size, one, 1 1.2 centimeters inside the ostium for the watchman on the outside. And then also looking at the stability of the device. Lesson number eight, number eight is the whole leak thing, correct? The, uh, you know, uh, as, as the FDA approved the watchman, industry pushed this whole concept that leaks below five millimeters do not matter. And it never made too much sense. A clot of three millimeters or four millimeters can still lead to a big uh, to a big stroke. And now we pay much more attention because we have data that shows that, yes, if you take all comers, uh, you know, the anticoagulation is equivalent to closing with less than five millimeter leak. But if you separate those that have zero millimeter leaks versus less than five millimeters, there is a twofold, at least twofold difference in the risk of stroke. And that is important. So that's what we should be shooting for. Left atrial appendage happening at the same time as an AFib ablation. This is mainly for the electrophysiologists. We face this question frequently. It is doable. As you see from these registries, it decreases appropriately the risk of stroke and uh, bleeding, equivalent to what you would get if you were to use uh, anticoagulation. From a DRG perspective and reimbursement perspective, it's a problem because you don't get reimbursed for 
both the RGs. You get reimbursed at this point for one of them. But most importantly, the option trial, which we were part of, uh, uh, randomizing uh, 1,600 patients uh, worldwide to AFib ablation with oral anticoagulation versus with left atrial appendage closure. Uh, it's finished enrolling, and you, uh, it's looking for non-inferiority for, uh, the, for the protection, for the efficacy, and superiority for the non uh, procedure related bleeding. So we'll look forward for these results. Lesson number 10, you know, we can bo use both the watchman today as well as the amulet with dual antiplatelets. It used to be that the watchman, you had to use it with at least 45 days of anticoagulation. The reality is that we had a lot of patients bleeding a lot in the first 45 days. So that is a good thing. Not that they don't bleed on plavix and aspirin, but that's, that's an important, uh, you know, contribution. Um, so I'm going to close with this study, future directions. This could be a talk in of itself, but I'm going to be brief. We need, we have a lot of variability in the anatomy. There are always new devices from newer companies or even from the same companies. I stumbled on this design from, uh, uh, from uh, um, Boston Scientific that makes the watchman looking at, this is from, from a, uh, an IP, from a uh, patent application that looks like they're doing also a lobe and a disc. So will we see this device uh, coming down the pike? Who knows, but, uh, but at least there are those, uh, uh, those uh, plans. Uh, as you know, the uh, Watchman Pinnacle is about to come, which is uh, the next generation uh, for the Watchman. Uh, physicians and uh, patients and referring physicians primarily are voting with their feet they, to get the option of giving the left atrial appendage device as opposed to oral anticoagulation. This will likely open up if the results of Champion AF and Catalyst, those are two studies we were part of. Champion has uh, it was with the Watchman. It finished enrollment. Catalyst is still enrolling with the uh, with the amulet, and those. Um, Two studies are taking patients uh, that are indicated for anticoagulation and randomizing them without any history of bleeding or risk of bleeding to left atrial appendage closure versus uh, versus DOAX. Uh, single, uh, you know, uh, antiplatelet agent as opposed to dual antiplatelet agent may be coming down the pike. Still, patients, as I said, bleed on Plavix and aspirin. At least some registry data from Europe seems to indicate that you don't do too bad with single antiplatelet uh, agents. And as was alluded to uh, before, uh, we uh, uh, we impose a lot on our ECHO folks uh, to be with us uh, the whole day doing uh, uh, left atrial appendage closures, and uh, they, they only have a couple of RVUs to show for it at the end of the day. So maybe phased array is going to be the next thing. With this, I'll stop. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Great. Uh, next up is our APP uh, supervisor, uh, Katie Fadiganti. Our APP has really formed the backbone of our heart team. And it'd be wonderful to hear from Katie as to what this all means when taking care of patients. Good afternoon. I have been tasked with talking about the role of the heart team and maintaining excellence in our heart valve programs. So this is a shift from a clinical discussion more to a programmatic discussion. As you know, the management of complex uh, cardiovascular disease, specifically valvular heart disease, as we've learned today, has changed drastically over the last decade. To facilitate this complex care, the multidisciplinary heart team is now the cornerstone. The idea of a team-based approach to care has been used in other specialties for a very long time, such as oncology and transplant programs. The multidisciplinary heart team began in Europe with the introduction of percutaneous coronary intervention more than a decade ago. In 2012, the ACC recommended the heart team for patients undergoing cabbage. TAVR became FDA approved in 2011, and in 2012, CMS mandated the use of the multidisciplinary heart team for TAVR patients. In 2014, I'm sorry, in 2018, an expert consensus document uh, spoke to the multidisciplinary heart team and included cardiac surgeons, as well as interventional cardiologists and additional providers. However, at the time, there was no guidance on to who or how many were to be involved. 
The most current ACC AHA guidelines for heart valve disease, which were released in 2020, states as a class one recommendation that all patients with severe valvular heart disease being considered for valve intervention should be evaluated by a multidisciplinary team with either referral to or in consultation with a primary or com comprehensive valve center. There are two different levels of valve centers. Uh, there's a level one valve center, which is the comprehensive valve center, and a level two valve center is a primary valve center. Oops, sorry. The level one center is defined by the depth and breadth of procedures that they perform. Essentially, they have the resources to be able to perform all commercially available transcatheter, transcatheter and surgical procedures. Why do we need a heart team? Because patient-centered issues are not easy, nor are they straightforward, and we need to pay meticulous attention to these cases. The heart team provides a balanced appraisal of each specific case. It allows for a complementary approach to patient care by joint and shared decision-making among medical care stakeholders. We can tailor our recommendations to each individual patient. The combined expertise of the heart team allows for optimized decisions with comp complex patient care issues. As we're learning from our talks today, there are multiple options in how to manage these patients. The heart team allows for an open-minded discussion to determine what the best option is for each patient. The lack of specificity and accurate risk, risk predict, prediction for some patients makes it difficult to make decisions even with appropriate use criteria. Ultimately, by having these discussions and presenting them to the patient, we allow for more patient satisfaction and outcomes. Another great merit of the heart team is shared liability and accountability. Essentially, we ensure that patients are undergoing procedures where the benefits will outweigh the risks. It allows for standardization of preoperative workup because you need a complete workup to have a successful heart team meeting. It increases the opportunities for both interventionalists and cardiac surgeons to advance their skill sets. We know that these complex care, uh, complex issues require creativity and this acts as a place for that discussion. The heart team allows for discussion of new devices and approaches, the burgeoning of scientific information from randomized controlled trials and large registries, and it serves as a place for training for fellowship in an ever evolving uh, part of cardiology. And lastly, the heart team can provide guidance for the financial and infrastructure decisions for the healthcare system. While there are obvious members of the heart team, such as the cardiac surgeons, interventional and imaging cardiologists, APPs, RNs, there are other key members that we can't forget, such as the scheduling team and administrative staff, quality and data, data analytics teams, system administration and operations support. These are the team members we would expect a level one comprehensive valve program to have. Most beneficial is to identify a clinic valve lead or valve clinic lead that has administrative and clinical oversight. What is the role of the patient in the heart valve team? Obviously at the center of our decision-making, but we don't invite them to our heart team meetings. For this reason, heart team is often uh, happens in the clinic. Having a multidisciplinary clinic allows the patient, the valve team, and the shared decision makers to have these discussions openly together. In addition, at our institution, we have weekly scheduled heart team meetings every Monday and Thursdays with both an in-person and team-based option. There is no standardized pathway or model for referral of patients to a heart valve program. I have here an example from our center. Uh, most patients come from a gatekeeper cardiologist who refers the patients to our heart valve center. They are seen by both an interventional cardiologist and cardiac surgeon with the help of an APP at the same time. The decision is made whether the patient should go straight to intervention or if there are questions about the surgical approach, cognitive health, or frailty of the patient, that patient can be discussed in the heart team at a later time with the help of other specialists. 
While the heart team is important to facilitate patient-centered care, the heart team is also very important for compliance and reporting. In 2012, the TVT registry was designed to support a national surveillance system to assess the characteristics, treatments, and outcomes of patients receiving transcatheter valve therapy. Patient-level data are submitted by participating hospitals to the joint STS and ACC TVT registry. There are key metrics that are required for this registry, such as Kansas City questionnaire, five meter gate test, and a six minute walk test, which are recorded before the procedure at 30 days and one years after. The metrics require a team support to obtain and track. The purpose of the registry is to measure and assess the quality of care, provide periodic reports and feedback to these participating hospitals, and to foster uh, appropriate research, including post-market studies. Um, on the left or the right side of the screen is just an example of one of the 11 pages that gets sub submitted for the TVT registry. And these exist for our TAVR, TIER, valve and valve TMVR, and tricuspid valve therapies. The heart team ensures excellence in the era of heart valve programs because the data that's collected is objective. There are key metrics for TVT that you can see here, such as 30-day mortality, stroke, life-threatening or major bleed, and AKI. Each individual procedure has additional different endpoints. We get quarterly reports of this tracked patient and site-level data, which is given to us in a whisker plot, as you see on the screen. The final score indicates whether a person is better off going to a your hospital versus the average. A more recent development is that TAVR, now with indications for all risk categories, was added to the list of procedures the US News publicly reports. Hospitals are rated on a three-star system, and the rating system is different than that of the TBT registry. The quality indicators are different for the US News. And as you can see, all of these things are not controlled fully in the operating room. They are, and they are not operator dependent. So it they are often system dependent. So it requires a strong heart team to ensure we are meeting these metrics. This table further illustrates the differences between the US News and TVT registry. Uh, notable is the data uh, for each is, is obtained differently. Some is claims-based while others is internally reported. You'll notice that the U.S. News includes, includes nurse staffing and patient experience. And when it comes to public reporting, we have no choice but for U.S. News. Lastly, the HEART team promotes projects that support improvement for all of these metrics. At our institution, we have developed several initiatives around discharge to home, uh, readmission prevention, clinical documentation for risk adjustment to obtain higher DRGs with MCCs. We have structural heart, m and and quarterly system-wide meetings. We have quality assurance and process improvement meetings. We have a fully integrated medication optimization clinic, and we have system support for live cases at different conferences such as CRT and TVT. In summary, as you can see from a programmatic standpoint, the heart team plays a crucial role in maintaining excellence at heart valve centers. Ultimately, teamwork really makes the dream work. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, next up is the Kathira Subramaniam, Professor in Chief of uh, Cardiothoracic Anesthesia at UPMC. Uh, Kathira has been an outstanding clinical and operational partner uh, in the, with the HVI in a variety of projects. Uh, thank you, Kathira. Thank you, Ips and HVA team for inviting cardiac anesthesia here. Um, well, cardiac life of cardiac anesthesia was so predictable. It is general endotracheal anesthesia, muscle paralysis, transport the patient to ICU at the end of the case, it's over. But it has changed so much nowadays after invention of this transcatheter procedures. 
look at the list. You can give local anesthesia only. You can give local anesthesia with mild sedation, which is called conscious sedation. Uh, the local anesthesia with deep sedation, which is general, with a, basically a general anesthesia without endotracheal tube. Uh, so the difference is you can stimulate the patient, wake them up in mild sedation, but you can stimulate, but patient woke up in, won't wake, wake up in deep sedation. Um, so you can do general anesthesia with endotracheal tube or with laryngeal mask airway. Uh, you can do general anesthesia with positive pressure ventilation, also spontaneous ventilation. Um, so this is the recent um, uh, 2023 paper, comparison of safety and effectiveness of local or general anesthesia for TAVI. Um, so this is patient, this, this study included 34 studies. Uh, published between 2002 and 2012, uh, more than 20,000 patients included in the analysis. You can see the procedure time, fluoroscopic time, and length of stay all favors local anesthesia with conscious sedation. So the use of cardiovascular drugs like inotropes, vasopressors, all decreases with use of local anesthesia and conscious sedation intraoperatively. The incidence of major bleeding also favors local anesthesia with conscious sedation. The acute kidney injury, I do not know how to explain this. It favors general anesthesia. If you have lower hypotension, if you have a lower use of cardiovascular drugs, why the acute kidney injury is more in local anesthesia? It is something to be tested and investigated further. Uh, there is no difference between general anesthesia and local anesthesia in 30-day mortality, procedural success, shock, myocardial infarction, cerebrovascular accident, pacemaker rate, or perivalve leak. Um, so there is some bias in comparison of anesthesia techniques. The general anesthesia is advocated initially when the, uh, when during the early part of learning curve, and general anesthesia procedures done in difficult patients, general anesthesia procedures done for complex procedures and complex approaches. So how do you eliminate this bias? So one randomized clinical trial was published between general anesthesia and local anesthesia solved TAVI trial, 447 patients. The primary outcome was 30-day composite morbidity and mortality. So what they found is there is equivalence uh, between general anesthesia and local anesthesia in terms of uh, primary endpoints. So you take the less invasive option, which is the local anesthesia with conscious sedation. Um, the, there is lower requirement for inotropes and vasopressors in local anesthesia group. So the proponents of general anesthesia will say the patient is immobile, patient respiratory motion is controlled, it is ideal for an interventional procedure. Airway is protected, respiratory depression is avoided. Uh, you can use TEE whenever you want under general anesthesia. If a procedural complication happens, it is easier to manage under general anesthesia. However, local anesthesia proponents will say that hemodynamic disturbances, mechanical ventilation significantly increase perioperative risk. Longer recovery, longer hospitalization increase the risk of infection before discharge. Uh, if you have a general anesthesia with delayed recovery, neuro dysfunction is delayed, delayed detection and delaying treatment. So general anesthesia is unavoidable if the patient is failing to maintain proper position like Parkinson's disease or neurologic disorders. You are not able to lie flat in a bed in an interventional table. Patients with severe back pain, failed back syndrome, patients with severe orthopnea, constantly coughing. Um, we encounter this patient quite often. Patients with morbid obesity, more than 35 BMI, or the patient that doesn't want local anesthesia, patient with general anesthesia. Um, and then surgical approaches, transaxillary, transiotic, or transapical uh, requires general anesthesia. Very procedural conversion from local to general anesthesia is not ideal. Uh, this is a registry from Germany and Stanford. Uh, the conversion rate reported was 3.3%. Uh, procedural complication, respiratory distress, cardiovascular decompensation, and the patient is restless on the table. So those are all the common reasons for the conversion. Um, they compared the converted patient versus non-converted patients. You can see the 11% 30-day uh, safety 
in non-converted patient compared to 37 patients had some complication at 30, uh, 30 days. So the conversion of local anesthesia to general anesthesia is not ideal during the procedure at all. Um, so, so you want to predict which patient will tolerate general anesthesia, will tolerate local anesthesia with conscious sedation carefully and plan it accordingly. So these are all the patients where there is a possibility of hemodynamic instability during the procedure, impaired LV systolic function, impaired diastolic function, grade three. Uh, if you have a patient with collateral dependent coronary circulation, untreated coronary artery disease, pulmonary hypertension, right heart dysfunction, significant other valve disease, patients with significant other system disorders like pulmonary disease or renal disease or frailty. So these patients, you can predict these patients are going to behave differently. So act accordingly in the uh, intraoperative period. Preoperative optimization in the preoperative clinic has a significant role. Anemia increases the transfusion. Anemia by itself an independent predictor. Transfusion itself is an independent predictor of bad outcomes. So avoid these two combined together. Nutritional status can be improved as much as possible. Frailty assessment is a part of TAVR workup. Pulmonary disease is very common in patients undergoing TAVI and other invasive procedures. Optimization of pulmonary disease goes a long way to avoid complications. Vulnerability to postoperative neuro dysfunction like aortic disease, carotid disease, previous stroke, previous TIA has to be uh, worked up before the patient comes to the operating room. So other transcatheter procedures other than TAVI. Uh, so there are several procedures we do only under local anesthesia nowadays, like atrial septal device closure with a minimum sedation. Uh, except some patients, we will require general anesthesia and TEE. As we are talking about this uh, watchman procedures in future, maybe when the ice picks up, we may do those cases also with sedation, now general anesthesia. Rest of the procedures in the list, like mitral clip, triclip, transcatheter, mitral valve replacement, all these procedures are nowadays done under general anesthesia, endotracheal tube, muscle paralysis, invasive monitoring, TEE. But there are several centers who do it under sedation also. Um, so, but majority of the centers do under general anesthesia. <clears throat> so, to conclude, the principles of anesthesia management, preoperative optimization is important, selection of anesthetic technique tailored to the procedure and the patient, early detection of complications intraoperatively and postoperative by anesthesia and perioperative team is very important. Common theme, the type of anesthesia or anesthesia technique or type of medication administered is less important than the manner in which the anesthesia is conducted or a drug is administered. So type A versus type B it doesn't make a lot of difference. Drug A versus drug B doesn't make a lot of difference, but the way you administer type A technique or drug A techniques is very important. Most anesthetic technique reduce sympathetic tone leading to vasodilation reduction in systemic pressure. This anesthetic management must ensure the proper maintenance of organ perfusion pressure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathir, that was great. Um, and, and for the first time, anesthesia did not delay us today, so. <laughs> our, our, our last, our, it's okay, we're friends, it'll work. So our last talk for today is another special one. Uh, Paul Mahoney, uh, who uh, really requires no introduction, is an internationally renowned interventional cardiologist with expertise in, in coronary, structural, and, and God knows how many more uh, interventional and transcatheter techniques. Uh, the, the, the exciting part for us that we are incredibly blessed uh, that Paul will be joining uh, UPMC Harrisburg, uh, joining Hemel and his team. Uh, so we're absolutely delighted to have Paul and would love to hear Paul's version of what he thinks the future will look like for structural heart therapies and heart valve therapies. Welcome, Paul. Well, thank you very much, Eves. And um, first of all, I hope you can hear me. And secondly, thank you for the kind introduction. I'm very excited uh, about what the next few months hold. Let me share my screen here. Are you seeing this? Excellent. All right. So what I've been asked to talk about is uh, the next, next thing, potential game-changing clinical trials coming up in structural heart. And I realize I'm the last speaker in a long line, so I'm going to try to keep it light. Um, and let me use these controls. So um, what are the 
the critical clinical trials in 2023. So my goal is to identify current clinical trials that could change the standard of care of treatment of patients with valvular heart disease. The criteria I used was to look at all the structural heart trials that are enrolling or in follow-up, but not yet completed or published. And I looked at things that might be potentially changing the standard of care, new indications, new techniques, and novel technology. And I looked at aortic, mitral, and tricuspid. I try to, I try to stay within those guidelines. This is my opinion only. It's not comprehensive. I'm ignoring a lot of equally good clinical trials. Um, so feel free to, uh, to lob um, fruit at the screen if you don't like the ones I picked. Uh, the first one has been going on for a while. It's called Early TAVR. And we talked about it a little bit. One of the previous speakers in the session did a really beautiful job talking about moderate AS and what really is moderate AS. But what early TAVR looks at is comparison of an early intervention TAVR versus conservative management for what's called asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. So there's some questions. One is how much risk does asymptomatic severe AS convey? Should we intervene on severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis? Um, and really, you know, the, the conventional thinking of most of the clinical practice in the audience is if someone has AS, unless you're having symptoms, we don't intervene. But what does that really mean? Is it is there no risk to having asymptomatic aortic stenosis? And when we look at data uh, from control arms of medical therapy versus AVR and asymptomatic AS, we find over a threefold increase in all-cause mortality in this group. Um, if you do stress testing, and again, when we trained, uh, stress testing of severe AS was, was considered contraindicated. However, it's very useful. And our clinical practice now is asymptomatic severe AS as we do stress testing. And the reason for that is if you have an abnormal stress test in the presence of quote-unquote asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis, you have a six-fold increase in cardiac death. So what the early TAVR trial is, is doing is, and it's completed in enrollment, it looks at asymptomatic severe AS, does a screening st stress test. If you, if you don't pass the stress test, if you have a positive stress test, you're excluded and you go to uh, the most appropriate therapy, TAVR, clinical trial, surgical AVR. If you're asymptomatic, you get in the trial and you're randomized one-to-one -to, -one to transfemoral TAVR versus clinical surveillance. And this is going to answer a very important clinical question and really change the way we take care of these patients. It's already in a lot of ways, and one of the reasons I want to start and highlight it in clinical practice, and it sounds like most of the speakers today are on board, everybody who is quote-unquote asymptomatic with moderate severe stenosis, a low-level stress test can be very helpful in risk stratifying patients who either uh, ignore or are not fully aware of the symptoms they're having. All right. The next trial is also going to be an aortic stenosis trial. It's a SAR trial. All right. This is sponsored by Medtronic, and it's the first head-to-head -head comparison of an intraannual balloon expandable valve, Sapien, versus superannual self-expanding TAVR platform, Evolute. And it's designed for patients with small annual I mean, hemodynamic differences would be the most apparent. And the idea is, are the more favorable hemodynamics of a self-expanding platform, does this translate to clinical outcomes versus balloon expandable patients with small annual Now, Medtronic sponsoring it. They feel very strongly they have a better product, but this is the first head-to-head -head comparison. We're going to get a ton of data out of this, including pacemaker rates, stroke rates, vascular complication, death, and valve durability. It's randomized one-to-one. -one. They have to be eligible for both valves by, by trial. I was on the screening committee. We were very careful about that. And we're looking at co-primary endpoints at 12 months of death, disabling stroke, and heart failure rehospitalization, and also bioprosthetic valve dysfunction. We are, for the first time, going to get a clean look at a head-to-head -head comparison and, and really be able to analyze these two good platforms against each other. So keep keep your eyes out on that. And the last one under aortic stenosis I want to talk about was a little bit of a blue sky project. It's uh, This is currently a surgical trial, but it's a biopolymer, life polymer, fold X valve. And this is a, this is a um, non, non-mechanical valve with leaflets that are polymers. So think about if we can get a polymer valve that lasts indefinitely, we can get rid of mechanical valves, we can, we can do a single operation or a single TAVR implant, and we'd be fine um, for life. And this, this is currently being looked at. It's very early on. We've only seen early feasibility in surgical arms, and we have data out to 365 days. It shows at least in the short term, the valve is durable. Um, and that was a small trial. It's now going to a pivotal trial. Um, and there is a TAVR platform to follow. This, again, hasn't started yet, but they will have a, a transcatheter polymer based uh, implantable valve. And these are obviously potential game changers. If either of these platforms stick, we don't have to worry about valve and valve. We don't have to worry about uh, valve failure. It'd be, it'd be very interesting and revolutionary in the field. Uh, more to follow on that. So changing gears over to mitral intervention. Um, we have a very effective tool and several of our earlier speakers, uh, starting with Dr. Smith, did a really nice job talking about 
how far transcatheter edge to edge repair has come. And you can see a nice result here of a, a very severe AS treated with, uh, with uh, mitral clip. When we look at the expand registry, which is a contemporary registry, um, we published this data. We are, uh, my former site was number one enroller in the G4 registry. And we looked at it um, and we found that we were able to reduce MR to 90% of the patients to one plus or less. This is a very effective tool. We see a durable and immediate improvement in functional status. And MitraClip has matured to the point we can treat most patients at very low risk with, with a 90 plus percent uh, chance of getting MR reduction of mild or less and about a 98, 99% chance of getting less than two plus MR. And this is gonna lead us, uh, uh, we, uh, we saw the uh, device times are shorter. The functional capacity QOL is, is good at 30 days. And we now have four clip sizes as previous uh, speakers mentioned. So, and I'm really glad that an earlier speaker brought up the repair mark trial because if TIER has entered, is swimming in the deep end of the pool and we're claiming surgical-like results, we need a head-to-head -head comparison with open surgical repair, which remains the gold standard. We need, a, we need a surgeon to think they have a 95% confidence to success with a valve repair, and that's going to be randomized one-to-one -one surgical repair versus transcatheter looking at uh, short and intermediate term outcomes. This is ongoing enrollment, and I'm very excited to see if this... Uh, how this falls out and this will either um, re keep tier in the high and, and, and operable risk patients or it'll expand it down to intermediate risk and then potentially even low risk patients. And we'll see what the results of that. The, um, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of good discussion about transcatheter mitral valve replacement. This becomes much more complex and the challenges are greater here than in TAB. We're not putting a valve in a tube. We've got a uh, saddle-shaped annulus versus a circle annulus. We have apical and transeptal approaches that have their merits and we have a wide variety of sizes. And importantly, we have the risk of LBOT obstruction, with light, which is a life-threatening complication, which currently requires a lot of off-label maneuvering to, to address. I'm going to talk specifically about the trial tendine. I think it's a pretty critical one right now for a couple of reasons. This is an, uh, uh, and we saw a nice case. I think a, a, one of the earlier speakers showed a tendine case done at UPMC, and it was a beautiful result. Here you see the valve. It's placed apically. You get an immediate good result. It has a tether, which is what requires the transapical approach. Most importantly about Tendine, and why I think this is a, a, a critical trial for our field, is that it's the only TMVR trial that's randomized to transcatheter edge-edge repair, which has become the gold standard, is approved, and is an option for a lot of these patients. So we're going to get a direct head-to-head -head comparison of TMVR versus TIER, all right? And um, so it's a pretty critical trial for you to know about for a couple of reasons. One, it's going to be the first to an end point. We're going to hear about this one first. Number two, it's randomized. So we'll have a, 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 a transeptal component for edge edge repair versus replacement. We will have to look at this within the context that it's transapical, however, because we have a lot of good platforms coming right before, right after this that will be transeptal. But this will be a critical one to look at the results of the summit trial when we see this. Um, one of the valves is transeptal that I have a lot of experience with that we like is the M3 valve. This is an Edwards product. With TMVR, one of the critical issues is how to anchor the valve. So the concept is you place a dock or an anchor. This will function, if you will, like a mitral valve ring or valve, and you'll put a sapien-like valve in this and using the, the ring valve and leaflets of, the, of the, uh, the native valve, you'll deliver a competent valve. And this is currently uh, late stages and we're about halfway through the pivotal trial. It's a 25 French septal system. It's got two parts. It's got a dock and it's got a valve. You can see here as a patient with um, uh, critical air, uh, with critical mitral regurgitation. Okay. Uh, a, a loop is formed in the atrium using a ton of guidance. We access the medial commissure. Once you've accessed the medial commissure, you drive, you drive the circular ring around the anterior and the posterior mitral valve leaflets. You form this dock or circle that you can see in the left panel. And then you simply implant valve and valve, which we're all familiar with and have a lot of competency with. Uh, and the results, uh, so far have been good. We expect this trial to complete enrollment probably within about eight or nine months. And uh, this is a low profile transeptal uh, system um, with, a, with a relatively low rate of screen failure. It's got about a 50% screen failure rate with others are 90 or 95%. So keep your eye out for M3. Um, Hemel showed a, a, a case. I know that we have Intrepid TMVR is now a transeptal system. It's still 35 French. There's an iteration coming right behind it. It's going to be 29 French. I think it's going to be a little bit more competitive. Intrepid is still bogged down by a very high screen failure rate in the appropriate patients, and I've put a bunch of them in. Uh, we do get good results, but the LVOT risk remains a, a, a problem, one with this valve platform. 
Uh, one mitral platform that takes kind of a unique approach to this is the Alta valve. And the Alta valve eliminates the question of LVOT obstruction entirely by putting nothing in the LVOT. The entire valve is contained in the left atrium. It fills the left atrium with a valve facing the uh, um, uh, facing the patient's native valve and allows to flow that way. Um, it's conceptually very exciting. It's a transeptal system. It's early generation. It's early feasibility, and it remains to be seen if this is going to be a technically uh, usable platform, but it does solve a lot of problems that we don't see with the with the other platforms. So that's the Alta valve. And here are some of the features of that. It's an open cage. Uh, they 3D print it. They get, a, they, get a, they get the best size they can, they can um, the best estimation of, estimation of size they can. There's a built-in 27 valve in the middle of it that aims towards a mitral valve, and it brings the entire valve function in the left atrium, and there's no risk of LVOT obstruction. All right. Lastly, moving on to uh, tricuspid, we saw we heard a couple of really good talks earlier about both edge to edge repair and valve replacement. I wanted to touch on these. Um, edge to edge repair is um, you can see here a patient with severe TR. Okay, this this can be treated. It can be treated percutaneously with a modified MitraClip system. Uh, both Pascal, which is an Edwards product, and MitraClip have versions for the tricuspid valve, and they both are are effective. You can get leaflet grasp and you can reduce the amount of MR. Uh, as some of the previous speakers have said, we've changed our grading of MR to show that you can go from torrential down to just severe, and that's a clinical improvement. Um, the Triluminate data was presented only last month at the ACC, and we saw the primary endpoint was in favor of intervention, but it was driven entirely by quality of life changes. Um, surprisingly, um, heart failure hospitalization rate was not better in this group, although the, the TR reduction was significant and death did not show an endpoint yet. Uh, however, these are desperately ill patients. Anybody who's done these patients and gotten a good result is very gratified by the clinical improvement that the patients see. And virtually all of them would say, if you don't affect my survival, I really wanna feel better. So I think this is a, a breakthrough technology. What is, what is also really exciting, and one I think you need to bear, uh, pay close attention to is the Evoke valve. This is an Edwards product. It's a transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement for severe TR. Uh, uh, we've done 15 or 20 of these at my prior institution. Um, the early data from TriSend 1 shows survival and freedom from heart failure hospitalization to be very favorable. Okay, And the functional improvement mimics that we're seeing in Triluminate. With it, with it one year, we had significant improvement in KCC Q12, and, and uh, six-minute walk test was all uh, much improved. Uh, one of the things I will say, having done a lot of Triluminate and a lot of TriSend, is that this is a 30 minute procedure, not a three hour procedure. It remains heavily imaging dependent. You have to be a symbiotic with your imagers. You use multi-planar reconstruction. Um, you simply access the RV apex through a, a venous stick, bring the valve across the tricuspid valve. You notice in this patient, this patient has pacemaker leads. This valve can work around pacemaker leads. Uh, there's a previous surgical valve replacement, a previous cabbage. The valve uh, is very, very carefully simply unrolled. It's a very calm procedure. Uh, the patients are hemodynamically extremely stable. You have a lot of time to fine tune this. The delivery system is excellent. And you can deliver a valve uh, usually in about 25 to 35 minutes. And there's no TR when you're done. Uh, it, the, the amount of TR at the end is, is usually trivial. And the patients are usually discharged the next morning. Um, and then lastly, a little bit more blue sky. There's new systems out there. This is one of them called the trick valve that avoid the tricuspid annulus entirely, and they put a valve in the SVC and the IVC as a novel approach to treat right-sided uh, right sided problems. And this uh, very nicely takes care of any anchoring or pacemaker problems. So I'll leave you with that. I know it's the end of the day and everyone's been very patient. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for their time. I just wanted to run through what I thought were some interesting trials that most people should be aware of. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Paul. That was great. Let me ask uh, you and and maybe uh, Hemel and Conrad and comment on this a little bit. You know, based on what we see, whether it's data results uh, and and competency, perhaps. You know, one of the things that we all feel or think is that tricuspid percutaneous replacement is likely to be approved before percutaneous mitral valve replacement. Yep. Is that? I mean, despite a big, obviously, lag in, in starting the two different uh, different strategies, right? T tell us a little bit about that in your opinion. 
Yeah, I think, well, I mean, you know, the data from Triluminate came out first. We're going to have follow-up. It'll probably go to the FDA first and it'll probably be approved first. I think it's going to be fairly quickly followed by, um, you know, we, we don't have the Evoke data. So I'm, you know, assuming we see similar results with Evoke. Um, certainly the safety profile appears to be favorable. Um, if that happens, um, I think we're going to then try to figure out which patients are best treated with edge edge repair and which patients are best treated with TMDR. Um, the reduction in TR between the two is dramatically different. It's much better with a valve replacement than it is with a repair, and they both seem to be well tolerated. So um, I think we need more data to answer that question, um, but I think uh, these patients are desperately sick. Anybody who takes care of patients with recurrent heart failure with severe TR, they're looking for something, and feeling better is a very solid endpoint. So I think we'll be, we'll be busy with both. Yeah, and this again, this may be a little bit controversial, but but imagine if if tricuspid valve replacement was perhaps uh, the data was perhaps available at the same time as as repair, and perhaps the data the data was more convincing than just pure quality of life. It's it's hard for me to imagine the FDA would approve. I mean, tricuspid regurgitation. We all know they're sick patients. We just didn't find out about them till now. So they've existed for a long time. So it, it's just, you know, food for thought, something to think about if, whether or not FDA would readily approve those and whether these would be paid for, uh, quite frankly, down the line. A yeah. um, couple of questions. I know the big theme early on was talking about earlier intervention and, and perhaps low flow, low gradient. We talked about, you know, earlier uh, intervention for uh, valvular disease. Uh, Josh and Bill, you both talked about that. Uh, part of this, you know, I look at it a little bit differently. And we have these discussions in the office all the time. Uh, you know, you said, oh, I just sent a great young person for TAVI. Keep an eye out. That usually means that that patient's probably not straightforward. Uh, that's why you're giving it a heads up. But more importantly, here's the conversation that, you know, Dustin and I often have with patients in the clinic. If, you, if we put a valve in somebody who has moderate AS, or is perhaps asymptomatic, not critical, not severe, moderate AS, uh, or low flow, low gradient, severe AS. Two components of that. You put a bioprosthetic valve in that person, they're not getting a mechanical valve, right? Uh, you're resetting the clock, right? So they're barely feeling crappy now, and all of a sudden you're going to reset the clock. They're gonna be back sooner now to get their valve and valve, tab and tap down the line, right? Yeah, I mean, I, clearly, I think you're worried about these valves failing in seven to 15 years. And if they're only moderate AS, then uh, obviously we have to worry about late failure and then needing valve and valve. That's a theoretical and I think appropriate viewpoint. And the, the bigger theme that I see here with all these talks is sort of the concept of how do we figure out a state where we're going to create a good environment as an institution and internationally for asking this question in a fair way, meaning you may be 100% right that intervening on uh, patients in the short term may be helpful, but in the long term may hurt the patient. But I think when we've done these uh, intervention trials for TAVR, uh, we saw a very early stroke signal and we were worried TAVR was gonna be worse for patients. And in the long term, we've seen TAVR has been a huge success story. So I think the broader concept of we need to do the RCT, we need to enroll patients to find out, I think is more important because I don't know the answer, um, but it may be that uh, it, the clearly intervening uh, is the right thing to do. And then we need to put uh, the pressures on the companies to get a better valve that lasts, has better tissue, to know that intervening early is right, we just need to get a better valve. But uh, your point's well, well taken. Yeah, I mean, it, there's no data to suggest that somebody has moderate AS, they're going to decalcify their prosthetic valve also slower. I mean, likely not the same, right? Bill, thoughts? I'll, I'll just add, you have to have the right diagnostics, you know, make sure it's only moderate or maybe it's really severe. And I think the exercise testing can help. So uh, that's a great point. And I think low flow, low grade uh, AS is probably one of the most abused diagnoses. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, looking more thoroughly at the ventricles, is there a lot of fibrosis developing? Is the strain abnormal? No, that's, that's a great point. Um, and the, cal the calcium burden can be helpful as well in the CT, looking at the calcium burden. Oh, that comes absolutely. No, absolutely. I think, I think those are all great points. Uh, Brian or Jackie, when you guys focus on transcatheter uh, pulmonic valve replacements, Tell us a little bit about anticoagulation, gradient issues, low flow systems. Uh, 
is that something that you talked to? I mean, children, adolescents, very challenging. ACHD patients, probably a different issue. Uh, yeah, this is a great question, Eves. I, I appreciate it. Um, the challenge for us right now is the volume is not comparable to your volume. So we see a small signal of some early leaflet thrombosis in a small percentage of patients, but most patients are being managed with aspirin alone, varying from pediatric population all the way through adult population. So 60-year-old patient who gets a transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement is going home on aspirin alone, the same with a 15-year-old patient. We follow early and often for the development of gradient. And if that happens, they end up on uh, usually a DOAC as a, as a strategy for three to six months. Yeah, that's a good point. Great. And then the time span on ICE, can be after the procedure, we see little fiber strands and we have to go with the patients. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think having a, you know, having a right side of circulation is different. And this is the other point I would not, not that I'm beating on Josh right yeah. now, but, Please. you know, Brian can do, can say, oh, you know what? I can do five more of these uh, if they continue to fail. We can't say the same thing for Tavi, right? So, so, so a different concept, uh, uh, you know, uh, different anatomy. So anyway, that's why I perseverate. Um, Agnes, you know, we've, I think I've been on multiple email chains with, with you, uh, Katie and others that talk about, you know, patients who are high risk from the cardio B team. Uh, how often do you do invasive measurements, right heart cancer? Are they ever helpful from a management perspective or is it virtually all, well, let's get a CMR, let's get a TTE and, and, and go from there? I think we rarely, but do do right heart cats. I think um, we collaborate a lot with our anesthesia team. And I think if during delivery, there's a question of, you know, will their hemodynamics, particularly in active pushing, um, be, you know, compromise their cardiac output, I think oftentimes the right heart cath will be helpful. Um, and we will do that um, if that will be helpful in answering the question, um, but not often. Great. That's good to know. So maybe you, you alluded briefly to to Champion and Catalyst AF. Uh, you know, the the prevail data, tech AF data, all that you talked about, the different comes up when it comes to hemorrhagic stroke, not ischemic stroke. Uh, you know, the diff and, and that probably all goes down to mortality. How do you think this will be looked at from that perspective? I know obviously the endpoints are different. I mean, this was controversial when approved, likely going to be controversial, but uh, give us your view on this. Yeah, so <clears throat> the, the uh... Prevail and uh, Protect AF uh, went up to five years. And obviously some of those patients that have atrial fibrillation have a longer longevity. So we need uh, longer data. As you saw, the endpoints of the newer studies, the Catalyst and the Champion are uh, a little bit different. Definitely non-inferiority in terms of the efficacy, but then superiority in terms of the non-procedural bleeding, which is important because you wanna factor out obviously what happens during the procedure. I think it's a lesser concern in my mind, the fact that we're factoring out the uh, uh, procedural bleeding because we know from the data that we've had accumulated over registries and trials that the procedure is fairly safe. I think that those trials have a very good likelihood of turning out positive. I think that it doesn't, in my mind, clear up completely the fact that there may be an advantage from the ischemic stroke with anticoagulation, correct? We know that some uh, clots form on the outside of the device. We know that not all the clots in the context of atrial fibrillation form in the left atrial appendage. They could form elsewhere. So there may be a little bit of an added protection from being on anticoagulation. But at the same time, uh, you know, the, the offset is with the bleeding. So it, if these trials turn out to be positive, my... Um, my read on it is that it will not necessarily open up that everybody's going to get the left atrial appendage closure, but it will free us in terms of making that choice when we have other considerations. Great. That's a good point. Kathir, one of the things that, that we hear, not thankfully, not locally, but we hear when we travel is, you know, variety of particularly interventionalists talking about, well, these patients don't really, first of all, please don't do anyone with general anesthesia without ET2 for our patients. That, let's just start there. Uh, so second of all, you know, we hear this concept of, well, I don't really need cardiac anesthesia. I don't really need anesthesia. This is, and this happens a lot in Europe when we see that or Asia. Tell us a little bit about what your viewpoint of this. Obviously, you're biased, but how safe is that, you know, and how do you feel about it? Yeah, so I, I think... Um... Anybody who has the total understanding of cardiac physiology, what happens in the operating room with interaction of different things, will be able to handle the cases. For example, if there is an ECMO patient coming for an explorative laparotomy, I'm not 
coming in the middle of the night to give anesthesia. So it is a very sensitive matter between cardiac anesthesia and non-cardiac anesthesia. But I believe that um, with proper teaching, we typical example is a bad patient coming for non-cardiac surgery. If I have to do all bad patients anesthesia, so I have to be there 24 to 7, you know, so that's not going to happen. So what we do is we conduct CME courses for non-cardiac anesthesiologists to educate them what is right ventricle, what is pulmonary hypertension, what is interaction. With the close interaction, close teaching, close um, uh, coordination, that we will be able to get some non-cardiac anesthesiologists to do cardiac cases coming for such procedures. So it's not totally nil, but they, the cardiac anesthesia has to be on phone, uh, has to be consulted before um, you know, anesthetizing such patients. So it is more of a, um, you know, Cardiac anesthesia is only 10 people in the system. So, but there are more patients with cardiac diseases. So we have to involve other people. That's a great point. Katie, you want to close us up? Any final comments? Apart from telling everyone that the heart team is very much alive in Pittsburgh and Harrisburg and everywhere else in the UPMC system. No, I just want to thank all the organizers for organizing this uh, valve symposium. I think it will be tremendously helpful for not only physicians, but as an uh, advanced practice provider. I know that I learned a lot today. So thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Katie. And, I, and I learned a lot today to multiple uh, obviously, fantastic talks. Uh, thank you again, uh, really, to uh, Hemel and, and Conrad uh, for helping us really put this together. And the expert faculty who are all here took time off on Saturday to uh, spend time with us and 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 with the virtual audience. Uh, James Ferris and the massive media team, uh, uh, Drew Burkhardt and Shelley Miller for uh, traveling from Harrisburg. Appreciate all your help with putting the program together. Uh, and of course, uh, Angie Kanunen, without whom really nothing happens. Uh, 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 UPMC HVI. So thank you, everyone, and thank you all. Appreciate it.